You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you. Lazy. Part 1, The Gifts of Heaven. 1. That which is not born gives birth to everything. 2. All things are connected and come from the same origin. 3. Heaven and earth have their strengths and weaknesses. 4. Life and death. 5. Shadows, sounds, and ghosts. 6. The stages of life. 7. Life is hard work, death is rest. 8. The value of emptiness. 9. Are things growing or decaying? 10. Worrying that the sky will fall. 11. Life that is borrowed, wealth that is stolen. Part 2. The Yellow Emperor. 12. The Yellow Emperor visits the immortal lands. 13. Riding on the wind, floating with the clouds. 14. The art of staying underwater and walking through fire. 15. The art of archery. 16. Feats of power. 17. The art of taming tigers. 18. The art of steering a boat. 19. The art of swimming. 20. The man who could walk through fire. 21. Li Tzu and the sorcerer. 22. Li Tzu's fear. 23. Lao Tzu teaches Yang Chu. 24. What is there to appearances? 25. Softness and hardness, yielding and resisting. Part 3. King Mu of CHOU. 26. King Mu's dream. 27. Learning the arcane arts. 28. Dreams. 29. The truth about happiness and misery. 30. What is real and what is unreal. 31. The man who lost his memory. 32. Who is confused. 33. The man who got upset over nothing. Part 4. Confucius. 34. True happiness and contentment. 35. Seeing with ears and hearing with eyes. 36. Who is a sage? 37. What is wisdom? 38. The man with a wooden face. 39. The art of traveling and sightseeing. 40. Lung Shu's strange illness. 41. Responding naturally. 42. There are some things that you just can't fight. 43. Who is supporting whom? 44. What is strength? 45. The strange arguments of Kung Sun Lung. 46. Knowing when to withdraw. Part 5. The Questions of Tang. 47. Where do things come from? 48. The man who tried to move mountains. 49. The man who tried to chase down the sun. 50. The North Country. 51. Strange customs in strange countries. 52. The questions of a child. 53. The art of fishing. 54. Exchanging hearts and minds. 55. Musician when learns to play the lute. 56. When Honor sang. 57. Kindred spirits. 58. Artificial or real. 59. Learning the art of archery. 60. Saofu learns to drive. 61. Lytan's revenge. Part 6. Effort and Destiny. 62. Effort argues with destiny. 63. Fortune and worth. 64. The friendship of Quan Chung and Pao Shuya. 65. Are life and death a matter of effort or destiny? 66. An average doctor, a good doctor, and an ingenious doctor. 67. Yang Chu talks about destiny. 68. We cannot know people who are different from us. 69. Success and failure. 70. The king who was greedy about life and afraid of death. 71. 
Death is not a loss. Part 7, Yang Chu. 72, A name is nothing and titles are empty. 73, Life temporarily staying in the world, death temporarily leaving. 74, In life there may be differences, in death everything is the same. 75, Riches can injure you, but poverty can also hurt you. 76, Taking care of yourself. 77. A madman or an enlightened man? 78. What damages health more, unrestricted pleasure or obsessive hard work? 79. Everyone must die sometime. 80. Would you sacrifice a strand of hair to benefit the world? 81. Ruling a country is like tending a flock of sheep. 82. Things are not as permanent as we think they are. 83. Longevity, fame, social status, and wealth. Part 8. Explaining coincidences. 84. Action and reaction. 85. Why do people follow the path of the Tao? 86. Li Tzu learns archery. 87. Choosing the right person for the job. 88. Can we compete with nature? 89. Someone's words can make or break you. 90. Being at the right place at the right time. 91. If I can step on someone, someone else can step on me. 92. To solve a problem, you need to remove the cause, not the symptom. 93. Trust and confidence. 94. The best way to keep a secret is not to talk. 95. Those who succeed are not excited about success, those who know do not display their knowledge. 96. Fortune and misfortune. 97. A matter of luck. 98. Seeing beyond appearances. 99. Managing your life and governing a country. 100. Rank, wealth, and ability can get you into trouble. 101. You cannot apply one principle to all conditions. 102. Retribution by accident. 103. Confusing name and reality. 104. To die for someone who values you is natural. 105. Confused by too many alternatives. 106. Yang Piyu and the dog. 107. Knowledge and action. 108. Capture and release, an act of compassion or cruelty. 109. Who was created for whom to eat. 110. It's all in your mind. 111. Those who are involved are muddled, those who watch are clear. Part 1 slash The Gifts of Heaven Chapter 1. That which is not born gives birth to everything. Li Tziu was a humble and sincere person. His thoughts and actions tell us he was uncommonly common. He was unassuming and never displayed his learning. He lived a simple and quiet life and did not compete with others for recognition. Therefore, although he had lived in the kingdom of Qing for 40 years, people in positions of power saw him only as a common citizen. Throughout his life, Li Tzu never made a name for himself. Without the burdens and problems associated with fame and fortune, Li Tzu could live leisurely and be free to do what he liked and go where he wanted. To Li Tzu, being an unknown citizen was better than being a person of power and responsibility. In a time when politicians played games of intrigue, Li Tzu felt it was better to remain silent and be truthful to oneself. Of course, there are certain things that even a wise sage cannot escape. But, not being bound by custom and social convention, Li Tzu was able to deal with adversity much better than anyone else. One year, a famine occurred in Cheng, and Li Tzu decided to move to the kingdom of Wei to see if he could make a living there. Moreover, he thought this would give him an opportunity to travel to an unknown country and broaden his learning. While Li Tzu was preparing to leave, a group of his students came to him. They were worried that their teacher might leave them for a long time. They knew Li Tzu did not follow any routine, and, if the mood suited him, he might wander for months or years before returning. Therefore, they wanted their teacher to give them some words of wisdom before he departed. 
Li Tzu was not a person given to casual chatting. After his students begged him tirelessly for half a day, he finally said, think about this. Old man Sky never says a word, but we can see that everything has its place in the universe. Nature has a lot to teach us. All you need is to open your eyes and look. The changes you see in nature follow a course. The four seasons behave in a regulated way. In truth, all human matters follow the same principles as the workings of heaven and earth. What more is there for me to say? His students were not satisfied and continued to pester him with questions. One student said, Sir, even if you feel there is nothing for you to say, you can at least tell us what your teacher Hu Tzu taught you. Li Tzu was silent for a while. Then he smiled and said, Actually, my teacher Hu Tzu did not say much. He told us to let everything go according to its natural way. However, I did remember a few things he mentioned to some of my fellow students. I'll share them with you now. Here is what Master Hu Tzu taught. There are many things in the universe that we don't understand. For example, some plants and animals require help from others to grow and survive, while others don't. We humans rely on plants and animals for food. We also need some of our community to farm the land and raise the livestock to sustain the rest of us. On the other hand, cacti can grow in the most hostile conditions and do not need much support to survive. In general, those that do not depend on the external environment for support will find it easier to survive than those that do. They will not die when their supporting environment disappears. However, we should not look down on those who need to depend on others for survival. We should let them grow naturally in their own way, for their mode of living has its place in maintaining the balance of the universe. If we tried to change their way of life, we would upset the balance of things, and the order of the universe would be disturbed. All things have their place in the universe, whether it is active or passive, moving or not moving. They fulfill their function in the world simply by being what they are. Everything plays a part in the process of creating, nourishing, transforming, and destroying. The creation of one thing is the destruction of another, and the destruction of one thing is the creation of another. In this way, life carries on in the universe. In every moment there is birth and death, and there is coming and going. This process never stops. The Book of the Yellow Emperor says, The valley spirit that does not die is the mysterious female. It is the foundation of heaven and earth. It continues forever and cannot be used up. Because the valley is hollow, it can hold the spirit, it can embrace, and it can nourish. Because the valley is empty, it is not subject to birth and death. To transcend birth and death is to enter into the limitless, Wu Qi, and be at one with the origin of heaven and earth. The gate of the mysterious female is where all things are created. And yet heaven and earth are said to be born from the not born. This is what is meant by that which is not born gives birth to everything, for the mysterious female is that which is not born. Its origins belong to the realm of non-differentiation, where there is neither birth nor death. Because it is never born, it never dies. Because it never dies, its energy lasts forever. It is in heaven and earth, and heaven and earth do not know it. It is in all things, yet all things do not recognize it. If we understand that birth and death are part of the natural order of things, we will know that our lives cannot be controlled by our own efforts, and coming and going are not our own doing. At birth, we take a shape and form, in growth, we undergo development and change, and when our course has run out, we dissolve and return to where we were before we were born. If we know the order of things, we will understand that when intelligence and wisdom have reached their zenith, they will begin to fade and decay. The rise and fall of shapes, colors, thoughts, and feelings are not subject to control. Because we don't know whence they come or where they go, we can only say that everything that is born comes from the not born. Chapter 2 All Things Are Connected and Come from the Same Origin Li Tziu felt that his students did not quite understand what he said, so he continued. The ancient sages used yin and yang to talk about the nature of things. They described changes in heaven and earth as the interaction of yin and yang. They said that the nameless gives birth to the named, 
and that the origin of heaven and earth lies in that nebulous and unfathomable realm where all things are undifferentiated from each other. How do things emerge from this unfathomable and undifferentiated realm? They go through four stages, the primal oneness, the primal emerging, the primal beginning, and the primal substance. The primal oneness is the state in which all things are undivided and undifferentiated. There is no subject and object, no shape and form. In the primal emerging, the primordial vapor, qi, covers heaven and earth. Yin and yang have not divided, and everything lies within the embrace of the vapor. In the primal beginning, yin and yang divide, and their interaction produces limited, but identifiable shapes and forms. In the stage of the primal substance, things have not only assumed definite shapes and forms, but have taken on qualities. They are hard or soft, light or heavy, moving or still. Although each thing is said to have its own essence of life, shape, and quality, these three entities are inseparable. They are all connected to the undifferentiated origin. Despite all apparent differences, all things are connected with each other and with their origin, the Tao. The Tao is formless and cannot be seen or heard. What we see or hear are only the manifestations of the Tao. That is why the ancients said, try to see it, and it is not there, try to hear it, and there is nothing. Because the Tao cannot be grasped by our mundane senses, it is futile for us to use ordinary perception to discover the Tao. The primal origin has no essence, no form, and no substance. From its undifferentiated oneness, it divides into unaccountable myriad things, and yet in an instant, all things can return to the original oneness. In the primal beginning, the pure and light vapor rises to become heaven, and the muddy and heavy vapor sinks to become earth. It is from the harmonious interaction between the pure and the muddy, the light and the heavy, that humanity came into being. Thus, we are products of the vapor born from the copulation of heaven and earth. We are interconnected with all things, plants and animals, heaven and earth, because all things trace their origins to and owe their existence to the primal oneness. Chapter 3 Heaven and Earth Have Their Strengths and Weaknesses Li Tzu said, Although we owe our existence to heaven and earth, we cannot say they are all-powerful, because heaven and earth cannot do everything. Similarly, although the sages can tell us about the past and show us the future, they are not all-knowing. The sky provides cover and shelter, but cannot support and hold. The earth provides support, but does not cover and shelter. This is why we say that heaven and earth have their strengths and weaknesses. The role of heaven is to cover, the role of the earth is to support, and the role of the sage is to teach and inspire. All things have their function, and to force them to do something they were not meant to do would go against the natural way of things. That which can give shelter cannot provide support, that which can give support cannot teach and inspire, and those who teach and inspire cannot make things behave counter to their function. This is the natural way of the universe. In this way, humanity can be taught, earth can be sheltered, and heaven can be supported. Understand this, and you will see that stillness and movement are simply qualities of things, just as roundness and squareness are kinds of shapes. No one thing is more valuable than another, and no one person is more worthy than another. The workings of heaven and earth do not depart from the principles of yin and yang. The teachings of the sages can be summed up by virtue and justice. All things can be classified as either hard or soft. In this way, everything follows its natural course and fulfills its natural function. Therefore, we can conclude that there are those who are born and those who give birth, there are shapes and those that mold shape, there are sounds and those that make sound, there are colors and those that make color, and there are flavors and those that produce flavor. In fact, when something that is born dies, that which gave it life continues. While form shapes are concrete and real, that which shaped them does not exist. While sounds are heard, that which made the sound has not yet begun to resonate. While colors are seen, that which does the coloring has not appeared. Flavors have been tasted, but that which produced the flavors has not revealed itself. These are all examples of the absence of effort. If you understand what it means to be effortless, then there is nothing you cannot do. You can be yin or yang, hard or soft, 
short or long, round or square, hot or cold, you can live or die, float or sink, strike a high pitch or low, appear or disappear, take on colorations of black or yellow, become sweet or bitter, and be fragrant or pungent. By knowing and doing nothing, you can know all and do all. Chapter 4, Life and Death Li Tziu left his home in Cheng and journeyed to the kingdom of Wei. While walking down a dusty road, he saw the remains of a skull lying by the wayside. Li Tzu saw that it was the skull of a human that was over a hundred years old. He picked up the bone, brushed the dirt off it, and looked at it for a while. Finally, he put the skull down, sighed, and said to his student who was standing nearby, In this world, only you and I understand life and death. Turning to the skull he said, Are you unfortunate to be dead, and are we fortunate to be alive? Maybe it is you who are fortunate, and we who are unfortunate. Li Tzu then said to his student, Many people sweat and toil and feel satisfied that they have accomplished many things. However, in the end we are not all that different from this polished piece of bone. In a hundred years, everyone we know will be just a pile of bones. What is there to gain in life? and what is there to lose in death? The ancients knew that life cannot go on forever, and death is not the end of everything. Therefore, they are not excited by the event of life nor depressed by the occurrence of death. Birth and death are part of the natural cycle of things. Only those who can see through the illusions of life and death can be renewed with heaven and earth and age with the sun, moon, and stars. Chapter 5 Shadows, Sounds, and Ghosts the action of one thing produces effects on another. In a universe in which all things are interconnected, this is just natural. Thus, a shape and its shadow, a sound and its echo are always together. When there is action, there is effect. When there is effect, there is a response in action. The Book of the Yellow Emperor says, when a shape moves, it produces a shadow, not another shape. When a sound resonates, it produces an echo, not another sound. Stillness does not generate stillness but movement. Although things differ in appearance, they all come from the same origin and will return to the same source. Some things may linger longer than others, but all things will eventually return to what they were before they came into existence. People use the words beginning and end to describe the start and end of things. However, beginning is really the event of coming together when energy gathers, and end is simply the dissolution of that energy. That which came together can easily dissolve if conditions become unfavorable. That which has dissolved may come together again if the circumstances are appropriate. Therefore, who is to say that there is a beginning and an end? Life and death follow a natural course, and we should let it come and go accordingly. The problem for many people is that when it's time to go, they still hang on and when it's time for something to come into the world, they prevent it. This is going against the natural order of things. That is why the ancients say that what must come will come, and what must go will go. People try too hard to make things happen or not happen, because they do not understand the natural order of things. They believe they can control the outcome of things, and in the end, after a lot of effort, they find their hard work produces the opposite effect. Our spirit is the product of heaven and our bones are the products of earth. When the two cannot be together anymore, each will return to its source. That which is pure and light will rise and float to heaven, and that which is muddy and heavy will sink and be absorbed into earth. When this happens, we say that a person has become a ghost. In Chinese, the word for ghost is K, which also means return. Thus, becoming a ghost means returning to heaven and earth. Therefore, death is not the end of things, but a return to the origin. At death, the components making up a person go their own way, returning to what they were before they became parts of a person. Our time in this world is a journey through the cycle we call life. As guests, we linger for a while in this realm before we depart for another. And who can tell how long this traveler will stay in the next realm before embarking on another visit to the realm of the living? Chapter 6 the stages of life. We can divide the lifespan of a person into four periods, infancy, youth, old age, and death. In each of these periods, major changes occur. 
In infancy, our blood is strong and our energy is plentiful. Mind and body, thought and action are one. Everything we do is in harmony with the natural order. The infant is not affected by things that happen around him. Virtue and ethics cannot restrain his will. Naked and free of social conventions, he follows the natural path of the heart. In youth, our blood rises and becomes volatile. Desire, worry, and anxiety increase. External circumstances now direct the rise and fall of emotions. Will and intention become constrained by social conventions. Competition, conflict, and scheming are the norm in interactions with people. The approval and disapproval of others become important, and the honest and sincere expression of thoughts and feelings is lost. In old age, the strength of our blood begins to decline. Consequently, desire and worry also weaken. Compared to the youthful years, we are more peaceful and at ease with ourselves. Social conventions and external influences have less impact on us because we are no longer interested in heroics and competition. Although the older person is not as harmonious with the natural order of things as the infant, he is certainly more truthful to himself than when he was a youth. At death, everything returns to stillness. At this time, we know nothing, do nothing, and feel nothing. Our energy is again united with its source. Confucius also talked about stages in life. He divided life into three periods. He said, in youth, our blood and energy are unstable. Therefore, in this period we need to tame our sexual desire. In maturity, our blood and energy are strong and aggressive. Therefore, in this stage of life, we need to tame our competitive nature. In old age, our blood and energy are weak. Therefore, in our final years, we need to dissolve our attachment to things. Both the Taoists and the Confucianists give valuable insights into human nature and the changes that occur in our lifetime. For the Confucianists, the important thing is to understand what must be done in each period of life so that we can be useful to society, live honorably, and interact harmoniously with others. For the Taoists, the important thing is to understand that infancy, youth, old age, and death are stages of life that we must pass through. Understanding this, we can accept the changes we go through and view them as a natural sequence of events in the cycle of birth and death. Chapter 7 Life is Hard Work, Death is Rest Confucius and his students passed through the village of Cheng when they went to see the sights of Mount Tai. In the village they saw a man wandering around singing and playing a lute. The man had a deerskin for a coat and a rope for a belt. He seemed happy and carefree as he walked and sang. Confucius was curious about why the man was so happy and contented. He walked up to him and said, Sir, why are you so happy with life? The man replied, There are many reasons for me to be happy. First, of all the things created in the universe, only humanity is blessed with the gift of wisdom. Since it is my fortune to be a human, this is a reason for me to be happy. Second, in my society, men seem to have more privileges than women. Since I am a man, this is another reason for me to be happy. Third, not many people live long lives. Yet I am gifted with health and a lifespan of 90 years. This is the third reason for me to be happy. Finally, I don't care whether I am rich or poor, and I know that birth and death are but the natural order of things. While many people are worried about being poor and are afraid of dying, I am not bothered by these things. That is why I am always happy. After hearing this, Confucius was impressed. He turned to his students and said, Now, here is a wise man who knows how to cope with life. On another occasion, when Confucius was on the road to the kingdom of Wei, he met a hermit who was at least a hundred years old. In the warmth of spring, this man was wearing a fur coat and was gathering grain that had been dropped by the farmers in the fields. The man was singing as he worked. Confucius observed him for a while and then said to his students, This old man is quite a person and should be well worth talking to. Who would like to go and see what he has to say? Su Kung volunteered and walked toward the embankment along the field. He waited for the old man to approach, and when they were within speaking distance, Su Kung said, Sir, you are old and tired, 
and you still have to toil and sweat to make a living. You have all my sympathy. The old man ignored Su Kung's remark and continued along the field, picking up grains and singing. Su Kung realized something was wrong, so he caught up with the old man and apologized. The old man then looked at Su Kung and said, Why am I so pathetic that you should feel sorry for me? Su Kung ventured to say, Well, sir, I thought maybe you did not work hard when you were young, and in your adult years you did not care to make a name for yourself. As a result, you have no wife and children to look after you. Now you are getting old and death is near. You laugh and sing, and you don't even realize that you have wasted the best years of your life. The old man smiled and said to Tsu Kung, I laugh and sing because I am happy. Think about this. If I had passed my youthful years straining body and mind, and if I had spent all my energy competing with others in my adult years, I would not have lived to be a hundred and be as healthy as I am now. As for not having a family, all the better. In this way, I will not have to worry about their livelihood when I die. I can even look forward to the day when I die. Can you tell me why I shouldn't be happy? Su Kung replied at once, To want to live and to be afraid of death are part of human nature. You seem to be happy to die. I don't understand that. The old man said, Death and life are cycles of going and coming. When we leave one world, maybe we will be born in another world. Which is better, life or death? It is hard to tell. Now then, why should we make it hard for ourselves in this world, when we don't even know whether we are better off living or dying? After Tsu Kung heard these words, he was very confused. He went back to Confucius and related everything the old man had said. Confucius only nodded, just as I had thought. It was worth finding out what this old man had to say. From his observations, it appears he has found his answers in life, but he has not found everything. It was at this time that Su Kung grew tired of his studies and thought everything he did was futile. He went to Confucius and told his teacher he wanted to take a rest. Confucius said, As long as you live you will not rest. Then there is no place where I can find rest from my work. Confucius smiled a mysterious smile and said, Yes, there are actually plenty of places where you can find rest. Look carefully in the graveyards, the deep valleys, and the high mounds. These are all places of rest. Su Kung then exclaimed, Oh, now I know why those of us who are living cannot know what it means to rest, because rest is only for the dead. Death is indeed something great. The contented person finds rest in death, and for the greedy person, death puts an end to his long list of desires. Confucius then said to his student, It looks like you have finally understood what is meant by life is hard work, and death is rest. Most people think living is a happy business, but they don't realize that sometimes living is more difficult than dying. Similarly, many people think old age brings loneliness and despair, but they don't realize that sometimes in old age they can recover the carefree and happy life of their childhood. They only know that death is something horrible, but they don't realize that death is a rest from hard labors. The sage Yen Su also understood the meaning of death. He said, the ancients said that for persons who cultivated body and mind, and who are virtuous and honorable, death is an experience of liberation, a long-awaited rest from a lifetime of labors. Death helps the unscrupulous person to put an end to the misery of desire. Death, then, for everyone, is a kind of homecoming. That is why the ancient sages speak of a dying person as a person who is going home on the other hand, a living person is a traveling person. Normally, if a traveler fails to find home when his journeys are over, everyone will agree that this person has lost his way. However, in the journey of life, many travelers only know how to wander, but do not know how to return home. And yet people do not see that these travelers have likewise lost their way. If a man leaves his family and his livelihood and wanders far from home, everyone will say he is crazy and irresponsible. However, if a man appears to use his skill and intelligence to make a name for himself and ensures that everybody recognizes his achievements, he is regarded as a great man. Actually, both men have strayed from their true nature. Only the sages can tell who has lost their original nature and who has retained it.
Chapter 8, The Value of Emptiness Someone asked Li Tzu, why do you value emptiness? Li Tzu said, most people like to be praised. They feel good when their accomplishments are acknowledged. However, I feel we would be better off if we were empty of attachments and not imprisoned by recognition, approval, and disapproval. In the long run, we'd have fewer things to worry about. That's why I value emptiness. Li Tzu paused and then continued, even if you were given credit for doing something, you should realize that it was not entirely your own doing. Events occur because conditions are right, and your action only contributes to one of the many conditions. We are accustomed to thinking that when things happen, they are our accomplishments, we don't understand that there is actually nothing to accomplish. Therefore, rather than accept credit that does not belong to anyone, why not quiet down and think about the workings of heaven and earth? Seeing the emptiness of things can help us cultivate stillness and peace of mind. If you do not know how to keep still in this crazy world, you will be drawn into all kinds of unnecessary trouble. You will lose your view of the way, and, when you realize it, it will be too late, for in losing the way, you will have also lost yourself. Chuang Tzu once told a story about two persons who both lost a sheep. One person got very depressed and lost himself in drinking, sex, and gambling to try to forget this misfortune. The other person decided that this would be an excellent chance for him to study the classics and quietly observe the subtleties of nature. Both men experienced the same misfortune, but one man lost himself because he was too attached to the experience of loss, while the other found himself because he was able to let go of gain and loss. Chapter 9 are things growing or decaying? Heaven and earth are always changing. However, because these changes are so slow, we mistakenly think they do not occur. When something rises, something else will fall. When something grows, something else will decay. When something disappears, something else emerges. This is the balance of things. If there is only growth and no decay, the world will be overpopulated be it with people, animals, or vegetation. If there is only decay and no growth, life will disappear. For the world to continue there must be a balance of growth and decay. If we interfere with the natural order of things by trying to control growth and decay, the balance of the universe will be lost. Only when things are left to their natural way will the balance be maintained. The vapors of heaven and earth are not gathered in one instance. Mountains, seas, valleys, and rivers are not made or destroyed in one day. Changes in heaven and earth occur all the time. But because the changes are so gradual, the time between the coming and going of things is often imperceptible to us. The appearance of a person also changes all the time. From childhood to death, the color of the hair, the facial features, skin texture, and even intelligence are always changing. Again, because the changes are so gradual, we are unaware of them occurring. We only see the results of the change after the fact, and then infer that changes must have occurred. Chapter 10, Worrying That the Sky Will Fall In the kingdom of Qi there lived an old man who was afraid the sky would fall, and the earth would break up. He reasoned that if that happened, he would have nowhere to hide, and he would surely die. He was so worked up about it that he could neither eat nor sleep. A friend tried to reason with him that there was nothing to worry about. The friend said, Heaven is only the accumulation of vapor. This vapor surrounds us. We breathe it, we walk through it, and we stretch our bodies inside it. Why would it fall down? The old man was still uneasy. What about the sun and moon? Even if the sky is made of vapor, and will not fall down, the moon and the sun can still fall down and crush us. The sun and the moon are also made of vapor. The only difference is that they hold different light. Even if they fall, vapor and light are not heavy, and they will not crush us. The old man was still worried. But what about the earth? It may break up and disappear. The earth is made of grains and dirt. Dirt is everything. We walk on it, we jump on it, we sleep on it, we sit on it, and yet it does not give way. Why would it break up? The old man was finally satisfied. Feeling that everything was secure and safe, 
he was happy again. His friend was glad too, knowing that he had helped someone get rid of needless worries. When the hermit Siechong Lu heard about this incident, he laughed and said, Rainbows, clouds, mist, wind, rain, and the changes in the four seasons are all formed from vapor accumulated in heaven. Mountains, rivers, seas, minerals, metal, and stone are all formed from the accumulation of matter on the earth. If everything in heaven and earth is made of vapor and dirt, who is to say that they cannot be damaged or destroyed? For sure, heaven is wide and earth is great, but they are not permanent. However, if they were to perish, it would be eons from now. The man of Qi who worried about their destruction is probably too concerned about things in the distant future, but on the other hand, he is actually not as crazy as we think he is. When Li Tzu heard this he chuckled, Master C. H. Ong Lu thinks heaven and earth can be destroyed. I think he is wrong. It's nonsense even to think about whether heaven and earth can or cannot be destroyed. Whether they will perish or not is something we don't know. If heaven and earth will not perish, that's great. We can live our lives without worry. However, if they will perish, that's something we can't do much about, so why worry about it? While we live, we don't know what it's like to be dead. Likewise, when we are dead, we don't know what it's like to be alive. Those who were just born won't know that it's like for those who lived before them. Similarly, those who lived before us could not know what it's like to be in our times. Therefore, why let the question of whether heaven and earth will perish occupy our minds? Chapter 11 Life that is borrowed, wealth that is stolen King Shun asked his minister, Can I possess the way of heaven and earth and make it go according to my wishes? His minister replied, Even your body is not your own, how can you think about bending the way of heaven and earth to your will? If my body does not belong to me, then to whom does it belong? Your body does not belong to you, its form was lent to you by heaven and earth. Your life does not belong to you, it came into existence with the interaction of the energies of heaven and earth. Your mind and your spirit are not yours to control, they follow the natural way of heaven and earth. Your children and grandchildren are not yours to possess, they are like flakes of your skin, for procreation was granted to you by heaven and earth. A person who understands this truth is one who is not bound by the ideas of what a mind is and what a body is. Forgetting his body, he can travel anywhere in the world without knowing where he goes. Forgetting his mind, he can succeed in everything he does because he does not think about how it is done. He follows the way of heaven, going when he needs to go, staying without knowing what made him stay, and eating without knowing how he is fed. Life is but the coming together of the energies of heaven and earth, and the source of these energies has no beginning and no end. How can one ever possess the way of heaven and earth? In the kingdom of Qi lived a very rich man by the name of Kua. In the land of Sung there was a very poor man by the name of Xiang. Seeing the wealth of Kua, Xiang decided to pay the wealthy man a visit to see if he could learn how to get rich. Kua said, actually, there is not much to how one got rich. I simply stole. In the first year, I made enough to be self-sufficient. In the second year, I started getting rich. By the third year, I had saved up an enormous wealth. Since then, I have been able to help others who are in need. When the poor man heard this he was delighted. He latched on to the idea of stealing and did not bother to ask Kua to explain the details of how he stole. Xiang started trying his skills at stealing. He climbed over walls and broke into houses. He helped himself to anything he could lay his hands on. Soon he had accumulated a good bit of wealth. However, one time he was caught. He was punished severely, and all his stolen goods were confiscated. Poor again, and angry at Kua for giving him bad advice, he went to accuse the rich man of tricking him. Upon seeing Xiang, Kua greeted him sincerely and asked how he was faring. Xiang angrily told the rich man how he had followed his example of stealing, and how it had ended in disaster. Kua sighed and said, You never asked me what I stole to make myself rich. You heard the word steal, formed your own ideas, and went about doing it your way. Of course you ended up in trouble. Let me tell you what I stole to get wealthy. 
I have heard that the four seasons have bountiful gifts. So I stole some gifts of the spring rain and the summer warmth for my crops. I also know the rivers and lakes have a lot of wealth, so I stole some fish for my fish pond and some waterfowl for my duck farm. I know the earth has much to give, so I stole some earth to build shelters for myself and my livestock. I know the woods have plenty of riches, so now and then I stole some wild game for food. Water, soil, animals, and crops all belong to heaven and earth. I do not possess any of them. Neither does anyone else. That's why I said I stole them to make myself rich. When I steal from heaven and earth, there is no retribution, because I know that no one owns these things. You on the other hand, are foolish enough to steal other people's property. You took gold, jewels, silk, and grain that belonged to people. That is why you were punished by the laws of humanity. Xiang felt that Kuo was tricking him again. As he left the rich man's home, he met the sage Tungkwa. Xiang asked for an explanation of Kuo's speech. The learned man said, Kuo did not steal in the common sense of the word. He understood that the gifts of heaven and earth are there for him to use, although he knows he cannot call them his own. He used the word stealing to mean taking without the need to ask. You on the other hand, do not know this truth, and your ignorance caused you a lot of grief. You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you. Part 2, The Yellow Emperor Chapter 12, The Yellow Emperor Visits the Immortal Lands After he had ruled for fifteen years, the Yellow Emperor looked around his country to see what he had done. When he saw that his subjects respected and loved him, he was delighted. He felt he could now turn his energies to taking care of himself. Retiring from the duties of government, the Yellow Emperor decided to do things to please his body and mind. He ate the best foods, had the best musicians entertain him, slept late, and did what he felt was enjoyable. However, as time went on, his skin darkened, his senses were dulled, he got bored, and his intelligence was slowed. Even his emotions got out of control. So, for the next fifteen years, he took a different approach to life. He quit satisfying his senses, and put all his energies into governing his country. Every day he worked hard, and was anxious that he would not be a good ruler. As time went on, his physical health and mental state got worse. His skin became even darker, his senses got more dulled, his mind got even weaker, and his emotions became more volatile. Seeing what he had gotten himself into, the Yellow Emperor sighed and said, I pampered myself too much, and then pushed myself too hard. No wonder I lost my health and my inner peace. After this, the Yellow Emperor decided to take a rest from court life. He felt he needed time to think, so he left the imperial court, and lived in a simple hut in a corner of the palace grounds. He dismissed his servants and distanced himself from fancy foods, good music, and companionship. He stilled his mind and disciplined his body. For three months, he stayed away from the affairs of government. One day, while dozing in the afternoon, the Yellow Emperor had a dream. He dreamed he had journeyed to a mythical kingdom in the West. These immortal lands were so far away from his own country, that he could only get there in a dream state. In this mythical land, there were no leaders and no teachers, for no one was wiser than another. Not excited about life nor anxious about death, everyone lived a full and contented life. The people there did not have prejudices or preferences, and did not know how to love or hate. They did not know what it means to feel attraction or repulsion, to approach or avoid, to take advantage or to ignore. Therefore, they never developed ideas of wanting and not wanting or liking and disliking. Because there was nothing to welcome or dread, they could stay underwater and not drown, they could walk through fire and not be burned. They could be cut with knives and they would not be wounded. They could be poked and scratched and they would not feel the itch. They could float through space as if they were walking on solid ground. They could sleep on thin air as if it were a solid bed. Clouds and mist could not block their vision, thunder could not disturb their sense of hearing, and beauty and ugliness did not affect their judgment. Traveling in spirit, 
they could walk sure-footed on treacherous paths in the mountains and valleys without fear of the precipitous heights. When he awoke, the yellow emperor felt enlightened. He called his ministers and told them, I have spent three months in seclusion trying to find out what is the best way to govern the country and cultivate myself. However, I did not become enlightened by trying to think things out consciously. I got enlightened in a dream. Now I know that the way is not something that can be discovered by conscious thinking. It can only be attained when conscious thinking stops. The Yellow Emperor then related what he had dreamed to his ministers. Twenty years later, the Yellow Emperor's kingdom was not much different from the mythical land he had visited in his dream. Not long afterward, the Yellow Emperor left the realm of the living and ascended to heaven, and all the people mourned the passing of a great ruler. On the islands in the eastern seas are immortal beings who live on dewdrops and pine cones. They do not eat grain, they feed on the wind and vapor, and their minds are as clear and still as the mountain lake. They have ruddy cheeks and they all look like healthy children. They are open, friendly, and have no inhibitions. They all do their own chores and are helpful to others. There is no fear, no anger, no tension, and no dissatisfaction. No one is superior or inferior to anyone else. Everything is bountiful and everyone enjoys the providence of heaven and earth. The sun and moon send a gentle light, the seasons are never harsh, the earth is rich, and the inhabitants are kind. The deities bless the land, and the monsters never go near it. This is the land the Yellow Emperor visited in his dream. Chapter 13 Riding on the Wind, Floating with the Clouds Li Tiziu had the immortal old Shang for a teacher, and the sage Pai Kaotsu as a friend. After he had finished his training, he came home riding on the wind and floating on the clouds. A man named Inching heard about Li Tzu's feet and wanted to learn the skill of riding on the wind. So he went to Li Tzu and asked to be his student. So intent was Inching on learning the skill that he stayed at Li Tzu's home and kept pestering the teacher with questions. This went on for several months, but Li Tzu only ignored him. Inching began to get impatient and then angry that Li Tzu was not teaching him. One day, he left in a huff. When Inching got home, he calmed down and realized he had been stupid and impulsive, so he went to Li Tzu and asked to be his student again. Li Tzu simply said, Why did you come and then leave and then return? Inching said, When I first came to ask you to teach me, you ignored me. So I got annoyed and left. Then I realized one was too impatient and reckless, so I came back to ask you to accept me as a student again. Li Tzu said, I had thought you were intelligent, but now I can see you are quite stupid. Listen to what I went through when I learned from my teachers. Li Tzu said. When I asked Old Shang to be my master and Pai Kao Tzu to be my friend, I decided to work hard to discipline my body and mind. After three years, I was afraid to have notions of right and wrong, and I did not dare to speak words that might offend or please. It was only then that my master glanced at me and acknowledged my presence. Five years later, I thought freely of right and wrong and spoke freely of approval or disapproval. My master gave me a smile. Seven years later, my thoughts came naturally without any conceptions of right and wrong, and words came naturally without any intention of pleasing or offending. For the first time, my master invited me to sit by his side. Nine years later, no matter what came to my mind or what came out of my mouth, there was nothing that was right or wrong pleasing or offending. I did not even entertain the idea that Old Shang was my master and Pai Kao Tzu was my friend. It was then I became aware that there was no barrier between what was inside and what was outside. My body was illuminated by a bright light. I heard with my eyes and saw with my ears. I used my nose as mouth and my mouth as nose. I experienced the world with the totality of my senses as my spirit gathered and my form dissolved. There was no distinction between muscles and bones. My body stopped being heavy and I felt like a floating leaf. Without knowing it, I was being carried by the wind. Drifting here and there, I did not know whether I rode on the wind or the wind rode on me. 
He then looked at Yinxing and said, You had only been here for less than an hour, and you got dissatisfied that you were not taught. Look at your condition. The parts of your body do not cooperate, the vapors of heaven and earth do not enter your body, your joints and bones are so heavy that you can't even move. And you want to learn how to ride on the wind? When Inching heard these words he was ashamed and did not ask again about riding on the wind. Chapter 14 The Art of Staying Under Water and Walking Through Fire Li Tziyu asked the sage Wen Tzu, Why can the enlightened person stay under water? and not drown, walk on fire, and not be burned, and float on thin air and not fall. Wen Tzu said, he does so not by skill and courage, but by gathering the energy, and focusing the spirit. We think anything that has shape, color, and sound is a thing. What makes one thing different from another? It's shape, color, and sound. And what are shapes, colors, and sounds? They are simply external features of things. If you can see through these external qualities of things, then you will realize they all have the same underlying structure, because they all come from the same origin. Once you transcend the external differences, anything can be merged with anything. Becoming one with the water, you will not drown, becoming one with the fire, you will not burn. To an enlightened person, the world is limitless. He hides in the realm where there is no beginning and no end, and he wanders leisurely where the myriad things appear and disappear. He purifies his original nature, he cultivates his energy, and he maintains his virtue. Unified with the laws of nature, he merges with the natural order of things. Thus, his spirit is not harmed, and things outside cannot penetrate him or harm him. When a drunk man falls off a cart, he is not severely injured. Why is this? The drunk man's bones and flesh are the same as everybody else's, but while the conscious man might be killed in the fall, the drunk man could escape without a scratch. This is because the drunk man is unaware of fear or death. To him there is no difference whether he is in the cart or falling off the cart. On the other hand, the conscious man stiffens up in fear when he falls because he is affected by what is happening around him. If you can lose the sense of self and other through wine, think of what truly forgetting yourself can do. The enlightened person merges with everything around him. Therefore, nothing around him can harm him. Chapter 15 The Art of Archery Li Tzu wanted to show off his skill of archery to a friend. He drew his bow and placed a cup of water on his left forearm. Then he notched an arrow and let it fly. Before the first arrow hit the target, he had let off the second and the third. When he saw that all three arrows hit the center of the target, Li Tzu was quite pleased with himself. So steady was his hand and so focused was his concentration that the water in the cup did not spill. His friend, however, was not impressed. He said to Li Tzu, What you showed me was merely the skill of eye and hand, and not the state of mind of a true archer. Let's go up to the mountains and stand on the edge of a cliff. If you can shoot accurately under those conditions, then I shall be convinced of your mastery in archery. The two went up to the mountains, and when they reached the top of a peak, Li Tzu's friend walked toward the edge of a cliff that dropped a thousand feet below. Standing with his back to the drop and with half of his foot over the edge, he invited Li Tzu to join him. Li Tzu was already trembling when he saw his friend walk toward the edge of the cliff. Now, at the thought of standing with his back to an abyss, he fell on his face and broke into a cold sweat. Li Tzu's friend then said, The master archer can fire an arrow under any condition. Whether he sees the clear sky or faces the yawning abyss, he can still shoot with the same state of mind. He is not affected by conditions of life and death, for nothing can move the stillness of his mind. Look at yourself now. You are so scared that you can't stand up or look straight. How can you even begin to demonstrate the art of archery? Chapter 16 Feats of Power In the country of Qin there lived an influential man by the name of Tsuhua. Though not a government official by rank, Tsuhua had power equal to that of ministers. He was favored by the king, and he rubbed shoulders with the nobles. Those who were in good rapport with him received benefits, and those who fell out of his favor could never hope to find fortune. 
Suhua kept a large number of retainers and encouraged them to compete with each other in contests of physical and mental prowess. When the competitions led to death or injuries, Suhua was not at all concerned. He let the stronger men bully the weaker ones, and the smarter ones ridicule the slow-witted ones. Challenges and mockery were the norm in the region where his influence was felt. One day, two of Tsuhua's men were on an errand far from the city. When night fell, they found lodging at the house of an old farmer by the name of Shang. The two men talked all night about their master. They remarked that if anyone had the power to grant life or death, bestow fortune and misfortune, it was Tsuhua. The old farmer overheard this and decided he would try to make his fortune by offering his services to this powerful man. The next day, after the retainers had left, Shang borrowed some money and provisions from his neighbors. Wearing a straw hat and carrying a basket on his back, he went to Tsuhua's mansion. When he got there, he saw that all of Tsuhua's retainers wore rich silks, rode fine horses, and had an air of arrogance. They looked at the old farmer with the dirty face and ragged clothes and began to tease him and push him around. They gave him the meanest tasks, they beat him up and made fun of him all the time. However, no matter how they tried to bully him, Shang took the mockery and the beatings with a good nature. Soon, Tsu Hua's men got bored with their cruelty and left him alone. One time, the retainers were standing on a platform high above the ground, and were boasting about their feats and challenging each other. Shang was also there. The men joked and said, whoever's brave enough to jump down from this scaffold will be awarded with 100 pieces of gold. While they were goading and daring each other, Shang stepped forward and, without hesitation, jumped off the platform. He floated down and landed on his feet, unhurt. Su Hua's retainers were surprised, but they thought maybe this time Shang had been lucky. So they led Shang to a bend in the river where the waters were deep and swift and told him, somewhere in those deep waters is a pearl. Whoever's brave enough to dive down and find it will keep that jewel. Shang immediately jumped into the river and went underwater. Not long afterward, he came back with a large and shining pearl in his hand. After this, Shang began to earn the respect of Tsu Hua's retainers. They stopped pushing him around. Even Tsu Hua got word of Shang's abilities and started to give him the stipend of gold and cloth that the other retainers received. One night, a fire broke out in a warehouse where the silks were kept. Su Hua arrived at the scene with his retainers. Seeing that he was about to lose a large fortune, the master said to his retainers, I shall give a huge reward to the person who can get my silks out of that burning building. Shang immediately rushed through the flames and started carrying bundles of silk and brocade out of the burning building. Fire and smoke did not seem to affect him. He walked through flames and burning debris and rescued all of Tsu Hua's wares. After this feat, Shang was not only respected but admired. The retainers who had bullied him now apologized to him we had no idea you knew magic and could do all these things that ordinary people could not do. We're sorry we were unkind to you and made fun of you when you first came. We tried to fool you into doing impossible tasks and now we feel stupid for not recognizing that you are a man of power. Others also crowded around Shang, congratulated him, and begged him to teach them the secrets of flying through air, staying underwater, and walking through fire. Shang answered them, I have no idea how I managed to do those incredible feats. There is really nothing magical about them. When I heard that one could make a fortune in the services of Master Tsuhua, I came believing I would make a fortune. After I got here, there was no doubt in my mind that if I jumped down from the scaffold I would get rich, or that if I dived into the deep river, I would find jewels. It never occurred to me that those tasks were impossible. Now that you have told me you had originally set out to fool me, I shall be more reluctant to rush headlong into anything. I have discovered what it's like to be afraid, and I am beginning to doubt whether I am indeed able to walk through fire or fly through air. From now on, no matter how much you reward me, I shall not jump from a tower, dive into deep water, or walk through a burning building. Chapter 17 The Art of Taming Tigers The king of Chou had an animal caretaker by the name of Liang who was an expert in taming animals. 
This man was not only able to tame the more commonly domesticated animals like dogs and horses, but he was especially adept at taming wild animals such as tigers, wolves, and eagles and other birds of prey. The animals were so tame that he could let them roam around his courtyard. Female and male were not afraid to mate in his presence, and different species of animals lived comfortably side by side without conflict. The king was very impressed with Liang, and was afraid that such skills of animal taming would disappear when this man died. So he set one of his servants to become Liang's apprentice. When the new apprentice arrived, Liang said to him, There isn't really much to taming wild animals. However, if I do not explain to you how I managed to tame these animals, the king will be mad at me. Now listen carefully. Animals have a unique nature. They do not fly into a rage or calm down for no apparent reason. The secret to taming wild animals is to understand their nature. Generally, if you do not rouse their ferocity, they will be calm, however, if you do something that goes against their nature, they will be enraged. Typically, a man who feeds tigers will not give them a live animal, because the tiger's ferocity will be aroused when they chase and tear at their prey. Moreover, he feeds the tiger when it begins to get hungry, not when it is very hungry or when it is full. In this way, the animal feels satisfied when it is fed. Tigers are different from people, and to tame them you need to understand their natural instincts and not go against them. Leung continued, Although I am careful not to make my tigers angry, I also do not let them have their way completely. If they get too happy or excited, they may become angry. You need to keep them in a balanced state, not too happy and not discontented. It is because I do not go out of my way to make them happy, or behave in such a way to provoke their rage that my animals feel that I am one of them. That's why they are content to stay in my gardens, and do not want to go back to the wilderness. Chapter 18 The Art of Steering a Boat A student asked Confucius, One time when I was crossing a river I noticed that the ferryman handled the boat with such grace that I asked him if this skill can be learned. He told me anyone can learn this skill, but if you know how to swim, then you will find it especially easy. I then asked whether a person who knows how to swim underwater, but has never seen a boat before will also find it easy to learn how to handle a boat. The man did not answer that question for me. Can you tell me why? Confucius said, it is easy for a swimmer to learn to steer a boat, because this person already understands the nature of water. To him it is natural to move around in water. In fact, the swimmer's movements are so natural in the water that he forgets he is in the water. The diver who has never seen a boat should also have no problem in picking up the skills of boating. To him, the deep sea is like dry land. He is so accustomed to going underwater that a boat rolling over is nothing to him. He is not afraid of what may happen to the boat. He is as relaxed in a boat as he is on land. Therefore, he will learn quickly. When Confucius saw that his student was still puzzled, he continued, If you play a game where scrap pieces of glass are at stake, you will play skillfully. If your expensive belt buckle is at stake, you'll start to get clumsy. If it's your money that's at stake, you'll fumble. It's not that you've lost your skill. It's because you are so flustered by things happening outside that you've lost your calmness inside. Lose your stillness and you will fail in everything you do. Chapter 19, The Art of Swimming Confucius and his students were standing near a waterfall. The water flowed over a ledge and dropped over 300 feet below, where the river continued to flow swiftly through a gorge over 30 miles long. Even the fish, turtles, and alligators would not go near these dangerous waters. Suddenly, they saw a figure jump from the top of the waterfall into the foaming river. Confucius thought this man must be attempting suicide, so he told his students to get to the banks of the river and be ready for a rescue. But when they hurried to the edge of the river, they saw someone swimming leisurely to the bank. To their surprise, the man stood up in the shallows, shook the water off his long hair, and began to sing. Confucius couldn't believe what he saw, so he walked toward the strange man and said, When I saw you dive from the top of the waterfall, I thought you wanted to kill yourself. Then, when I saw you swimming in those treacherous waters and enjoying yourself, I thought you were a ghost. 
But coming up close, I can see that you are human. How did you manage to swim through such dangerous waters? The long-haired man replied, I have no particular method of swimming, except that when I am in the water, I do not fight the water. I float with it and sink with it instead of trying to force my way through it. You can say that I started my learning with what was given to me at birth, continued with what was natural for me to do, and completed it by trusting what was meant to be. Confucius said, Tell me what you mean. The man replied, It means following the natural course of things. If I were born in the mountains, it would be natural for me to feel comfortable in the high mountains. That's starting out with what is given in birth. If I were born by the sea, it would be natural for me to grow up playing in the water. That's continuing with what is natural to do. When I do something, it never occurs to me to think about how I do it. That's trusting what is meant to be. Chapter 20 The Man Who Could Walk Through Fire A hunter and a large party of his followers were searching in the central mountains for game. When they could not find any animals in the area, they set the tall grass on fire, hoping the animals would be driven out of their hiding. Suddenly, they saw a figure emerge from the rocks. When the hunter and his friends saw the figure dancing in the fire and smoke, they thought they must have seen a ghost. However, when the fire died down, they saw the figure again, this time walking leisurely as if nothing had happened. The hunter was curious, so he walked toward the figure to have a closer look. When he realized the figure had the shape and features of a human, he was even more fascinated. So he went up to the man and asked him, Why do you live in the rocks and why do you run among the flames? The man replied, What are rocks, what are flames? I don't know what you're talking about. Later, when the Marquis of Wei heard about this, he asked Susia, a student of Confucius, Have you heard of people who can walk through fire? Susia said, My teacher Confucius once said if someone is in harmony with the elements around him, he will not be harmed by them. This person would be able to merge with the rocks and walk through fire. Can you do this? I can't do it because I am still unable to empty my mind and throw away my knowledge. I only know enough to talk about it. Can your teacher do it? My teacher can do it, but he doesn't want to. When the Marquis heard this, he was delighted and asked no more. Chapter 21 Li Tzu and the Sorcerer There was a sorcerer who could foretell the future. One look at someone's facial features and he could tell whether this person would live or die, be lucky or unlucky. He could even tell an individual's age, day of birth, and day of death. Everybody stayed away from this sorcerer because they were afraid he might tell them things they would rather not know. Only Li Tzu was impressed with the sorcerer's abilities and welcomed his company. Li Tzu was so taken by the sorcerer's power that he went to his teacher Hu Tzu and said, In the past I thought you had mastered the mysteries of heaven and earth, but now I've found someone who has more power. Hu Tzu said, You have only scratched the surface of my teachings. I have not yet begun to show you the underlying nature of things, and you think you have understood the mysteries of the universe. If you interact with people with superficial knowledge, you will be entirely predictable. Bring this sorcerer to me and let's see what happens. The next day Li Tzu brought the sorcerer to see Hu Tzu. Respectfully, Li Tzu waited outside. When the sorcerer came out, he said to Li Tzu, I have bad news for you. Your master is about to die. At most he'll have ten days left. His face was like ash and he was as immobile as a corpse. Distressed and weeping, Li Tzu went in to see his teacher and related what the sorcerer had said. Hu Tzu said, Just then I showed him the dominance of Yin over Yang. My body was rigid and my breath was dormant. Therefore, he saw me as dying. Ask him to come again. The next day, Li Tzu got the sorcerer to come again to see Hu Tzu. This time, when he came out, the sorcerer said to Li Tzu, Congratulations. Your master is getting better. He is lucky to have met me. I now see signs of life in him. When Li Tzu related what the sorcerer had said, Hu Tzu smiled. Just then I showed him the dominance of Yang over Yin. The primordial breath had just awakened in me. 
I can't name it or describe it. It was rising from my heels to fill my body. Therefore, he saw me returning to life. Get him to come again. When the sorcerer saw Hu Tzu again, he said to Li Tzu, Your teacher is changing all the time. I can't read him. I'll have to come back when he's more stable. Hu Tzu then said to Li Tzu, Just then I showed him the copulation of Yin and Yang. He probably saw the process of creation and dissolution, and the flux and change of things. Streams, rivers, waterfalls, springs, lakes, rapids, eddies, vortices are all different manifestations of water, but eventually they all flow into deep pools. There are nine pools and I have shown him three. Tell him to come again. This time the sorcerer had scarcely walked into Hu Tzu's place when he came running out. Stop him, said Hu Tzu. Li Tzu ran after the sorcerer, but was just not fast enough. He soon lost track of him. Li Tzu returned to his teacher and said, He ran so fast I couldn't catch up with him. Hu Tzu then said, What I just showed him was what it was like before I came into the world. I had no shape, no form, no sound, no smell. I drifted in and out of things. I could not be grasped or examined. He has never seen this kind of thing before, so he got scared and ran. From that time on, Li Tzu realized that his learning was shallow, and he was indeed far from understanding the way of heaven and earth. So he returned home and did not leave his house for three years. He cooked for his wife and did the housework. He took care of the pigs and was kind to everyone and everything. He distanced himself from worldly matters and freed himself from the entanglement of truths and lies. He was no longer a piece of carved jade, but an unhewn block of wood. In the midst of the muddy world, he remained true to himself, and in simplicity and stillness he spent the rest of his life. Chapter 22 Li Tzu's Fear Li Tzu was on his way to the kingdom of Qi when he decided to turn back. On the road he met one of his former teachers, Pahan, who asked him, You were going to Qi, why did you turn back? Li Tzu said, Because I'm afraid. What's there to be afraid of? I ate at ten inns and five of them served me before they served anyone else. What's the problem? Li Tzu said, It occurred to me that my ego was getting the better of me, and I was commanding some sort of respect or making people think I am an important man. This made the innkeepers give me preferential treatment. If this goes on, I'll be in trouble. Li Tzu continued, Innkeepers do not make much money, and certainly do not have much say in politics. If people with so little to gain make a big deal out of me, then I would really be in trouble when the generals and the chiefs of state come after me for advice. That's why I'm afraid. Pahan said, good observations. But let me tell you one thing. Even if you stay and do not go to Qi, other people will not let you off the hook easily. Li Tzu never went to Qi. Instead he decided to settle down in a quiet place. Not long afterward, Pahan came by to visit him. Seeing the shoes of many visitors at the entrance to Li Tzu's house, Pahan stood outside, leaned on his staff, and then left without a word. When Li Tzu was told that his former teacher was seen outside his door, he ran out barefooted and caught up with Pahan, saying, Master, since you have come, why don't you come in and instruct me? Pahan said, I have nothing to say. I told you before that people will not let you go easily. Now it has happened. People come to you not because you are capable of allowing them to respect you, but because you can't prevent them from doing so. You displayed your virtue and accomplishments and attracted people to come to learn from you, and neither you nor these people benefit from this. They flatter you and you say what they like to hear. You patronize each other and in the end no one gets enlightened. Chapter 23 Lao Tzu Teaches Yang Chu Yang Chu was Lao Tzu's student. When he heard that Lao Tzu was journeying westward to the land of Qin, he caught up with his teacher on the road just outside the town of Liang. Lao Tzu looked at Yang Chu, and then looked up at the sky and sighed, Once I thought you were teachable, but now I know you cannot learn. When Yang Chu heard this he was puzzled, but he said nothing. 
He followed Lao Tzu to the inn and attended his master. He gave his teacher a comb, a towel, and a basin of water, and waited patiently while his teacher cleaned up. When he saw that Lao Tzu had finally sat down, he took off his shoes, crawled on his hands and knees to his teacher, and said respectfully, A while ago you said I was unteachable. Seeing that you were hurrying toward town, I did not dare to delay you by asking for an explanation. Now that you seem to have some time, I would like to find out what I have done wrong. Lao Tzu said, You are arrogant and haughty. You have no respect for anything. No wonder no one wants your company. Yang Chu humbly asked for instruction. Lao Tzu then said, A person with virtue does not consider himself or herself virtuous, and someone who is enlightened does not appear perfect. Only then can you transcend the world, and yet be a part of it. Yang Chu took his teacher's advice immediately. When he first arrived at the inn, the innkeeper would greet him respectfully every day. The innkeeper's wife was afraid that she did not serve him well. The other customers sat at a respectful distance and dared not say a word. By the time Yang Chu left the inn to continue his journey, he was joking with the innkeeper and was so friendly with the other customers that they began to fight to sit at his table. Chapter 24 What is there to appearances? While traveling to the kingdom of Sung, Yang Chu stayed at an inn. The innkeeper had two wives, one pretty and one ugly. When Yang Chu saw that the innkeeper loved the ugly woman more than the pretty one, he was surprised and asked the innkeeper, Most people will love a pretty woman and ignore an ugly one. Why do you do the opposite? The innkeeper replied, The beautiful one thinks she's beautiful, but I don't see her beauty. The ugly one thinks she's ugly, but I don't see her ugliness. Yang Chu turned to his students and said, Remember this well. If you are true to yourself and do everything with a good conscience, everyone will see the virtue in you. Then no matter where you go, you will be respected. When we look at things, we often assume that when two things look alike outside, they must be similar inside. However, the sage knows that appearances cannot tell us about what's inside. Something may look like a human and yet may not be as intelligent as a human, and something may not appear like a human and yet be as intelligent as a human. We also tend to be attracted to things that resemble us and distance ourselves from things that don't. When we see something that is about six feet tall, walks on two legs, has hair on its head and fingers on its hands, we call it a human and we immediately feel friendly toward it. When we see something that walks on four legs, flies, or crawls, we immediately feel this is something different from us and become wary. However, the sage knows that some animals are as intelligent and caring as humans, and some humans are as savage as animals. How can we judge by appearances? The benefactors of humanity, the goddess Nu who created us, the sage Xingneng who taught us agriculture, and many of humanity's teachers in the ancient times, do not appear in human form. Some have the body of a snake, others have the head of a bull, and yet others have wings and claws. On the other hand, the tyrants who enslaved people and killed innocents are human in appearance. Thus, how can you judge something simply by its appearance? When the Yellow Emperor defended his country from invaders, he had an army of tigers, bears, wolves, and leopards. Eagles, falcons, and hawks carried his banners. It was said that the Emperor Yao could call animals to his side with flute and chimes. Therefore, how are animals so different from us when they can respond to our call? We think we are unable to communicate with animals because they do not resemble us in appearance and they make different sounds. However, the ancient sages knew otherwise, for they could talk to animals and understand them. Actually, animals are very similar to humans. They know how to take care of themselves, they mate, they care for their young, they avoid danger, and they seek warmth and shelter. When they travel, the strong ones protect the young. Some scout for water, some break the trail, and others watch for danger. Is this not what intelligent humans do? In the ancient days, animals and humans lived peacefully together. Humans did not harm animals, and animals were not afraid of people. In the time of the emperors, animals began to fear people because they were hunted. Now we rarely see animals in their natural environment, 
because they have learned to hide from us. In a land far to the east, there are people who could still talk to domesticated animals and understand them. However, only the ancient sages knew the language of all animals and could summon them and give them instructions. In fact, these sages could speak with spirits and monsters, and thus their teachings reached all the myriad things of creation, humans and non-humans alike. Chapter 25 Softness and Hardness, Yielding and Resisting There are many things about the way of heaven and earth that people find puzzling. For example, strength does not always win, and sometimes softness may be a more effective strategy. If you routinely try to overcome strength with strength, then one day you will meet someone who is stronger than you are, and you will be defeated. However, if you know how to yield, then you will never be in danger. If you are competitive, there will always be that one time that you will lose. If you are non-competitive, you will not have to worry about winning and losing. Strength should always be complemented by softness. If you resist too much, you will break. Thus, the strong person knows when to use strength and when to yield, and good fortune and disaster depend on whether you know how and when to yield. Lao Tzu once said, if a branch is too rigid, it will break. Resist and you will perish. Know how to yield and you will survive. There was once a king who was only interested in hiring men who were strong and brave because he believed that strength was the best way to protect himself. One day, a wandering philosopher visited the king. The king was in a bad mood that day and was scowling and pacing around. He saw the philosopher and said, I am only interested in hearing about strength and courage. If you are going to talk to me about virtue and morality, then you are wasting my time. The philosopher said, If I had a strategy that will guarantee that anyone who attempts to stab you will miss, would you be interested? Of course I'd like to hear about it. If someone tries to stab you and misses, you will still be humiliated by the attempt on your life. Therefore, a better strategy would be one in which people will never dare to strike you in the first place. The king reluctantly agreed. The philosopher continued, Now, if people do not dare to harm you, there's no guarantee that they will not wish to harm you. Therefore, an even better strategy is one that will make people not want to harm you at all. The king nodded thoughtfully. The philosopher then said, But just because people do not want to harm you doesn't mean they will respect you or love you. Suppose you had a strategy that could get them to love you and respect you, so that your concerns are their concerns. Would this strategy be several times better than just strength and courage? The king exclaimed, This is exactly what I am looking for. The philosopher said, Confucius and Emotsu were not princes. They never became leaders or held any political office. However, people gave them respect equal to that of kings and nobles. Everywhere they went, people craned their necks and stood on tiptoes to catch a glimpse of them. Everyone respected them and wished them well. Your Majesty, you already have political and military power. If you rule your people with virtue and integrity, wouldn't your greatness surpass that of Confucius and Emotsu? The king was at a loss for words. Seeing that he had accomplished his aim, the philosopher left quickly. The king turned to his ministers and said, Here's a man who really knows how to talk. He's completely turned me around with his arguments. You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you. Part 3 slash King Mu of CHOU Chapter 26 King Mu's Dream King Mu of Chou was visited by a strange man from the far west. This man was a sorcerer who could walk through fire and water, penetrate stone and metal, fly through air, and move mountains and rivers. King Mu was very impressed with the sorcerer's abilities and treated him like a god. He built a palace for him, sent him the finest foods in his kingdom, and provided him with the most talented and beautiful courtesans. However, the sorcerer did not think much of these gifts. He found the palace uncomfortable, the food displeasing, and the entertainers ugly, smelly, and uncultured. Seeing that his guest was dissatisfied, the king built another palace grander than the one before. 
He used the best wooden stone from his kingdom and employed the most skillful craftspeople to design and built it. The palace was a tower that reached up to the clouds and had a view of the most scenic mountains and valleys in the land. King Mu called at the tower in the middle of the sky. The king also gathered together the most beautiful and gentle young women in his kingdom. He provided them with the best jewelry and silks, sprinkled them with the most fragrant perfumes, and sent them to attend to the needs of the sorcerer. He called in the most talented musicians to perform the best music ever written. Every month he offered his guest expensive garments, and every morning served him delicacies. The sorcerer was still not very satisfied, but seeing that the king had done his best, he grudgingly accepted the gifts. Not long afterward, the sorcerer invited King Mu to travel with him to his country in the west. Telling the king to close his eyes and hang on to his sleeve, he flew into the sky. When the king opened his eyes, he found himself in the sorcerer's country. Entering the palace grounds, he saw that the buildings were decorated with silver and gold. Jade, pearls, and other precious jewels adorned the walls and windows. The palace stood on a bed of clouds above the rain and storm. Everything he saw, heard, and experienced was unknown in his world. It was then that King Mu realized the gods must have enjoyed such luxuries in their heavenly palaces. Compared to this, his own palace appeared like a mean hovel. King Mu said to himself, I have never seen anything like this. I wouldn't mind staying here for ten or twenty years. His musing was interrupted by the sorcerer, who took him to visit yet another realm. This time, when King Mu arrived, he could not see sun or moon, mountains or seas. Everywhere he looked, the light was so dazzling that all he could see was a kaleidoscope of colors that made him dizzy. The sounds he heard were eerie and strange and soon his senses were disoriented. His body was shaking and his mind was a blur. His insides felt queasy and he thought he was going to get sick. He quickly asked the sorcerer to get him out of there or he would go crazy. The sorcerer gave the king a gentle push and King Mu was back at his own palace. When he opened his eyes, the king found himself sitting on his chair as if he had never left. The wine was still unfinished in his cup and the food was still warm. His attendants were standing in the same position as before. When he asked them what had happened, his attendants replied that he had sat in his chair and had closed his eyes briefly. King Mu was so shocked by this that it took him almost three months to recover from the whole experience. Finally, he decided to ask the sorcerer what had really happened. His distinguished guest replied, We traveled on a journey of the spirit. That's why your body did not move and time did not pass. You experienced a world unknown to you while you were sitting in your own palace. Is there really a difference between the places you visited and the one you call home? You were shocked and disoriented because you are comfortable with what you call permanent, and you are made nervous by things you feel are transient. Your reactions are the result of your mind playing tricks on you. Who can tell when and how fast one situation changes into another, and which one is real, and which one is not? After King Mu heard this, he decided to retire from politics. He ordered his attendants to ready his carriage and horses, and went on a grand tour of his kingdom. He traveled to foreign lands where he was entertained by lords. In one of the places he visited, the tribal chief offered him the blood of snow geese as a drink and washed his feet with cow and goat milk. Then the king climbed to the top of the Kuanluan Mountains, where he glimpsed the royal palace of the Yellow Emperor and built a memorial for future generations to remember this mighty ruler. Next he visited the Mother Empress of the West, who gave a banquet in his honor and entertained him with dance and song. The king sang a duet with the Heavenly Empress, but the music only conjured feelings of sadness. As the sun began to set in the western skies, King Mu realized he had journeyed over 10,000 miles in one day. He sighed and said, Instead of using my time to rule the country and care for my subjects, I have spent this day singing and enjoying myself. I will probably be seen as a fool by future generations. King Mu was not divine. He enjoyed his life fully and died when his time was up. But everybody believed he became a god and went up to heaven. Chapter 27 Learning the Arcane Arts 
L-A-O-C-H-E-N-G-T-Z-U went to learn the secrets of the arcane arts from the sage Wuntsu. When his teacher had not told him anything after three years, he apologized for his stupidity and asked for permission to return home. When Tsu bowed to Lao Siaching Tsu, led him into his room, dismissed the other students, and closed the door. Then he said, When my teacher Lao Tzu left for the Western lands, he told me that the life and breath of heaven and earth and the shape of all things are really illusions. When yin and yang energies copulate and things come into existence, we call it birth. When they separate and disappear, we call it death. That which happens according to the mathematics of change we call transformation, or the arcane. The principles of creation and dissolution are profound and not easily understood. If we simply latch on to the superficial aspects of change, we will only be playing with illusions, and whatever we manipulate will not have lasting effects. Only when you penetrate the mathematics of transformation and become one with change will you be qualified to learn the arcane arts. After all, you and I are illusions of body and mind, so what is so magical about the arcane? Lao Siaching Tzu thanked his teacher and returned home. For three months he thought about what Wen Tzu had said and began to let go of the illusion of body and mind. Having done that, he was able to appear and disappear at will and turn the seasons around. He could call down thunder in winter and snow in summer. He could make running animals fly and flying animals run. However, he did not reveal his abilities to anyone, so these arts were never handed down to future generations. Li Tzu said, those who are adept at the arcane arts do not reveal them casually. In fact, they hide it so well that what they do appears ordinary. It is generally accepted that the ancient sages and kings accomplished what they did with virtue and courage. But who can say they did not use the arts of the arcane? Chapter 28 Dreams it is said that episodes in our waking life can be classified into eight categories, and experiences in our dream life can be divided into six. Our life on earth revolves around these fourteen kinds of events. The eight episodes of our waking life are events, actions, gain, loss, happiness, sorrow, life, and death. These are experienced when our bodies encounter something in the world. The six experiences of our dream life are Normal dreams with nothing significant, dreams of warning, dreams that result from excessive thinking, instructive dreams, happy dreams, and fearful dreams or nightmares. These dream states are experienced when our minds are restless. If we do not recognize when changes come and why they occur, we will be confused. However, if we know the cause and effect of things, then we are prepared and will not be excited or afraid. This is the same with dreams. The rise and fall of energy in our bodies follows the flow of energy in heaven and earth. When there is too much in energy, then we will dream about deep waters and experience the fear of drowning. When there is too much yang energy, we will dream about hot fires and experience the threat of being burned. When both yin and yang energies are powerful, then we will dream of violence and killing. When we are hungry, we will dream about begging for food. When filled, we will dream about offering food to others. For the same reason, those who are ill with a burning fever will dream that their bodies are light and floating. Those who are ill with a shivering cold will dream they are sinking and drowning. Sleep with your belt around you, and you will dream you are suffocated by a snake. Sleep when darkness begins to fall, and you will dream of firelight. If your stomach is upset when you sleep, you will dream of eating. People who go to sleep depressed will dream of drinking wine. Those who go to sleep after crying in sorrow will dream of dancing and singing. Li Tzu said, When the mind is restless, we will dream. What aroused the body during the day will appear in our dreams at night. This is a way in which mind and body respond to each other. Thus, people whose minds are empty of thoughts and whose bodies are not aroused by things around them will not be bothered by dreams at night. These people are fully awake in their waking life and fully restful in their sleep. The ancient sages are not attached to their thoughts and actions during the day, so they do not dream at night. There is a land far away that does not receive the breath of yin and yang. 
Therefore, in this place there are no changes in the seasons, and no difference in night or day. The people there do not work, or eat, or wear clothes. They sleep most of the time, and only wake up once every fifty days. In the brief time they are awake, they feel they are dreaming. On the other hand, dreams are very real to them. There is another country that is in the middle of the world. The land stretches north and south of a great river, it is bounded by mountains to the east and west, and it extends over ten thousand miles. Because it is in the middle of the world, it receives the breath of Yin and Yang equally. Therefore, there are differences in the seasons and a clear distinction between day and night. Some people in this country are intelligent and some are dull. Some are talented and some are ordinary. The people in this country have an organized society, know how to cultivate the land, and are ruled by a leader. They are also skilled in a variety of activities. The people here believe that what they experience in waking life is real, and what they experience in dreams is unreal. There is yet another country where it is always hot. The sun and moon never set, and there is no night. Battered by the heat, the land does not support crops. The people feed on wild fruits and tree roots, and do not know how to cook with fire. They are fierce and violent. The strong ones conquer the weak. They value force over virtue. Because there is no night, they are active all the time and sleep very rarely. Are events in our waking life more real than dreams? To people who sleep all the time, dreams are more real than waking life. However, to those who divide their time equally between waking and sleeping, experiences in their waking life are real, and events in dreams are unreal. And yet, to those who do not know what it means to sleep, it does not make sense to talk about a difference between waking and dreaming. What then is the difference between waking and dreaming? Chapter 29, The Truth About Happiness and Misery A certain rich man in the country of CHOU had a way with managing his business. Under his supervision, his estates and investments yielded huge returns. However, he drove his workers mercilessly and made them labor from sunrise to sunset. There was an old servant who had worked all his life on the estate. Weakened by hard labor and rough treatment, he had lost both strength and stamina, and was no longer able to produce. But the businessman had no compassion for the poor servant. Instead, he punished him for being lazy and drove him to work harder and longer. The servant was so miserable that he groaned all day while he worked. Tired in body and mind, he fell into a deep sleep at night. As he lost consciousness, he began to dream. He dreamed he was king of a prosperous land and had thousands of servants at his command. He lived in a beautiful palace, toured his kingdom in pomp and luxury, and was happy beyond imagination. But when he woke up the next morning, it was another day of misery. When his fellow workers comforted him, the old servant said, It is really not that bad. I suffer during the day, but at night I enjoy myself when I am the king of a country. Meanwhile, the rich businessman found that he was extremely tired after managing his estates each day. He too fell into a deep sleep and dreamed. But when he dreamed, his dream was a nightmare. He became a slave bonded to a cruel master. He was given the meanest tasks and was forced to work long, hard hours. Even when he was tired he was driven mercilessly. He was beaten and punished for every possible fault whether it was his or not. He suffered miserably in his dream and only got relief at daybreak. Every day the two men played out the roles of master and servant. Every night they dreamed and played out the roles of slave and king. The days and months went by. The rich man was miserable and asked a friend for help. The friend said to him, You have a huge fortune and a respected name in the business world. Your social standing is far above the ordinary persons. Therefore, dreaming that you are at the bottom of the social ladder is quite normal. Things have a way of balancing themselves out. If you want to have everything go your way in both your waking and dreaming life, that's impossible. The businessman thought about his friend's words and realized that he was pushing things to the extreme. He had made himself too fortunate and his workers too miserable. From then on, he treated his workers with compassion, lessened their workloads, and did not drive himself as hard. 
As a result, everybody felt better. The rich man did not have nightmares of being a slave at night, and the old servant did not have to suffer through the day. Chapter 30 What is Real and What is Unreal? A man who was gathering firewood in the wilderness came across a deer. He killed it and hid it in a hollow so he could return and retrieve it later. He was so happy about his tremendous luck that he soon forgot where he hid the deer and began to suspect he might have dreamed the whole thing. As he walked home, he muttered to himself about his strange dream. A passerby happened to overhear the woodcutter talking to himself and decided to see if he could find the deer the man had mentioned. After searching around carefully in the area where the woodcutter had described, he found the deer in a hollow covered by branches. Amazed at his good fortune, the man took the deer home and said to his wife, Today I met a man who dreamed he had killed a deer but had forgotten where he hid it. I went and looked around the place where he said he had killed the animal and found it in a hollow. Isn't it incredible that dreams can be real? His wife replied, I think you probably dreamed the whole incident. You found a deer and you dreamed you met a woodcutter who talked about killing one. Her husband then said, Well, it doesn't really matter whether I dreamed up the incident or not. I found a deer and now we have a good supply of food. When the woodcutter got home he was still bothered about whether he had killed a deer or not. That night he had a dream. He dreamed he had indeed killed a deer and had placed it in a hollow and covered it with branches. Moreover, in his dream he saw that someone whom he had met on the way home had gone to the hiding place and taken away his deer. The next morning he went straight to the house he saw in his dream and found the deer in the yard. He went in to claim his deer, but the other man would not give it up. Finally, the two went to the local magistrate to settle the matter. The magistrate listened to both men's claims and then said, One of you killed the deer, and then said it was a dream. Later you claimed it was real, and not a dream. Now the other one of you found a deer that someone dreamed he killed, but you tell me your wife said that you dreamed up the whole thing, and that the woodcutter and his dream never existed. Well, all I see here are a deer and two people contesting their claims. I judge that the deer be divided up equally between the two of you. When the king heard about this strange incident, he asked his minister, Do you suppose the magistrate will dream about dividing the deer? His minister replied, I cannot tell whether something was real or dreamed. Only sages like the Yellow Emperor or Confucius can tell the difference between waking and dreaming. Since they have both left this world, we will have no way of telling what was dreamed and what was not. So, in the meantime, I would go along with the magistrate's decision of dividing the deer in half. Chapter 31 The Man Who Lost His Memory A man called Huatzu suddenly lost his memory in middle age. If you gave him something in the morning, he would forget about it by evening. If you asked him about something in the evening, he would forget it the next day. In the street he would forget to walk. At home he would forget to sit. Today he would forget what happened yesterday, and tomorrow he would not remember what happened the day before. Concerned about his loss of memory, his family first invited a fortune teller, and then a sorcerer to see if they could help Huatsu restore his memory. When neither could help, a doctor was called, but the healer shook his head and said there was nothing he could do either. Finally, Huatsu thought about a philosopher who probably could help him. So desperate was Huatsu's wife in finding him a cure that she sold half their possessions and took her husband to the philosopher to ask for help. The family traveled to the philosopher's home and begged the wise man to cure Huatsu. The philosopher told the family, this kind of illness cannot be cured by omens, magic, or herbs. I'll have to use special methods that are designed to work on his mind. The philosopher then tried an experiment on Huatsu. When he told Huatsu to take off his clothes, Huatsu wanted to be dressed. When he starved the man, Huatsu asked for food. When he locked Huatsu in a dark room, the man wanted to get out. Seeing Huatsu's reactions, the scholar was delighted and told Huatsu's wife, Your husband can be cured. However, I will need to use a secret method that was handed down to me through the generations. Therefore, I cannot allow you to stay here and watch. Come back in seven days. 
You have my guarantee that he will be cured. Huat Su's family had no choice but to leave. For seven days the philosopher was secluded with Huat Su. No one knew what he did or how he did it, but when Huat Su's family arrived to take him home, they found him completely cured. After Huat Su recovered his memory, he became irritable and angry. He chased out his wife, beat up his sons, and threatened the philosopher with a spear. When the police arrested him for disrupting the peace and questioned his motives, Huatsu said, When I lost my memory, I was carefree and happy. I slept peacefully and had no worries when I woke up. I didn't have anything on my mind, and I was a free man. Now that I've got my memory back I am miserable. I look back on the fortunes and misfortunes, the gains and losses, and the joys and sorrows in my life, and I am overwhelmed. I woke up from a good dream into a nightmare. I will never be able to go back to the happy times when my memory was lost. When Tsu Kung, a student of Confucius, heard about Huat Tzu's outburst, he was puzzled. He went to ask his teacher for an explanation, but Confucius only said, This is something you will never understand. He then turned to his most promising student, Yen Hui, and told him to take note of all this. Chapter 32 Who is Confused? There was a man who had a very precocious son, but when the boy grew up, he seemed to have a strange kind of mental illness. When he heard laughter, he thought it was weeping. When he smelled fragrances, he thought they were pungent. When he saw black, he said it was white. When he ate something bitter, he said it was sweet. When he did something wrong, he thought it was correct. It appeared that he was utterly confused and did everything contrary to what was expected. His father was worried about his son's problem and asked his friends for help. One man advised the father, There is a wise gentleman in the land of Lu who probably could help your son. Why not give it a try? The father gathered whatever money he had and, taking his son with him, made the long journey to the kingdom of Lu. On the road he met Lao Tzu and described his son's problem to the Taoist sage. Lao Tzu said to the father, how do you know that your son is mentally disturbed and confused? These days there are many people who are confused about right and wrong, true and false. There are even more people who are mentally disturbed by gain and loss. So your son is not the only person who has this problem. Anyhow, just because one person is confused doesn't mean the whole family is confused. If one family is confused, it should not affect the whole village. If an entire village is confused, it should not affect the whole country. If one country is confused, it does not mean the whole world will be turned upside down. If the whole world is confused, then who is there to tell anyone they are confused? Suppose everyone is like your son, and you are the only one who's different. Who is confused, then, you, or your son and the rest of the world? Who in the world can claim to be absolutely clear about right and wrong, black and white, true and false, and happiness and sorrow. I'm not even sure whether I am confused or not when I tell you these things. And those wise gentlemen of Lu are even more confused. So how can they clear up somebody else's confusion? I think you should save your money and take your son home. Chapter 33 The Man Who Got Upset Over Nothing There was a man who was born in the country of Yen, but grew up far away in the land of Chu. In his old age he had a longing for his homeland and decided to return there to live. As he journeyed toward his country of birth, he passed through the country of Qin. His companions on the road decided to play a trick on him. So one of them said, This is your hometown. The man became silent and thoughtful. Another friend pointed to a building and said, Look, over there is your neighborhood temple. The man sighed deeply. One companion led him to an abandoned house and said, Here's the home of your ancestors. The poor man broke down in tears. Another companion motioned him toward a group of tombstones and said, Your ancestors are buried here. The man began to weep loudly and bitterly. Seeing his distress, the friends decided the joke was over, so they told him they were just playing a trick on him. The homesick man was very embarrassed about his emotional outbursts, and kept quiet for the rest of the way. 
When he finally reached his hometown and saw his ancestral house and the family tombs, he did not feel as bad. Can we say the man got upset over nothing when his friends teased him? We cannot say his emotions were false, because he truly believed what his friends told him. Our emotions are the result of our beliefs. They have nothing to do with what is really out there. If we believe one thing, then certain emotions will follow. If we believe some other thing, we will experience different emotions. Understanding this, the homesick man realized his emotions depended on what he believed he saw, not what was really there. So, when he finally reached his homeland, he was less attached to his longing, and as a result his feelings were less stirred by his surroundings. You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you. Part 4 slash Confucius Chapter 34, True Happiness and Contentment Confucius had just retired from politics when Tsu Kung came visiting. As Tsu Kung entered, he saw his teacher looking sad and despondent. He had never seen Confucius behave like this before, so he left quietly and went to talk to his friend Yen Hui. Yen Hui was one of the most promising students of Confucius. He enjoyed a special relationship with his teacher and understood the teachings of his master more than any other student. When Yen Hui heard what Tsu Kung had said about their teacher, he did not say a word. Instead, he picked up his lute and started to play and sing as he walked to his teacher's home. When Confucius heard Yen Hui's singing, he was surprised. He stopped frowning and invited Yen Hui inside. Yen Hui was happy that his little act succeeded in cheering up his teacher, but Confucius greeted him with, Why are you so happy with yourself these days? Yen Hui did not respond directly to his teacher's question. Instead, he asked Confucius, Teacher, why are you so depressed these days? Confucius said, Let's hear your reasons for being happy first. So Yen Hui replied, You have taught me that to accept life, and be contented with the will of heaven is to be happy. I have kept those words in my mind and now I am always satisfied and happy. Confucius was taken aback by Yen Hui's answer. Did I really teach you that? I think you misunderstood me. Besides, that was a long time ago. Things are different now, and my understanding of happiness has changed. Confucius then looked at Yen Hui intently and continued, you only know that accepting life and being contented with the will of heaven is happiness. You do not know that sometimes it may bring sorrow. You think you are contented and happy if you are not attracted by fame and fortune or worried about life and death or disturbed by changes in your surroundings. My understanding of what it means to be happy and contented is not merely that. Let me tell you some of my experiences and maybe you will understand what it means to be truly happy and contented. When I was young, I pledged that one day I should offer my services to my country and help to make a better society. So I studied the classics, acquired skills in the martial arts, and cultivated myself with music and poetry. I had hoped I could lead others with my example, become an advisor to the lord of my country, and help people live a better life. But when I completed my studies, the situation changed. My country became weak and the court became corrupt. Politicans fought for power, and intrigues and betrayals became the norm. Nowadays, no one is interested in hearing about virtue and harmony anymore. In our society, people place more importance on business advantage than friendship. Relationships have become shallow, and everyone is bending to social and peer pressure to get approval or to get ahead. How naive I was in thinking I could turn things around. Now I know no one can change the government or society by studying the classics. But I have not found a way to solve the problems of the world, either. When you lose your ideals and vision, you will realize that simply accepting life does not necessarily make you happy. Yen Hui was dumbfounded by Confucius's confession. He had never heard his teacher talk about his life and his experiences. So he continued to listen attentively. Confucius said, to be truly happy and contented, you must let go of the idea of what it means to be happy or content. When you understand there is really nothing to be happy or sad about, then you will be truly contented. When you have reached this state of mind, 
then you will realize it does not matter whether or not music, poetry, or the classics are useful in changing society. In fact, whether or not you have an impact on society is not important. Yen Hui finally understood what his teacher meant. He bowed respectfully and left. Seeing that Yen Hui had returned home, Su Kung went to see his friend. When Yen Hui related what Confucius had told him, Su Kung was confused. He thought about his teacher's words and found that he was far from the state of mind Confucius had attained. Feeling frustrated and hopeless, he went home and locked himself in his house. For seven days he could not sleep. He lost his appetite and became thin and sallow. When Yen Hui saw Tzu Kung's condition, he patiently explained his master's teachings to Tzu Kung and encouraged him to have confidence in himself. With Yen Hui's help, Tzu Kung finally came around. From then on, Tzu Kung was not depressed anymore. Daily he went to study with Confucius and laughed and sang with the other students. Chapter 35 Seeing with Ears and Hearing with Eyes There was a diplomat from the country of Chn who visited an acquaintance when he was on official business in the kingdom of Lu. When the two men had exchanged greetings, the acquaintance Shusun said, We have a famous sage in our country. The man of Chn said, I take it you are referring to this man named Confucius? That's right. How do you know he is a sage? The man of Chn challenged. I have heard his student Yenhui say that his teacher can empty his mind and make his body intelligent. We have a sage in our country too. Have you heard of him? Who is it? He's a student of Lao Tzu and his name is Kong Sun Tzu. He has not only mastered all the teachings of Lao Tzu, but has surpassed his teacher in many ways. He can see with his ears and hear with his eyes. Shu Sun was stumped. He had never heard of someone with these abilities. He told his friends about Kong Sun Tzu, and soon everybody in the country of Lu talked about the sage who could hear with his eyes and see with his ears. The talk reached the Marquis of Lu, who was so astounded by this man's extraordinary abilities that he sent a personal invitation to ask Kong Sun Tzu to be his guest. When Kong Sun Tzu arrived, the Marquis humbly asked, I have heard that you can hear with your eyes and see with your ears. Is this true? Kong Sun Tzu replied amicably, That's all rumor. It's not true that I can make my ears see and my eyes hear. But I can see and hear without using my eyes or ears. The Marquis was even more impressed. This is more than what I expected. Can you tell me how you do it? Kong Sun Tzu then said, It is really quite simple. My body is in harmony with my mind, and my mind is in harmony with my energies. My energies follow my spirit, and my spirit is in tune with everything around it. Therefore, I can hear the faintest sound and see the slightest movement. Nothing escapes my awareness, whether it is far away or right in front of me. I do not know whether I perceive it with my senses, experience it with my body, or know it in my guts. Let's say it is just a natural feel for the way of things. The Marquis of Lu was very delighted with Kong Sun Tzu's answer, and went to tell Confucius about it. Confucius simply smiled and said nothing. Chapter 36 Who is a Sage? A minister of the kingdom of Shang came to visit Confucius. Never one to beat around the bush, the minister always asked questions in a blunt and straightforward way. So the moment he saw Confucius he asked, Are you a sage? Confucius replied, I do not dare to claim to be one. I'm only someone who has studied much and read widely. Then were the three kings sages? The three kings knew how to use their courage and intelligence. Whether they were sages I would not know. What about the five emperors? The five emperors knew how to rule with virtue. Were they sages? I do not know. How about the three lords? Were they sages? The three lords knew how to use the right people at the right time. It's not for me to say whether they were sages or not. The minister was beginning to get impatient. Then who do you think is a sage? Confucius would not be hurried, so he waited until the minister calmed down again and replied, 
Maybe far away in the West is a person who doesn't talk about the art of government, and yet his country is orderly and peaceful. He rarely speaks about promises, but he is trusted by all. He does not use force, so everything runs smoothly. His heart is open and his actions are spontaneous. His subjects don't even know what to call him. I suspect he is a sage, but that he is truly a sage I would not know. When the minister of Shang heard this, he was not pleased. He went away thinking to himself, it doesn't make sense. This fellow Confucius must be fooling me. Does it really matter if someone is recognized as a sage or not? If you are truly honest, sincere, and upright in everything you do, do you need others to acknowledge your virtues to make you virtuous? Chapter 37 What is Wisdom? One day TZUHSIA was chatting with Confucius. When they came to discussing the merits of each student, Susia asked his teacher, What do you think of Yenhui? Confucius replied, Yenhui is very kind and gentle. His compassion far surpasses mine. How about Su Kung? Su Kung is much better than I am when it comes to debating and presenting arguments. And what about Su Lu? Su Lu is a brave man. I cannot match him for courage. And Su Chang? Su Chang can hold his dignity better than I. Su Xia was so surprised by his teacher's answers that he stood up and exclaimed, How come they all want to learn from you? Confucius motioned his student to sit down. When he saw that Su Xia had calmed down, he said, Yen Hui is compassionate, but he is stubborn and inflexible. Su Kung can be very persuasive, but he does not know when to stop talking. Su Lu can be courageous, but does not know tolerance. Su Chang can be dignified, but does not know how to be harmonious with others. I would not exchange their merits for my own even if they offered. That's why they all come to learn from me. Wisdom is not competence in one skill or many skills. It is the ability to recognize strengths and weaknesses in ourselves and others. Thus, a wise teacher knows that although he may not surpass certain students in specific skills, he can give them what they need to become better individuals. Chapter 38 The Man with a Wooden Face After Liehtzu had completed his studies with the immortal Old Shang and his friend the sage Pahan, he settled in the southern part of town. Not long afterward, he was besieged by visitors and hopeful students. Sometimes Li Tzu's house was crowded with hundreds of people. Li Tzu welcomed their company and enjoyed talking with them all day. Next door to Li Tzu lived a man by the name of Nanquit Tzu. In the twenty years that they were neighbors, Li Tzu and this man had never greeted each other. If they passed each other on the road, Nanquit Tzu would walk by as if Li Tzu were not there. Li Tzu's friends figured the two men must be enemies. When someone asked Li Tzu about his neighbor, Li Tzu said, Nanquit Tzu's face is full, but his mind is empty. He hears nothing, so he is not distracted by what's happening around him. He sees nothing, so he is not attracted to things around him. He says nothing, so he never argues with others. His mind is still, so nothing bothers him. His body is not aroused, so he is like a blank wall. Somebody like him would not want to be bothered by anyone or anything, so there's no point in trying to reach him. Nonetheless, Li Tzu decided to visit his neighbor. A large group of friends and students followed as Li Tzu went into Nanquit Tzu's house. Entering, they saw Nanquit Tzu sitting there like a clay figure. His face was as expressionless as a block of wood. His eyes were blank and his body was motionless. Indeed, he was not someone they could talk to. Even Li Tzu had no way of getting through to Nanquit Tzu. While everyone was standing there not knowing what to do, suddenly Nanquit Tzu looked at the students who were standing at the back and said, You are all arrogant and competitive. The crowd was startled. When they all returned to Li Tzu's house, they asked, What went on? Li Tzu replied, If you can see intention, then you need not use speech to communicate. The sage does not need to talk to people to understand their intent. Moreover, they do not need to use words to communicate their own intent. This is called saying nothing. The enlightened person can also sense the truth without going through deduction or reasoning. 
This is called knowing nothing and yet knowing all. Nankwitsu appears as if he does not see, does not hear, and does not know. However, he sees all, hears all, and knows all. For him, there is no separation between seeing and not seeing, hearing and not hearing, acting and not acting, and knowing and not knowing. True communication does not always require speech or action. Enlightened persons communicate through the spirit and do not need to convey their intentions through sound and movement. Consequently, the way they communicate is more effective than that of the ordinary person. Chapter 39, The Art of Traveling and Sightseeing Li Tzu used to love to travel and see the sights. When his teacher Hu Tzu asked him what he found so enjoyable about traveling, Li Tzu said, while other people travel to see the beauty of sights and surroundings, I enjoy seeing the way things change. To other sightseers, it may seem that I am like them, but the difference between us is that they see things whereas I see changes. Hu Tzu said, you think you are different from other travelers, but actually you are not. Although they are amused by sights and sounds, and you are fascinated by things that always change, you are both occupied with what is out there rather than what you experience inside. People who are attracted to the external world are always looking for something new and wonderful that will satisfy their senses. However, only people who look into themselves will find true satisfaction. After this conversation, Li Tzu stopped traveling because he thought he had thoroughly misunderstood what it means to travel. Seeing this, Hu Tzu said to him, Travel is such a wonderful experience. Especially when you forget you are traveling. Then you will enjoy whatever you see and do. Those who look into themselves when they travel will not think about what they see. In fact, there is no distinction between the viewer and the scene. You experience everything with the totality of yourself, so that every blade of grass, every mountain, every lake is alive and is a part of you. When there is no division between you and what is other, this is the ultimate experience of traveling. Chapter 40 Lung Shu's Strange Illness one day Lung Shu was chatting with his friend who claimed he was especially adept at curing strange illnesses. Lung Shu found this hard to believe, so he challenged his friend, I have a strange illness. If you can cure me, then I'll agree that you're the best doctor around. His friend did not seem flustered. Tell me about your illness, he said. Now listen carefully, said Lung Shu. This is my illness. When I am praised by others, I do not feel pride. When others speak badly about me, I do not feel disgraced. When I gain something, I am not happy. When I lose, I am not sad. Life and death, riches and poverty, fortune and misfortune are the same to me. As a matter of fact, I can see people as pigs and see myself as other people. When I'm at home, I feel I am wandering around. When I'm in my country, I feel like I am among foreigners. Since I got this strange illness, I have lost all interest in becoming rich and famous. I don't care about titles, land, and renown. I don't think much about rules and regulations. The rise and fall of government and politicians are not my concern, and I am not affected by the emotions of people around me. Because of my illness I can no longer serve my country, manage my business, or become the head of my family. How are you able to help me? The doctor told Lung Shu to stand with his back to the sun. Facing the light, he examined Lung Shu from a distance and looked him up and down carefully. Presently he said, Ah, I can see that your heart is empty and you are close to being a sage. Six out of seven cavities in your heart are completely open. However, one of them is still shut. This blockage is probably the cause of your illness. If indeed your illness is seeing wisdom as a strange disease, then my skills are inadequate to cure you. Lung Shu had gotten rid of all his attachments except one. He still retained a conception of what it means to be enlightened. Comparing enlightenment to a strange illness, Lung Shu made it mysterious, extraordinary, and unnatural. Enlightenment is a very normal experience, attainable by everyone. Therefore, there is nothing mysterious or secretive about it. There is nothing unnatural about it, either, because it follows the natural way of things. Chapter 41 Responding Naturally When one of Yang Chu's friends died, 
Yang Chu went to the funeral laughing and singing and showed no signs of mourning. When another of his friends died, Yang Xu hugged the dead man and wept bitterly. Ordinarily, people are happy about birth and sad about death. Why did Yang Chu laugh at the death of one person and cry at the death of another? Yang Chu found nothing sad about the man who died after living his life to the fullest. In fact, he felt happy for the friend who left this world as a contented man. However, Yang Chu was sad about his other friend's death because he felt this man died before his time. In both cases Yang Chu was simply responding naturally to the circumstances. Chapter 42 There are some things you just can't fight. And I that is about to lose its sight tends to be extremely sharp in making out details. An ear that is about to become deaf tends to be very acute in its hearing. A tongue that is about to lose its sensitivity can make out the differences between water from two sources. A nose that is about to lose its ability is most sensitive to fragrances. It is as if the senses are fighting to maintain their usefulness. However, no matter how hard they fight, they will eventually lose their effectiveness. It is the same with people. People who are beginning to weaken will push their bodies to the limit. People who are about to lose their minds will become unusually argumentative. This is because they are not willing to admit that all things must end and they want to make a show of their strength to cover their weakness. On the other hand, enlightened persons accept the natural course of things. They do not force their bodies to display strength or their minds to show cleverness. Knowing that there are some things that they can't fight, they accept what comes. That is why they can embrace life and accept death. Chapter 43 Who is Supporting Whom? In the part of town where Li Tzu lived and taught, there were many philosophers of high virtue. In another part of town, the eastern quarter, there lived many skilled civil servants and politicians. One day when Pai Feng, a student of Li Tzu, was walking through the eastern quarter, he ran into Ting Shi, a legislator and a respected official. Ting Shi and his students were always talking about how to solve the political problems of the day. The philosophers, on the other hand, seldom discussed politics. When Ting Shi saw Pai Feng, he turned to his students and said, Watch me make that fellow dance around in circles. His students encouraged him on. Ting Shi approached Pai Feng and said, Do you know the difference between supporting yourself and being supported by others? I bet you don't. Let me tell you. People who are always supported by others and never make an effort to support themselves are no better than dogs or pigs. In this world, only those who contribute can hope to receive benefits from society. Those who sit around and wait for the kitchen to hand out food are just like domestic animals and livestock. Pai Feng did not answer, but one of his followers stepped forward and said to Ting Shi, Your Honor, have you heard that in the countries of Qi and Lu there are many people with special skills? Some are experts in carpentry and ceramics. Some are excellent metal workers. Some are talented musicians and artists. Some are good at military strategy, and some are great fighters. Some are knowledgeable in religious ceremonies and rituals, and others are skillful in divination and magic. Despite their expertise in their own areas, none of these people are good administrators. They can do their own tasks, but cannot tell others to do theirs. Fortunately, there are some people with no special skills at all who could be employed as bureaucrats. So we have the following situation. Those who are skilled are employed by those who are not skilled, and you administrators and bureaucrats are employed by citizens like us. Now, who is supporting whom? Ting Shi did not know what to say. Sheepishly, he turned toward his students and walked away. Chapter 44 What is Strength? The Earl of the State of Kung Yi was reputed to be a very strong man. A certain duke was impressed with this man's strength and spoke highly of him before the king. The king was eager to meet the earl, so he sent a large gift and invited the earl to give a demonstration of his strength at the court. When the earl of Kungi arrived, the king was shocked. The man who stood before him was not a heavy, muscular man, but a thin and lanky fellow. The king was beginning to have doubts about this man's ability, so he frowned and said, Really, how strong are you? 
The Earl replied, I am strong enough to break the legs of a grasshopper and snap the wings of an insect. When the king heard this, he was annoyed no end. Either this man was a fraud or he was trying to pass off a witty remark. Irritated, the king said loudly, the strong man in my service can rip the hide of a rhinoceros and drag nine oxen around by their tails, and yet I am not satisfied with their strength. How come you are so famous for your strength when you can only break the wings and legs of insects? The Earl of Kungi sighed and said, My lord, this is an excellent question. Let me explain. My teacher Old Shang was the strongest man in the world, yet his family knew nothing about it. He never showed his strength because he never had to use it. When I saw this, I swore I would spend the rest of my life learning from him. This is what he told me. Most people like to see what they have never seen before or do what has never been done before. They want to start tackling challenging conditions right away and do not have the patience to learn from scratch. However, I say if you want to train your powers of seeing, you should start out by scrutinizing a stack of firewood. If you want to sharpen your sense of hearing, you should start out by listening to the sound of bells. In this way, you will build your abilities gradually and not encounter a lot of obstacles while you learn. Once you have acquired the abilities, no condition will appear difficult. And if the conditions are not difficult, why would you need to call on your abilities to deal with them? The Earl continued, If my reputation for strength is known around the country, then I have not followed my master's teachings well. However, I am not famous for my strength because I boast about what I can do, but because of the way I use it. The king was finally satisfied with the earl's explanation. In strength, the Earl of Kungi had not reached the level of mastery that his teacher Old Shang had. While the earl did not boast about his ability, he still needed to use it. Old Shang, however, had reached the point where there was nothing out there that proved difficult enough for him to need to call on his strength so he never needed to use it. Chapter 45 The Strange Arguments of Kung Sun Lung Prince Mou was one of the most intelligent sons in the royal family of Wei. He was always in the company of philosophers and scholars, listening to their lectures and debates. Not interested in politics and government, Prince Mao spent much of his time with the sophist Kung Sun Lung and enjoyed hearing what this witty philosopher had to say about everything in the world. A prominent scholar made fun of Prince Mao's friendship with Kung Sun Lung. When the prince heard about it, he asked the scholar, What's so funny about my being friends with Kung Sun Lung? The scholar said, Everybody knows that Kung Sun Lung is strange. He has no respect for anyone or anything. He has a sharp tongue and does not know when to hold it. His views are eccentric and extreme, and he does not follow any known school of teaching. He likes to use his wit and verbal finesse to confuse others and win arguments. Although he can argue successfully that white is black and straight is crooked, you walk away with the feeling that he's won the argument not because he is correct, but because you can't outweed him. I find him to be a most shallow and conceited man. I laugh at you because you are a fool to treat him with such respect. Prince Mao was not happy with this evaluation of his friend. Why do you see Kung Sun Lung this way? Can you show me instances where he is as you said? Sure. First, look at what Kung Sun Lung said to the grandson of Confucius. He said, There is an archer who can fire arrows in such a way that the tip of the second arrow touches the notch of the first one, and the tip of the third arrow touches the notch of second. Thus, when the point of the first arrow is lodged in the target, the third arrow is still notched in the bowstring. As a result, instead of three arrows there is only one long arrow, of which the tip is in the target, and the notch is still in the bowstring. When the Confucianist was awestruck by this feat of archery, Kung Sun Lung then said, This is nothing. Have you heard of the student of the great archer Peng who was angry with his wife, and decided to teach her a lesson by frightening her? He took a famous bow, fitted it with the best crafted arrow, and shot at her eye. Strange it may sound, but when the arrow touched the surface of the eye, it fell to the ground. The whole thing happened so fast that his wife did not even have time to blink. Now that's what I call mastery in archery. Wouldn't you say this is ridiculous? Prince Mao calmly replied, 
the words of a wise man are not easily understood by a fool. The three arrows can line up one behind another making a long arrow, because the archer knows the precise moment to let go of each arrow. Moreover, an archer can make an arrow stop right in front of someone's eye if he knows how to deploy his strength in such a way that the arrow loses its momentum when it has covered a certain distance. I find both cases very believable. There's nothing ridiculous about what Kung Sun Lung said. In fact, these instances tell me that Kung Sun Lung has a deep understanding of the art of archery. The scholar was not happy with Prince Mao's rebuttal, so he said, you are Kung Sun Lung's student and friend. Of course you will defend him and ignore his faults. Let me tell you more outrageous things about the man. This time you are not going to find it easy to defend him. Once Kung Sun Lung said to the King of Wei, A person with a mind cannot know. If you can point to it, then you cannot reach it. You can never finish dividing something. A shadow cannot move. A single hair can hold up a thousand stones. A white horse is not a horse. An orphaned calf has never had a mother. You see, there's no end to Kung Sun Lung's perversion of reason. Prince Mao was not at all bothered by these allegations. Calmly he said, you think these statements are outrageous only because you cannot understand them. The problem is in you, not Kung Sun Lung. He continued, let me explain the meaning of these statements. First, a person with a mind is bound to be filled with conceptions. These conceptions prevent him from knowing things directly, so a person with a mind shall never really know. Second, phenomena in the world are so fleeting that the moment you point to them they are gone. Third, division and differentiation are the processes by which things are created. Since things are emerging and dissolving all the time, you cannot specify the point when this division will stop. Fourth, a shadow is in an effect, not a cause. Therefore, by itself, it cannot move. Only when a cause is present is there an effect. Fifth, a single hair can hold up a thousand stones if you understand the principle of balance. Moreover, Kung Sun Lung's famous statement a white horse is not a horse cautions us not to confuse an object with its qualities. Finally, an orphan calf was not an orphan when it had a mother. In the same way, a cow cannot give birth to an orphan calf, because it must be alive to give birth. As you can see, Kung Sun Lung's statements are far from being empty and outrageous. They are words of wisdom designed to awaken us from ignorance. The scholar had nothing more to say and left. The words of the wise are difficult to accept not because they cannot be understood, but because people do not want to understand them. Kung Sun Lung was an extraordinary man. His perception and understanding of things were way beyond his time. That is why his contemporaries dismissed his teachings as wild and eccentric. Only Prince Mao understood his wisdom. But Prince Mao was a very wise man himself. Chapter 46 Knowing When to Withdraw When the Emperor Yao had ruled for fifty years, he was unsure whether his empire was in order and whether his subjects accepted him as their ruler. He asked his ministers in the court, but they did not know. He asked the officials in the outlying provinces, they could not tell him. He asked the wise people of the land, but they were unable to help him. Under these circumstances, Yao had no choice but to disguise himself as a commoner and travel around in his kingdom. One day, as he neared a provincial town, he heard a group of children singing. As he got closer, he made out these words. You fed us and clothed us. Your laws are our laws. Without knowing it, we follow the way of heaven. Yao was delighted when he heard this. He asked the children, where did you learn this song? We heard it from an official, they replied. How did you come by this verse? Yao asked the official. I believe it's from an old poem. Yao returned to his court, summoned his successor Shun, told him what he had seen and heard, and then abdicated. Shun accepted the kingship without question. When the sage Wen Su heard about this, he said, someone who knows how to withdraw when his work is finished is one who understands the way of heaven. 
He has no quarrels with the world, and whatever he does follows the natural order of things. There are things that go against the natural way, but the natural way does not go against the order of things. Therefore, the enlightened person does not need eyes to see the way. This is because the way cannot be grasped with your senses and thoughts. Look for it in front, and it will sneak behind you. Seek it with good intentions, and it is everywhere. If you are insincere, it will never reveal itself. It is something that you cannot use your intellect to attain, but if you are not serious, it will also escape you. Only in naturalness can the way be attained. And after you have attained it, only in naturalness can it be kept. Knowing the truth of things and yet not clutching to the truth, knowing how to act and not using effort to do it, is the mark of a sage. If you pretend to know or not to know, pretend to do or not to do, you are just like a pile of dirt. It sits there doing nothing, but it is also worth nothing. Abdication and retirement are not things that can be forced. Only those who are in tune with the natural way of things know when and how to withdraw. When Yao saw that his country was in order and that there was nothing he could do to make things better, he knew it was time to withdraw. And Shun, who also understood the way of heaven, accepted his responsibilities without hesitation. You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you. Part 5 The Questions of Tang Chapter 47 Where Do Things Come From? The Emperor Tang asked a sage, Have things always been there from the ancient beginning? The sage replied, If things were not there in the beginning, how can they be here now? What do you think of people in the future who ask if there are things now? In this case, would you say there is no such thing as before or after? It is difficult to say when things begin or when they end. The start of one thing may be the end of another. From the ancient beginnings to our time, things continuously come and go. There is no way of knowing what came first. Then is there a limit to the universe? I don't know. The Emperor Tang pressed further. There's got to be a boundary somewhere. The sage then said, nothingness is limitless. How do I know where its boundaries are? How do we know that beyond this universe there is not another universe? I can only say that things are limitless, but I cannot tell you if there are any boundaries. Chapter 48 The Man Who Tried to Move the Mountains In a valley surrounded by two high mountains lived an old man. He was nicknamed the Old Fool by his neighbors because he was always thinking up impossible projects. One day, the old fool got tired of having to take a long and roundabout hike to get out of his valley. He called his family together and presented them with the proposal that they remove the mountains that blocked their way. His son and grandson were very excited about the idea and wanted to start the project right away. The old man's wife, however, was not enthusiastic. She shook her head and said to her husband, you are ninety years old. You don't even have the strength to remove a small mound of dirt. How can you level two high mountains? Aren't you a bit too ambitious? Anyhow, where would you place the dirt after you've taken down the mountains? The old man was not discouraged. We can dump the rocks into the sea, he said. His son and grandson agreed. The next day, the old fool, with his son and grandson, took shovels and picks and headed for the mountains. On their way, they were joined by a seven-year-old boy from a neighboring family. The four of them worked from sunrise to sunset and did not return home to rest until the winter came. A wise man in the village who had heard about the old fool's attempt at leveling the mountains came to talk the old man out of his foolish project. He said, at your age you should be wise enough to know that your project is impractical. You are old and weak. You can't even pull up the weeds in your garden. What makes you think you can move a mountain? The old fool sighed and said, Your mind is as set as a rock. Even a seven-year-old child is smarter than you are. Can't you see that if I don't finish the project, my son and grandson will continue with it? And if they can't finish moving the mountain, their sons and grandsons will continue, and so on. The mountain, on the other hand, does not grow. So if each generation keeps chipping away, then one day the mountain will be leveled. 
The wise man couldn't argue with the old fool's logic, so he left. Time went on, and the old fool and his children kept on digging away at the mountain. While everyone laughed at his impossible project, the spirits of the mountain became concerned. They saw that the old fool was determined, and there was no question that the mountain was going to be leveled, even if it would be sometime in the distant future. Alarmed, they went to the lords of heaven and reported their concern. The deities were both curious and amused by the old fool's attempt at moving the mountains, but when they saw his patience and determination, they decided to help him. One night they sent two giants to carry the mountain off, one to the east and one to the south. The next morning, when the people looked out from their windows, the mountains that had blocked their way were miraculously gone. Chapter 49 The Man Who Tried to Chase Down the Sun There was a man who prided himself in being a great runner. One day he decided to compete with the sun's journey across the sky, so he chased the sun to the brink of twilight. By then he was extremely thirsty. He hunted for water and found the Yellow River and the Way River. After he had drunk the waters dry, he was still thirsty, so he headed for a great marsh up north. Before he could reach it, he died of thirst and fell to the ground. The staff he had carried soaked up the flesh of his decaying body and became a great forest. People who are proud of their abilities tend to want to push them to the limit. If you push yourself to the limit, then you will try to compete with everything. And if you compete with everything, then one day, like the man who chased the sun, you will lose. Chapter 50 The North Country Why the Shaman King said, Within heaven and earth and the four directions, inside the four seas, everything is lit by the sun and moon, circled by the stars in the sky, regulated by the four seasons, and ruled by the star of the year. Things that come from the great spirit differ in shape and size. Some live out long lives and some die accidentally. Only the enlightened ones understand the natural way of things and see their place in the universe. The sage Siachi said, There are things that do not require the great spirit to make them, and yet they exist. They do not require the energies of Yin and Yang to nourish them, nor the sun and moon to light them. They do not need protection to live a long life, nor do they die accidental deaths. They keep warm without clothing, they are filled without needing grains, and they can travel without boats or vehicles. This is the natural way of things. Later on, when he was helping to fight the great flood, he lost his way and stumbled into a country far up north. When he asked the inhabitants where he was, they told him he was in the north country, thousands of miles from his home. You soon found that there were a lot of unusual things in this country. The people had no idea of where the boundaries of the country lay. Where they lived there were no storms or snow, no wild animals, and no forests. They lived on a great plain with miles of grassland. In the middle of the plain was a mountain shaped like a jug. On top of the mountain was a spring. The waters of the spring were sweet and fragrant, and they flowed down the mountainside in four clear and sparkling streams. The streams carried the waters all over the land. They regulated the climate and neutralized poisonous gas. The people were gentle and friendly. Their bodies were soft, their hearts were open, and their minds were clear. Everybody lived together in harmony. There were no quarrels, no jealousies, and no pride. The old lived with the young. There were no politicians or leaders. Men and women mingled freely, and there were no social conventions such as courting or marriage. Everyone lived by the water. There was no need to cultivate crops or weave cloth for clothing. The people died naturally after living out a hundred years. No one died of illness or disease, and no one was killed accidentally. The people lived in happiness and contentment and did not know anxiety, sorrow, decay, death, or pain. The people there also loved music and song. They danced and sang all day. When they were tired or when they got hungry, all they needed was to drink the sweet waters of the magic spring, and they would be filled with energy again. If they drank too much, they would sleep for ten days. If they bathed in the waters, their bodies would renew their vigor and carry the fragrance of the waters for many days. When the Emperor Mao of Chou went on his spirit journey, he visited this north country 
and stayed there for three years. After he returned home, he thought about this country often, and was so occupied with his thoughts that he could neither eat nor sleep. This country was so unusual that Quan Cheng, the advisor to the King of Qi, encouraged his lord to visit it. The two men were about to set out for this fabled land when another minister counseled the king and said, My lord, why travel to a foreign land when you have everything in your own country? Look around the kingdom of Qi. Our mountains and rivers are beautiful, our plains are wide, and our people are happy. Our land yields bountiful harvests, and we do not lack anything. Your court is filled with splendor, your ministers are loyal, your soldiers strong, and your subjects are cultured. Everything you could ever want is back here at home. Why do you want to travel to lands that are on the borders of our civilization? Quan Cheng must be fantasizing again. When the king reported this to Quan Qing, the advisor simply replied, This is not something that our friend will understand. I'm afraid if we do not keep the search for the North Country alive, we shall never find it. As for the prosperity of our country, why be so attached to what we have? As for our friend's words, do you really think they carry good advice? Chapter 51 Strange Customs in Strange Countries In the southern kingdoms, people wear their hair short and go naked. In the northern kingdoms, people wrap turbans around their heads and wear furs. In the central lands, they wear hats and skirts. People of the Middle Kingdom know how to make the best use of the resources from the land. There are farmers, traders, hunters, and fishermen. Therefore, the people of the central lands are well fed and well clothed. In winter they have furs to keep them warm, and in summer they wear cotton to keep themselves cool. They travel by boats and cars, and they do not need to exert a lot of effort to get what they want. In a land far to the south and east is a country where it is customary for people to kill their firstborn and offer its flesh and blood to everyone in the community to eat. They say this will bring fertility to the women. Moreover, when a father dies, the children tie their mother on the dead man's back and abandon both of them in the wilderness. They claim it is not proper to live with the wife of a ghost. When a relative or family member dies, the children demonstrate their filial duties by cutting off the dead man's skin before they bury his bones. In a land far south is a country where children are said to be filial only if they burn the bodies of their dead parents. When the smoke rises from the pyre, it is said that the soul of the dead has risen into the sky. All these customs are established traditions in the countries where they are practiced. They are observed by all the people, and there is nothing strange about them. We call them barbaric and are shocked by them only because we have different customs. Chapter 52 The Questions of a Child Once, when Confucius was walking through a marketplace, he saw two children, who looked like they were arguing heatedly over something. Confucius got curious and went over to ask them what their contention was. One child said, I say the sun is nearer us when it is rising and gets farther away at midday. The other child immediately said, I say the sun is farther away when it is rising and nearer us at midday. The one who spoke first then said, The sun looks bigger when it is at the horizon and gets smaller as it reaches noon. Don't things look smaller when they are far away and bigger when they are near? The second child was not daunted. He said, the sun is hotter at noon than when it rises in the morning. Isn't something hotter when it is near and cooler when it is farther away? Both children then pestered Confucius to answer their questions. Confucius was stumped. He told them he couldn't tell which of them was correct. The children laughed and said, Hey, you're supposed to be a learned man, and you can't even answer our questions. Chapter 53 The Art of Fishing Many things in this world depend on balance. For example, a single hair can hang a weight if the balance is right. The hair only breaks if the balance is off. Most people do not understand this principle of balance, but here is an example of someone who did. In the country of Chu there lived a man who was fond of fishing. He made his fishing line out of silk, his hook out of the shell of a wheat grain, and his rod out of a slender strip of bamboo. For his bait he used half a grain of rice. One of his favorite fishing spots was a stretch of deep waters in a fast-flowing river. 
There he would cast his bait, and would always return with a fish as large as his cart. And to top it all off, his line did not snap, his rod did not bend, and his hook did not break. The king of Chu was very curious about the way this man caught fish. He invited the fisherman to his court and asked, How is it that you can catch such a big fish with that strange assortment of gear? The fisherman replied, I have heard the sages of old talk about an archer, who used a bow made of a very weak strip of wood, and a bowstring made of a thin string of cotton to shoot down two birds with one arrow. He could do this because his attention was focused, and he understood the balance of give and pull. I admired his feet and decided to use him as an example to perfect my skill in fishing. From that time on, I put aside everything and spent all my time learning the art of fishing. Finally, after five years, I could cast my line undistracted. When I sit by the river, my mind is totally concentrated on fishing and nothing else. I have a good feel for the give and pull of the line so the fish are not even aware when the hook and bait enter the water. To them, the bait is no different from a grain of sand or a bubble, and they swallow it without suspecting. This is the principle of using the soft to win over the strong, and the light to hold the heavy. My lord, if you can rule your country this way, then everything in the world will be at your fingertips. Isn't that more effective than using force? The king was very impressed with the fisherman's advice. Chapter 54 Exchanging Hearts and Minds Two men who fell ill went to see the same doctor. The doctor cured both of them, but before they left, he said, you were both suffering from a disease that attacked your internal organs. That's something quite common and could be taken care of by acupuncture and herbs. However, there is a virus that is attacking you which affects your hearts and minds. Do you want me to cure this illness for you? The two men said, let's hear about it first. The doctor then said to one man, You have strong ambitions, but your willpower is weak. Although you are good at planning, you can seldom see the plans through. Turning to the other man, the doctor said, You, on the other hand, are the opposite. Your ambitions are weak, but your willpower is strong. Therefore, you get into trouble by doing things recklessly without thinking them through. Then, to both of them, he said, If the two of you can exchange your hearts and minds, then you'd both be perfect. Now, do you want me to do that for you? Both his patients agreed. The doctor gave them a drug that made them unconscious for several days. Then, carefully, he removed their hearts, exchanged them, and applied a magical herb so that when both men woke up there were no physical signs of the surgery. As the men walked home they were delighted, but the moment they stepped in their houses, trouble began. The first man had gone to the second man's home, and was not recognized by the wife and children. The second man had gone to the first man's home, and the same thing happened. Both families were angry and frustrated. They went to the law courts to settle the matter, and only accepted the circumstances, when the doctor explained the whole situation to them. No one is born perfect, and even if science or technology can do wonders, solving one problem will create another. Therefore, it is better to accept who we are and not want to be someone else, for each person has his value. Chapter 55 Musician When Learns to Play the Lute A long time ago there was a musician who could charm birds and fish into dancing with his music. A lute player named Wen from the kingdom of Qing heard the story and wanted to acquire the skill. So he left his family and went to study with the master musician Qiang. For a long time one could not play anything. His fingers were tied up in knots, and every time he picked up the lute he could not bring himself to play. After three years he had learned nothing. You might as well go home, his teacher said. When put down his lute, signed and said, It's not that I haven't learned any songs, or that I can't tune my instrument properly. I cannot play from my heart, so the music has never become a part of me. That's why I can't bring myself to play. Let me rest a bit and see what happens. No long afterward, when returned to his teacher. How are you getting along with your music? His teacher asked. I think I've experienced a breakthrough. Let me show you. When took the lute and gently touched the string called Autumn. 
Although it was springtime, a cool wind blew, the leaves crackled in the autumn breeze, and the sky was bright and cloudless. Then in autumn he touched the string called spring, and a gentle wind came. Warm rains fell and the flowers bloomed. In the middle of summer, wind touched the string called winter, and suddenly the snow fell, and the rivers froze. When winter came, he touched the string called summer. Immediately the sun shone fiercely, the snow disappeared, and the ice melted from the rivers. Finally, when he touched the last string and played all of them together, a refreshing wind blew, azure clouds floated overhead, sweet dew fell, and fragrant springs bubbled up from the ground. The master musician Xiang clapped his chest and exclaimed, Your music far surpasses what words can describe. The greatest players will have to learn from you now. Wen was already an accomplished musician by the time he went to study with Xiang, but he realized that perfection in technique alone does not make great music. When he was finally able to dissolve the duality between himself and the music, the songs he played not only had the power to create moods, but literally changed reality. Chapter 56 When Honor Sang There was a musician who apprenticed himself to a master singer, but before he had finished his training he decided he had already mastered all the skills his teacher could offer. Confident, he asked to be graduated so he could return home. His teacher did not contest this request, and on the appointed day he threw a feast for the graduate after the ceremony. When everyone was seated around the table, the master singer began a sad song, beating the rhythm with a small drum. His voice shook the leaves on the trees and stilled the flying clouds. The brash young student now realized how pretentious he was in thinking he had learned everything from his teacher. Quickly he apologized and asked to be accepted again. I shall stay as your student for the rest of my life, he said to his teacher. The master singer then told a story for everyone to hear. He said, Once there was a woman called Honor who ran out of money while she was traveling to the eastern country of Chi. She had no choice but to sing at a local tavern to earn her supper. After she had left, the sound of her voice reverberated in the room for three days, and people thought she was still around. Later, Honor stayed at an inn where the owner ridiculed her foreign manners. This made Honor homesick, and she burst into a song of sadness and longing. Her voice traveled through the town and sent everyone into tears. The people of the town were so affected by the sadness of the song that they could not eat for three days. They sent someone after Honor and invited her back. Honor let out a long note and then sang a song of joy. Soon the townspeople started dancing and laughing and forgot they had been sad just before. Honor stayed with these people for a while, and when she left, the town sent her off with many rich gifts. To this day, the people of that town are famous for their singing, because they picked up some of Honora's art while she lived there. Chapter 57 Kindred Spirits Poya and Chung Tzuchi were good friends. Pia was a good lute player and his friend was an intuitive listener. When Pia had his mind on the high mountains while he played, Chung Tzuchi said, I can feel the grandeur of the great mountains. When Pia thought about flowing waters while he played, his friend said, how deep and wide are the Yellow River and the Yangzhou. It seemed no matter what was on Pia's mind which he expressed in his music, his friends shared the feelings right away. One time the two friends were wandering around in the north slopes of the Great Mountains when a rainstorm hit. They found shelter in a cave and, waiting for the rains to subside, Pia took up his lute and played. Seeing the mist and rain hiding the mountains, Pia had a feeling of sadness and composed a piece about the unending rain and rising mist. Then he changed his mood and improvised a song that painted the splendor of an avalanche crashing down the mountains. In every piece he played, Chung Tzu Chi could grasp Pia's feel of the music without fail. His mood and state of mind were identical to those of the player. Pia put down his lute and sighed, This is more than my wildest expectations. You can read my mind by listening to my music. From now on, how can I hide anything from you? Paiya and Chung Tzu Chi were not only good friends, but kindred spirits. They could reach into each other's minds not just because one of them was a good player and the other an intuitive listener. 
it was because they had dissolved the barriers that separated them from each other, and the music was simply a bridge that allowed them to communicate their hearts and minds. Chapter 58 Artificial or Real? King M.U. of C.H.O.U. was touring the western region of his country. He went as far as the Kuanluan Mountains before he turned back. On the way home, his officers introduced to him a man who was reputed to be a very skilled craftsman. The king received the craftsman in his tent and said, Tell me about your skills. The man replied, I can make anything you want, but let me show you something I've already completed. Good, said King Mu. Bring it the next time you come. Two days later the craftsman asked to see the king again. The king saw that the craftsman had brought someone with him, so he asked, Who is this man you've brought with you? He is my creation, the craftsman said proudly. He can talk, he can sing, and he can dance. The king was both fascinated and amazed. The figure before him was walking around briskly and certainly had all the features of a human. The craftsman pressed the cheeks of his companion, and immediately the figure started singing. When he squeezed its hand, it started to dance to the rhythm of the song. Then the craftsman had his creation do all kinds of tricks, which the king enjoyed immensely. The movements and mannerisms of the figure were so real that the king thought it was a real person. The king arranged to have this very talented man give a show, and invited his favorite courtesan and other female attendants to attend. When the show was about to end, the artificial man made suggestive glances at the women who sat around the king. King Mu saw this and was outraged. He summoned the craftsman and shouted at him angrily, How dare you lie to me that you've created this man? He had the nerve to flirt with my courtesans. I shall have you executed for this. Terrified, the craftsman immediately went over to the artificial man and ripped open its body. He disassembled its head, arms, and legs and showed the pieces to the king. The king examined them and found they were made of wood and hide held together by strings and glue. The craftsman then emptied the insides of the robot, and the king saw that although the internal organs looked real, they too were made of inert materials and painted with the appropriate colors. Teeth, bones, muscles, tendons, joints, skin, and hair were all artificial. However, when these parts were all assembled, he saw a lifelike person. The king was even more curious now. He re-examined the robot and experimented with taking out its heart. When the heart was removed, the robot lost its speech. Next the king removed the liver, and the robot lost its sight. When he took out the kidneys, it couldn't walk. The king was finally satisfied. He sighed and said, could it be possible that human skill can produce something that can match what is created by heaven and earth? The king had the robot loaded onto a cart and invited the craftsman to return with him to the capital. People used to regard Kung Shu Pan's ladder that reached to the clouds and Emotsu's flying machine as crafts of great skill. But when the news of the artificial man spread, these two talented craftsmen dared not boast about their inventions anymore. Looking back at King Mu's robot, can we really say it is artificial? The robot was made of materials found in nature, leather, bark, and hemp. Humans are also made of the same stuff as nature, for all things emerged from the gathering of yin and yang vapors and owe their existence to the primordial breath of the Tao. Whether something is real or artificial depends on how we view the materials from which it is made. If this is the case, then as real persons, what makes us more privileged than other things in creation? Chapter 59 Learning the Art of Archery Fei Wei learned archery from one of the greatest archers. It was said that when his master drew his bow, the animals would lie still on the ground and birds would drop from the sky. Fei Wei learned everything his master could teach him and eventually surpassed the older man in skill. A man named Qi Siechang heard about Fei Wei's mastery of the bow and begged to become his apprentice. He hoped that one day he too would be able to best his teacher in his skill. Fei Wei told the prospective student, First you need to train your eye not to blink under any circumstances. Come back when you have accomplished this. Qi Siechang put these words in his mind and returned home. 
Day after day he lay underneath his wife's loom with his eyes next to the needles that went up and down when her foot pressed the pedal. After three years he had trained himself not to blink even when the needles came close to piercing his eyeball. Excited about his success, Chi Siechong ran to Fei Wei and reported his progress. Fei Wei only said, you have just started to learn. The next thing you need to do is to train your eye to look at small objects until they appear large, and fuzzy objects until they appear clear. Go back and practice. When you have succeeded in doing this, you can come and see me. Chi Siechong went home again and began his next phase of training. He caught a flea and hung it from a window that faced south. Every day he stared at the flea with the sun shining into his eyes. Ten days later, the flea appeared to grow in size. Three years later, the flea looked as big as a wheel on a cart. By then, when Chi Siechong looked at other things in the same way, he saw hills and mountains. Taking a bow made from the horn of an animal of yen, and an arrow made from wild grass from the north, Chi Siechong took aim and shot. The arrow pierced the heart of the flea without breaking the strand of hair that the flea hung from. When Chi Siechong related this to Fei Wei, the master archer clapped his hands and said, Wonderful! You have understood what archery is all about. You are now ready to learn. Not long afterward, Chi Siechong learned everything that Fei Wei could teach him. He went home and thought, Right now, the only person who can rival my skill is my master. If I kill him, then I shall be the greatest archer alive. One day, Chi Siechong met Fei Wei on a deserted road. Seeing his chance in killing his former teacher, he pulled his bow and sent an arrow toward Fei Wei. Almost simultaneously the master pulled his bow. The two arrows hit each other at the same distance between the two men and dropped to the ground without raising any dust. Swiftly Chi Siechong shot several arrows toward Fei Wei, and each time the arrows were stopped in mid-flight. Finally, Chi Siechong was down to one arrow, and Fei Wei's quiver was empty. This is my chance to kill him, Chi Siechong said to himself. So he drew his bow and let off the last arrow. Fei Wei calmly picked up a thorny branch and, using it as an arrow, stopped Chi Siechong's arrow in midair. Seeing this, both men threw down their bows. With tears in their eyes, they bowed to each other. So great was their respect for each other that they pledged on the spot to become father and son. Not wanting their skills to be a cause of jealousy and treachery for future generations, they made cuts in their arms and took an oath never to reveal the secrets of their technique to others. Chi Siechong was proud and ambitious and wanted to be the best. However, he was moved by Fei Wei's mastery and realized that what he had seen was the greatest feat of archery. Fei Wei, too, was impressed with Chi Siechong's intelligence and his single-mindedness in accomplishing what he had set out to do. It is said that the pinnacle of achievement is a lonely place, and sometimes rivals can understand and appreciate each other more than friends can. So it is not uncommon that the greatest rivals can become the best of friends. Chapter 60 Saofu Learns to Drive Tsaofu apprenticed himself to a famous charioteer whose skill was legendary. For many years, Saofu served his teacher humbly but did not receive any instruction. This did not discourage the apprentice. In fact, Saofu showed even more respect and diligence in attending to his master's needs. Finally, impressed by Saofu's sincerity, the master charioteer said to his student, the ancients say that a master bowmaker starts out by making baskets, and a master blacksmith starts out by making hammers. Now watch me carefully. If you can get to the same state of body and mind that I am in, then you will be able to drive a chariot. I shall follow your instructions carefully, said Saofu. The master then took several posts, just large enough to stand on, and sunk them into the ground. The posts were arranged so that they were about a stride apart. Then the master charioteer jumped onto the posts and stepped from one post to another, running back and forth with ease. Practice running on the posts, he told Saofu, and when you've mastered this, I shall give you further instructions. After three days Saofu was able to run around on the posts without stumbling or falling. His master sighed and said, You are agile and you learn fast. 
Now let me tell you about charioteering. All charioteers must start by learning how to run on the posts. Although it appears that you are training to be agile in your footwork, you are actually training your body to respond to the commands of your mind. This is the key to driving a chariot. Applying and releasing pressure in the reins should be at one with your intention. If your fingers and your palms respond naturally to your will, then you can transfer your intention directly to each horse on the team. The team will respond to the smallest pull or slack in any direction, and you can guide the chariot forward or backward and turn left or right without any effort. Your body responds to your mind, the reins respond to the movements of your body, and the horses respond to the pressure from the reins. In this way, without expending any energy, you can drive a chariot over long distances and not feel tired. When this happens, you know you have mastered this art. After a while the master charioteer continued, let me elaborate on what I have said. Each horse pulling the chariot wears a bit and a bridle. Thus, the feel of the horse's movement is communicated through the bit to the bridle, from the bridle to the reins, from the reins to your hands, from the hands to the rest of your body, and from your body to your mind. When you communicate your intention to the horses, it is simply this sequence of commands in reverse. Thus, controlling your team and getting feedback from the horse's movements can be totally done by intention alone. In this way you can drive without your eyes and you will never need to use a whip. When your mind is clear and your body is relaxed, you can control six bridles without confusion and 24 hooves will step where you want them. Then the wheels of your chariot will move forward and in reverse and turn left and right with precision and control. You can drive on mountain roads with the same ease as you would on the plains. Your driving will not be different whether your horses are stepping close to the edge of a cliff or running on flat grassland. That is all I have to teach, so remember it well. Agility of body and stillness of mind are required for intention to be communicated naturally. A stiff body whose parts do not cooperate cannot respond to intention, no matter how clear and still the mind is. Likewise, an agile body will only meet with confusion if the mind is not still. Therefore, to attain the highest level of any skill, both body and mind must be trained simultaneously. Chapter 61, Lytan's Revenge Lytan's father was killed by Halewan in a heated dispute. Lytan swore he would find the killer and avenge his father's death. Although Lytan had a fearless disposition and intense perseverance, he was as thin as a wraith. His stomach could only hold a handful of grains, and he was so weak that a strong wind could sweep him off his feet. Therefore, despite his intent of avenging his father's death, Lai Tan was incapable of handling any kind of weapon. However, Lai Tan had a sense of honor and would not hire someone to fight for him. So, ashamed of his weakness and angry that he could do nothing, he fretted day and night. As if things weren't bad enough, Halewan, the killer of Lytan's father, was a very strong and violent man. Halewan could swing the heaviest sword and fight a hundred men barehanded. Moreover, the man had skin-like bark that could not be penetrated by sword or spear. He would flaunt his abilities by blocking swords with his neck or stopping arrows with his bare chest. The swords and arrows would break without leaving a scar or scratch on his body. He therefore taunted and laughed at Lytan calling the weak man a helpless chick. One day a friend of Lytan said to him, Halewan behaves as if you were a piece of dung. What are you going to do about it? Lytan got even more depressed and said to his friend, I don't know what I'm going to do. Do you have any suggestions? His friend replied, I have heard that in the country of Wei is a nobleman who has a magic sword. This sword is so powerful that it can drive away a whole army even when it is wielded by a child. Why not go and ask if you can borrow that sword? Lai Tan took his friend's advice and journeyed to the land of Wei. He begged the nobleman to help him and offered to be a bonded servant. Next, he explained his situation, asked to borrow the magic sword, and promised to leave his wife and children as hostages in the nobleman's estate while he went to look for the killer. The nobleman listened to Lai Tan's pleas and was impressed with the young man's determination to overcome seemingly insurmountable hardships. So he said, I have three magic swords, 
but none of them can kill. I will let you borrow one of them for avenging your father's death. But before you choose, let me describe the characteristics of each of these swords for you. The first sword is called Invisible Light. It has no shape, so you cannot see it. It is weightless, so you cannot feel it when you wield it. It leaves no mark when it cuts, and it can slice through a victim's body without him even knowing it. The second one is called the Shadow Sword. If you take this sword and hold it against the soft morning or evening light, you can barely see it. If it cuts something, there is a slight swishing sound. When it pierces a body the victim does not feel any pain. My third sword is called the Night Sword. In the daylight, you can only see its shadow, but not its glitter. In the night, you can see its glow but not its shape. When it cuts something, you hear a slashing sound. The wound it makes closes immediately, and no blood is shed. The victim only feels slight pain where the sword has cut. These three swords have been passed down to me through thirteen generations in my family. They have never been used and are still sealed inside their special cases. Lytan asked to borrow the night sword. The nobleman then told Lytan that a special ritual was needed to break the seal that locked the sword. He fasted for seven days, did the appropriate rituals of purification, and brought the sword out of its case in the middle of the night. He handed the sword to Lytan and told him there was no need to leave his wife and children as hostages. Lytan bowed in thanks and set out to find Hailwan. When Lytan arrived at Hailwan's house, he found the man alone and drunk. Seeing his chance, Lytan lifted the sword and slashed Hailwan effortlessly three times from the neck down to the waist. When Hailwan did not stir, Lytan thought he had killed the man, so he hurried out. At the door he ran into Hailwan's son. Swiftly he raised the knight's sword and struck him three times. Again, he felt like cutting through thin air. Hailwan's son smiled cordially and asked Lytan, You're a funny man. Why did you wave your hand around me like that? Lytan knew his sword could not kill, so he sighed and went away. When Hailwan woke up, he shouted at his wife, Why didn't you cover me when I passed out? Now I have a sore throat and my waist hurts. Hailwan's son then said, Father, when I came home yesterday I met Lytan at the door of our house. He waved his hand at me in a funny way, and then walked away. Now my body is hurting a bit and my arms and legs are aching. Do you think he's laid a curse on us? Lytan did not kill Hailwan, but he got his revenge. It did not matter that Hailwan did not die. To Lytan, all that mattered was that he had swung the sword and hit his father's killer with his own hands. The knight sword was indeed a powerful sword. Not only did it not kill or hurt, but it had helped Lytan dissipate his anger and made him feel he had accomplished his goal. If Lytan had used a lesser sword to avenge his father, then he would have killed Hailwan and Hailwan's son. Hailwan's family would then seek Lytan for revenge, and the killing would go on, family avenging family, for many generations. You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you. Part 6 Slash Effort and Destiny Chapter 62, Effort Argues with Destiny One day Effort said to Destiny, My achievements are greater than yours. Destiny did not agree. He challenged Effort immediately, What have you done to make your achievements surpass mine? Effort said, Whether someone lives long or dies young, is rich or poor, will succeed or fail depends on me. Destiny said at once, Old Ping's intelligence did not match that of the emperors Yao and Shun, but he lived a long and healthy life. On the other hand, Yen Hui, Confucius's best student, died when he was 18. Confucius's virtue far surpassed that of the feudal lords, but compared with them he was destitute. The emperor Shang Tiso was cruel and immoral, but lived a prosperous and long life. On the other hand, his ministers who were virtuous met with violent deaths. There was a man who sacrificed his own fortune to allow his brother a chance to be employed by the Lord of Qing. He remained poor and unknown for the rest of his life. Then there was another man who had neither virtue nor ability, who became the Lord of Qi. 
How about P and Shu Chi who starved to death in the mountains because they would not compromise their integrity and honor to serve an enemy lord? What can you say about corrupt officials who are rich or honest, hard-working people who are poor? Effort had not expected this barrage of evidence against his assertion. He frowned, but destiny continued, if you are as effective as you say, then why don't you make the hard-working people rich? Why don't you give virtuous people a long and prosperous life? Why are the intelligent and able people not employed, and why do stupid people occupy important places in government? Effort had no more to say in the face of these challenges, so sheepishly he said to Destiny, you are right. I do not have much effect after all. But I dare say a lot of things happen the way they do because you've been up to mischief, twisting people's destiny around and enjoying it. Destiny then said, I cannot force the directions of things. I merely open doors for them to go through. If something is going straight, I let it follow the straight path. If something takes a turn, I do not hinder it. No one, not you or I, can direct the path of things. Long life or short, rich or poor, success or failure, fortune or misfortune, all come about by themselves. How can I direct events, or even know where things will end up? Chapter 63, Fortune and Worth One day P.E.I. Kung T.Z.U. visited Shi Ment Su. The two were friends, but due to different things that had happened in their lives, they had not seen each other for a long time. When Pei Kung Su saw his friend, the first thing he said was, We grew up together. We live in the same times. How come everything seems to be going your way, but I am always stopped by obstacles? We come from the same clan, but people respect you and despise me. Like you I have eyes, ears, and a mouth, but people greet you and walk away from me. Sometimes we have similar opinions and even talk the same way, but you are listened to and I am ignored. When we are seen together, you are treated as an honest man and I am not trusted. When we both took office in government, you were promoted and I was dismissed. When we both farmed, even the earth cooperated with you and not with me. When we traded together, you made profits and I lost. This is really unfair. Pei Kung Su continued bemoaning his troubles. I wear old clothing and eat food that the pig would eat. I live in a broken shack and cannot afford a cart. You, on the other hand, wear silks and fine cloth. You eat the finest meat and grains. You live in a large mansion and travel around in a carriage pulled by fine horses. You ignore me on the streets, and you never invite me to your banquets or outings. Is this the way to treat a friend? Or do you think you are more virtuous and worthy than I am? Shi Mintsu was not very happy with Pei Kung Tzu's outburst. So he said curtly, I don't know who's more virtuous, you or I. All I know is that things always go right with me, and they always go wrong with you. Perhaps I am more virtuous and therefore more worthy in the eyes of others. In any case, you have the gall to compare your worthiness with mine. Don't you have any sense of shame? Pei Kung Tzu did not expect this slap in the face. Hurt and dejected, he left without a word. On his way home Pei Kung Tzu ran into the sage Tungkwa. Seeing Pei Kung Tzu's despondent look, Tungkwa asked, Where have you been? Why do you look so depressed? Pei Kung Tzu told Tungkwa what had happened during his visit to Simon Tzu's. Tungkwa said kindly, Don't feel so bad. We shall go over to Shi Ment Su's and have a talk with him. When Tungkwa saw Shi Ment Su, he said, Why did you insult your friend and hurt his feelings? Shi Ment Su said, Pei Kung Su said that his age, his background, and his education are the same as mine, but while I am rich, successful, and respected, he is poor, despised, and a failure in life. I told him it's because he is not as worthy as I am. Tungkwa then said to Shi Ment Su, you seem to think worth can be measured by social or political success. I see it differently. It seems to me you have more luck and Pei Kung Su actually has more virtue. You are successful in society not because you are particularly wise or virtuous, but because you have luck in everything you do. On the other hand, Pei Kung Su's failure to be recognized is not due to stupidity or lack of virtue. It's because he does not have luck in everything he does. 
Whether you have luck or not is not something you can control. You should not be presumptuous because you have more luck. On the other hand, he should not feel worthless although he has more virtue. Both of you are equally blinded by your own ideas of worthiness. When Shimensu heard this, he said, You need not speak any more. I shall never boast about my success again. When Pei Kung Su returned home, he was not ashamed of being worthless any more. He wore his clothes and felt as if they were luxurious silks and furs. He ate simple foods and found them as tasteful as the best gourmet foods in town. He lived in a shack and felt as if he were living in a large mansion. When he traveled in his broken cart, he felt it was the finest carriage. He no longer saw the difference between honor and disgrace, recognition and anonymity. In this way, he passed the rest of his life in contentment. When the sage Tungwa saw the transformation in Pei Kung Tzu, he said, For a long time this man was buried in illusions of worth and value established by social norms. But it is also remarkable that he only needed one lesson to cut through these illusions. If only more people could be like him. Chapter 64 The Friendship of Quan Chung and Pao Shuya Quan Chung and Pao Shuya were the best of friends. They both grew up in the country of Qi, and both served in the royal court as teachers of princes. At that time the kingdom of Qi was in political turmoil. There were many intrigues in the capital surrounding the rivalry between princes who aspired to become heir to the throne. Quan Chun counseled his protege to find support in the kingdom of Lu, and Pao Shuya advised his prince to stay away from the capital and bide his time. The court politics soon turned vicious. The king of Qi was assassinated in a coup by a general who in turn was killed by rivals. The country was in chaos. Both Quan Chung and Pao Shuya advised their princes that it was time to stake their claims to the throne. In a battle outside the capital, the armies of the two princes met. Quan Chung shot an arrow at the rival prince which bounced off the prince's belt buckle. Infuriated and insulted, the prince returned to his camp. But in the end, Quan Chung's army was defeated, and both he and his lord had to flee to the nearby kingdom of Lu. Pao Shuya's prince entered the capital and became the king of Qi. Immediately, the new king led an army into Lu, where he killed his brother. Quan Chung surrendered, but the other advisor chose to die with his lord. When the king returned to the capital, Pao Shuya, who was now a minister, said to his lord, Now that the war is over, we can turn our attention to building the country. Quan Chung is a very able man. He can help you to make Qi the most powerful state among the feudal kingdoms. The king said, he insulted me on the battlefield. I was planning to have him executed. Pao Shuya said, a wise ruler does not let personal grudges cloud his judgment of people's abilities. Moreover, a good ruler always thinks about the welfare of his country first and his personal needs second. If you want Qi to become powerful and prosperous, you need Quan Chung's help. The king had great respect for his former tutor, so he accepted Pao Shuya's advice. He ordered Quan Chung to be released from the prison camp outside the city and brought into the court. Pao Shuya personally went to meet his friend and accompanied him into the capital. Quan Chung impressed the king so much that he was immediately given the position of chief minister, which ranked him above Pao Shuya. In time, the king's trust in Quan Chung grew, and eventually he gave him the honored title of eldest statesman. Quan Chung thus became the most powerful man in the kingdom of Qi, second only to the king. Pao Shuya was neither jealous nor resentful of Quan Chung's success. They remained the best of friends, for Pao Shuya respected Quan Chung's abilities and knew that if the lord of Qi was a wise ruler, he would entrust the highest responsibilities to Quan Chung. And Quan Chung did not disappoint his king. Under his guidance, Qi became the most powerful state among the feudal kingdoms. Quan Chung did not let his success affect his friendship with Pao Shuya, often he would say, if not for Pao Shuya, I would not be where I am today. When we were children, I always took a larger share of everything we found. He didn't argue with me and never considered me greedy, because he knew I came from a poor family that never had enough of anything. When we made plans together for our little enterprises, Pao Shuya accepted my advice, but when things did not turn out, 
he never blamed me for stupidity, for he knew that success and failure often depend more on luck than effort. As a young man I served in the civil service three times, and each time was fired from my job. Pao Shuya did not think I was worthless because he knew the opportunities were just not right for me. Three times I went into battle, and three times I escaped rather than face capture. Pao Shuya did not think that I was a coward because he knew I needed to look after my aging mother. In the final battle when the princes fought for the throne, when my fellow advisor chose to die with his lord and I surrendered, Pao Shuya did not consider my actions shameful because he knew that heroics are sometimes folly. Therefore, although my parents gave me life and nourished me, it is Pao Shuya who really understands me. True friendship is not simply looking out for your friends and ignoring their faults. Pao Shuya did not recommend Quan Chung to the king because he wanted to do his friend a favor. It was because he understood Quan Chung's genius in managing the affairs of a state and did not let his own personal ambitions prevent his friend from taking office. If Quan Chung had not been capable, Pao Shuya would not have recommended him, and Quan Chung in turn would not have begrudged his friend for not supporting him. When Pao Shuya became Quan Chung's subordinate, he was not resentful, but neither was Quan Chung hesitant in accepting his office. Quan Chung knew that Pao Shuya would not be offended. Both men knew that no matter what happened in the political arena, it would not affect their friendship. This is what true friendship should be. After a long and distinguished service as chief minister in Qi, Quan Chung fell seriously ill. The king was worried and distressed because it appeared that Quan Chung was not going to recover. He visited his minister, sat by his bed, and asked, You are very ill and are not getting better, so I shall be honest and straightforward with you. If one day you should die, who is the best person to take your place? Quan Chung did not answer. Instead he asked the king, do you have anyone in mind? I am considering Pao Shuya. Quan Chung counseled the king, Pao Shuya is not suitable for the position of chief minister. He has very high moral standards and is often inflexible. He does not tolerate people who are lesser than he in virtue or ability. If he sees someone make a mistake, he will discredit that person and remember the instance for the rest of his life. If you use Pao Shuya as your chief minister, there will be disharmony in the court. People will be afraid to serve you, and your subjects will lose their trust in you. Sooner or later, you will find Pao Shuya offensive, or he will find you offensive, and you will have to dismiss him. No, Pao Shuya is best used where he is now. Then, whom would you recommend? Quan Cheng said, If you really want me to name someone, I would suggest Xi Ping. Xi Ping is humble and unassuming. He can occupy a high position, and yet forget he is powerful. He will be respected by his subordinates, and at the same time he will not intimidate them. He does not compare himself with the sages. He recognizes his own shortcomings, and is patient and tolerant. He is someone his subordinates would feel comfortable working with. I think we will agree that the man who can inspire others with his virtue is a sage, and the man who can share his wisdom with others is worthy of respect. Xi Ping is precisely this kind of man. However, a man who despises those who do not measure up to his standard will not gain the respect of others, and a man who never forgets or forgives other people's mistakes cannot win their hearts. You do not want your chief advisor to be someone who is so rigid about virtue that everything appears wrong in his eyes. You do not want a perfectionist who criticizes and never encourages. Ideally, you want someone who knows when to point out problems and when to look the other way and let things be. This person will not look for perfection in his subordinates, his family, or his king. As far as I can see, Xi Ping is very close to this ideal. In the end, the king of Qi took Quan Cheng's advice and employed Xi Ping to be his chief minister. Many people would say Quan Cheng was harsh in his evaluation of Pao Shuya and did not remember what his friend had done for him. But Quan Cheng was not the kind of man who would jeopardize a country's safety for the sake of personal favors. In fact, Quan Cheng realized that true friendship does not depend on favors or positive evaluation. That was why he was candid about Pao Shuya's abilities and character when the king asked him for advice. 
Quan Chung was also certain his friend would understand his candidness and would not be hurt by Quan Chung's honest evaluation. Why did things turn out the way they did for Quan Chung, Pao Shuya, and Xi Ping? It was not because Pao Shuya favored his friend initially, or Quan Chung ignored his friend toward the end of his life, or Xi Ping was favored. It was because of Quan Chung and Pao Shuya's friendship. Neither of them could have acted otherwise. It was because of their abilities that Quan Chung was chosen in the first instance, and Xi Ping was chosen to be Quan Chung's successor. However, if the king of Qi had not been a wise ruler, and had not listened to words of wisdom and reason, neither man would have been chosen as chief minister at all. If we continue to analyze the situation we could go on indefinitely and find more reasons why one man was chosen and the other wasn't. And we would conclude that things happened the way they did because other things happened to make them happen. Thus, whether someone is favored or neglected, used or dismissed is not a function of their effort or even another person's effort. It is because many factors come together so that the events could not have unfolded otherwise. Chapter 65 are life and death a matter of effort or destiny? Ting HSI was a prominent official in the state of Qing, who delighted in finding fault with others and playing the devil's advocate. He loved to make ambiguous statements that stirred up conflict and contention among the government administrators. Su Siachen was a minister who ruled Qing with an iron fist. Concerned with the rise of criminal activities in the state, Su Siachen adopted a code of regulations that called for stricter enforcement of law and order. Administrators and citizens all welcomed this new legislation, except for Ting Shi, who criticized Su Siachen and his new code of law. This made Su Siachen extremely angry. Not only was Ting Shi criticizing him, but, as usual, Ting Shi's assertions stirred up arguments and conflict in the higher levels of the government. Soon, the government officials were divided into two camps, those who supported Su Siachen and those who agreed with Ting Shi. One day, without warning, Su Siachen had Ting Shi arrested and executed. Did Su Siachen have to kill Ting Shi? Had Ting Shi really committed such a serious crime to deserve to be executed? Under the circumstances, Su Siachen had no other choice because he knew how dangerous a disrupting influence could be for a country that was always threatened by invasion and plagued by internal disorder. On the other hand, knowing Su Siachen's unbending iron rule, why did Ting Shi play the devil's advocate and invite trouble for himself? We can also say that Ting Shi had no choice because it was natural for him to criticize everything under the sun. Thus, it was not Su Siachen's doing that killed Ting Shi, nor did Ting Shi bring death upon himself. Things could not have happened otherwise given the circumstances and given the natural dispositions of the two men. In the natural order of things, life and death are not something we can control. It is a blessing to be able to live and die at the right time. To live when it is not appropriate to live and to die when it is not time to die is punishment. Similarly, not to be able to live when you should live and not to be able to die when you should die is suffering. But whether we live and die at the right time is not something we can control. Rather, it is something that happens in the context of and as a consequence of many other events. The ancients say that the ways in which things happen are limitless and unknowable. Following the laws of transformation in heaven and earth, boundless and unceasing, the cycles of change come about by themselves. Heaven and earth and all things cannot go against this natural order. The wisdom of the sages cannot modify it and demons cannot escape it. All things come and go without the need of a creator or mover to make them happen. Silently their presence is recognized, harmoniously their existence is accepted, and peacefully their departure is acknowledged. Chapter 66 An Average Doctor, A Good Doctor, and An Ingenious Doctor Yang Chu's friend fell ill. The man's sons counseled their father to call a doctor, but Yang Chu's friend refused. After ten days, the illness went from bad to worse. The sons sat by their father's bedside and wept bitterly. One day Yang Chu came to visit his friend. Finding the whole house in mourning, he said, What's all this weeping? His friend sighed and replied, My sons are so thick-headed. Why don't you sing a song to wake them up? So Yang Chu sang. 
If heaven does not know, how can mortals know? If heaven does not bless you, crying won't help. If we all weep together, will it lengthen life and chase away death? Even doctors and shamans are not miracle workers. After Yang Chu had finished his song, the sun still failed to understand. They went and invited three doctors to examine their father. The first doctor looked at the sick man and said, You are ill because the yang and yin in your body are out of balance. You've weakened yourself by not eating or sleeping properly, having too much sex, and worrying about too many things. Given enough rest and care you should recover. Yang Chu's friend said, He's a doctor of average ability. Tell him to leave immediately. The second physician examined the sick man and gave his prognosis. Your illness is a result of a weak constitution due to insufficient nutrition in your mother's womb. Although there was sufficient milk to nourish you after you were born, the damage is done. Your illness did not come about overnight. It is something that has developed over a long period of time. There's not much that can be done about it now. Yang Chu's friend said, This man is a good doctor. Take him out for dinner. The third doctor did not even examine Yang Chu's friend. He simply said, Your illness is not caused by heaven, man, or evil spirits. Each person is endowed with life at birth, and this course of life is not something that can be controlled or directed. Given the way things have turned out, even the best medication cannot help you. Yang Chu's friend was very pleased with this doctor. He said, Give him a rich gift. He is an ingenious doctor. Soon afterward, Yang Chu's friend recovered without any treatment. Sometimes, if you value life too much, you cannot preserve it. If you get overattached to your health, you will get sick. However, if you do not care for yourself at all, you will lose your health and your life. Life and death, health and illness, benefit and harm come of themselves. Let things go according to their natural course. Don't try to make things happen, and don't prevent them from happening. Chapter 67 Yang Chu Talks About Destiny King Wen's teacher said to him, In the natural world, things that are endowed with gifts from heaven are not necessarily more well-off than things that are not favored. In the same way, intelligent people are not necessarily more well-off than people who are not intelligent. Therefore, why try to estimate your chances of success based on your abilities and talents? Lao Tzu said to his student Wen Tzu, We can't say that a person who is not gifted is hated by heaven. But on the other hand, who knows the will of heaven? Maybe by not giving him blessings, heaven is helping him instead. Yang Chu's younger brother found that there were certain things he could not understand. So he asked his brother, Suppose there are two men who are equal in age, intelligence, and manners. Let's say they even look alike and talk the same way. But one man is rich and the other poor, one of them enjoys a long and healthy life, and the other dies young, one is respected by all and the other is despised. Can you tell me why one man is favored and the other is not, although they are both endowed with the same gifts at birth? Yang Chu said, the ancients have much to say about these things. Let me explain them to you and maybe after you have considered their wisdom, you will not feel as confused. That two people with similar endowments at birth should end up with very different lives is a matter of the natural unfolding of events called destiny. Look at the muddy world, look at the crowds of people who push themselves to achieve, and you will realize they are neither happy nor contented. Do you need to do this too, just because everyone else is doing it? If you don't want to push yourself, if you don't accept the social norms of success and achievement, who can stop you? From sunrise to sunset people rush around madly. Does this guarantee they will be more well-off than you are if you don't do the same thing? What will happen to you is not determined by effort, nor even by any innate abilities. Seeing that his brother was still confused, Yang Chu continued, If you accept the natural order of things, you will not worry about whether your life is long or short. If you understand the laws of heaven and earth, you will not be concerned with conceptions of right or wrong. If you trust in yourself, then it doesn't matter whether conditions are safe or dangerous. If you are true to yourself, you will not be disturbed by things that happen around you. 
gain or loss, praise or blame, approval or disapproval, happiness or sadness, anger or satisfaction cannot affect you. The Yellow Emperor once said that enlightened persons do not question why they are living or what they are doing. They are not affected by other people's actions and opinions. They do not go against the natural grain of things and do not do things that oppose their principles. Accepting the natural unfolding of events, they can go where they please and do what needs to be done. The thoughts and actions of others will have no effect on them. Like Yang Chu's brother, we often wonder why things happen the way they do. And when we see things happen contrary to our expectations, we are frustrated or disappointed. In our minds, two people with the same intelligence and appearance should have similar achievements in careers and social status. And if we do not succeed where others with the same abilities did, it feels good to find an excuse to get depressed and think that we are treated unfairly. However, if we can break free from this mode of thought and acknowledge that there are some things we simply cannot control, then there will be less disappointment, frustration, anger, and dissatisfaction in our lives. Chapter 68 We Cannot Know People Who Are Different From Us There were four people who shared a house. They ate together, did the housework together, and even played together, but each one had a very different personality. One of them was studious and serious, one was reckless, one was carefree, and one was hot-tempered. Although they spent a lot of time together, they did things their own way and did not understand each other, for each one claimed to be more intelligent than everyone else. There was another group of four people who also lived together and did many things together. They were also very different in their dispositions. One of them was glib and smooth-talking. One was blunt and honest, one was stubborn and rigid, and one was complacent and bending. Although they had lived together for a long time, they all went about doing things their own way and never bothered to learn about what the other people did, for each of them claimed to be more skillful than the others. Yet another group of four found themselves as housemates who spent a lot of time together. They too were very different from each other. One of them was crafty, one was proud, one was silent, and one was argumentative. They also went about their own business and never listened to the other people, for they all believed they were more gifted than the others. Four other people lived together. One of them was sneaky, one was fickle, one was daring, and one was timid. They also did things their own way and did not want to learn from each other. To the end of their lives they never understood each other, and they all believed themselves more virtuous than the others. There was one more group of four people with different characteristics who lived in the same house for a long time. One of them was outgoing and sociable, one was confident, one was authoritative, and one was a loner. Despite the time they'd spent together, they never knew each other, for each of them claimed to know the best way to take advantage of opportunities. All of these people had different dispositions. On first glance, it may appear they were snobbish because they did not want to understand others who had a different attitude. But, on the other hand, if they had tried, would they have succeeded? Or would they have acknowledged each other's differences politely, pretended they had understood each other, and then returned to doing things their own way? Each individual is different, and each follows his or her own path in life. Why not be honest and accept our differences? Why pretend to understand when we do not? It is a rare occasion when two individuals can communicate directly with heart and mind, like Pia the lute player and his friend Chung Tsu Chi, or the master archer Fei Wei and his student Chi Si Chong, and the friends Quan Chung and Pao Shuya. Chapter 69 Success and Failure Those who succeed will often not know beforehand that they will succeed. Those who fail will often not know beforehand that they will fail. Therefore, why waste time and effort to anticipate success or failure when it will only cause anxiety and apprehension? If we understand the nature of success and failure, we will not be sad if things go wrong or overjoyed when things go our way. Undisturbed by emotional swings, we can deal in a calm and composed manner with whatever comes. Many things happen without our active intervention. When the momentum of events is too strong, the best thing we can do is get out of the way and not be swept up by it. 
Thus, knowing the role of destiny in success and failure, the wise ones know when to act and when to stop. Someone who accepts the natural flow of events will not be aroused by what's happening around him. He will not respond in anger or joy, attraction or repulsion, fear or relaxation. On the other hand, someone who rejects the natural flow of events will always worry about success and failure, gain and loss, approval or rejection. Even if we blindfold him or put wax in his ears, he will still feel tension and anxiety. Life and death are natural events. Riches and poverty are the product of the times. We only worry about whether our lives will be long or short, or whether we will be rich or poor, when we do not understand that events come and go of themselves and our worrying cannot change them. Only those who accept the natural flow of events will not be concerned about life and death or anxious about praise or blame. Intelligent people will often want to calculate the likelihood of success and failure before they take action. However, their chances of succeeding are often not very different from those of people who do not think about the odds. Therefore, odds, likelihood, and timeliness are dependent on other events and their chances of happening, and so on in an endless chain. Things will turn out the way they would regardless of our predictions. Therefore, why try to predict and then be anxious about the accuracy of our predictions? When we do not anticipate success and failure, we will be prepared to accept any outcome. We will not be terribly overjoyed if things turn out the way we want, but we will not be miserable should things run amok. Chapter 70 The King Who Was Greedy About Life and Afraid of Death The King of Chi was sightseeing on Ox Mountain. With him were his ministers and attendants. Looking down from the hill, the king saw his country before him, the wide expanse of fertile fields, the rolling hills of green and yellow, and the slow, meandering rivers. Suddenly, he was overcome with sadness and melancholy and sighed, What a beautiful land! What a pity that I shall die one day and leave all this! If only death didn't exist, then I should have these mountains and rivers forever. As he finished speaking, Tears began to roll down his cheeks. Two officials who attended the king also began to weep. To their master they said, My lord, even we who only eat coarse grain and tough meat and travel in old carriages do not want to leave what we have. How much harder it is for a lord like you to part with your fortune. Just as everyone was getting more and more depressed, his chief minister, Yen Tsu, was quietly laughing to himself. The king turned to his advisor and said, When I saw the beauty of the land before me and realized that I have to part with it one day, I was overcome with sadness and wept. All my subordinates shared my feelings and cried with me except you. Why are you laughing instead? Yen Tsu said, If everyone lived forever, then the ancient kings would still be around and they would be occupying their thrones. You, my lord, would be an undistinguished citizen plowing the field, and worrying about whether you would have enough to eat. Given that, you'd probably want to die and not live forever. Today you are the king of a prosperous country, and yet you cry like a coward who is afraid of dying. Seeing a fool urged on by other fools, I cannot but laugh at this collective folly. When the king heard this he was ashamed. He apologized for his behavior and his inability to be an example to his subordinates. When we are rich and famous and powerful, we do not want to die. On the other hand, if we are miserable and suffering, we want to die and leave it all. But can joy or misery last forever? There is a saying, all celebrations must end sometime. Any wish to live forever or die immediately is often a whim of the moment. How do we know that, although we are happy now, we may not be sad the next day, or sad now but may be happy soon? Given that good and ill, fortune and misfortune come in their own way, we should not cling to life or embrace death. Life and death will come of their own. Why be greedy about life and afraid of death? Chapter 71 Death is not a loss There was a man whose only son died of a sudden illness. He did not mourn for his son, nor was he sad about it. His friends were curious about his behavior, so they asked him, Your only son is dead. You should be heartbroken. Why do you act as if nothing had happened? The man replied, Before my son came, I had no son. 
I was certainly not heartbroken back then. Now I have no son. Why should I be heartbroken now? You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you. Part 7 Yang Chu Chapter 72 A Name is Nothing and Titles are Empty Yang Chu was traveling in the kingdom of Lu and stayed with his friend Meng. One day Meng asked Yang Chu, why are people not satisfied with who they are? Why do they want social recognition? Yang Chu said matter-of-factly, social recognition can help them get rich. Why is it that after they get rich, they are still not satisfied? After you have wealth, you'll want political power. But when they have political power, they're still not satisfied. Now they want to make sure things are in order when they die. When you die, you'll leave everything. What's the use of planning for things that happen afterward? They worry about their grandchildren's future. How can a name and title affect the welfare of your descendants? Yang Chu explained, people think if they leave a good reputation, then their descendants will be respected. However, most of the time, people who leave a good name are those who are tired in body and mind, but have lived an honest live. Honesty and riches do not often go hand in hand. So the honest man who is socially recognized as a virtuous person is often poor. Similarly, a humble person may gain respect in his or her community, but will not rise in rank and political power. So we have a paradox here. Honesty and humility will not get you power and rank although it may get you reputation. On the other hand, to be rich and powerful, you need to sacrifice some honesty and humility and maybe lose your reputation as a virtuous person. Many people spend their lives being stuck in this dilemma. Meng thought he had understood Yang Chu, so he said, I think I see what you mean. Look at Quan Cheng. When he was the chief minister of Qi, he was lecherous when the king was lecherous and extravagant when the king was extravagant. The minister and his lord were of the same heart and mind. So Quan Cheng got along very well with the king and became the second most powerful man in the country. But today, his descendants are respected no more than the common citizen. On the other hand, another minister named Tin Heng was humble when his king was arrogant, generous when his king was greedy. Minister and lord never got along well, but his popularity won the hearts of the people, and they made him king. Now his descendants enjoy the prosperity of the kingdom of Qi. Therefore, the man who has power now may not leave a good name behind him but the man who may be poor now may end up having a good reputation later. Yang Chu said, you haven't gotten my point. It is not that being humble and poor now will get you recognition later, nor that being powerful now will leave you a bad name. People think either you get power and social recognition now and give up your good name forever, or you suffer and sacrifice now and get a good name later. I say neither is worthwhile. The ancients say a name is nothing and titles are empty. Do you think the emperors Yao and Shun abdicated because they were virtuous? Their reputation actually went up after they lost the kingship. If there had been nothing to gain, I bet neither of them would have abdicated. Now do you think having reputation or a good name in history has to do with being virtuous? Not only is a name not worth pursuing, but it is actually meaningless. Take a look at the hermits P and Shu Chi. They refused to serve an enemy lord and starved to death in the mountains. These two became heroes and were regarded as men of integrity and virtue. However, they lost their lives and their lands, and their descendants became destitute. In this case, the reputation of these two men did nothing to help their children and grandchildren. If you want a name and title, you must sacrifice some of your integrity and humility. If you want to be sincere and honest, you won't get much social recognition. Sometimes, having a name carries with it anxieties and burdens of responsibility. Thus, people who have power and social status are often not free to do what they want. Because everyone is watching them, they have to behave in a way that is expected of their reputation. One error and they will lose their hard-earned reputation. They are not exactly the happiest people. On the other hand, 
someone with neither social status nor a reputation to uphold may be a freer and happier person. Why then work so hard to gain social recognition when it will only diminish your freedom and happiness? Chapter 73 Life Temporarily Staying in the World, Death Temporarily Leaving Young CHU said If you live to be a hundred, it is considered a long life. However, only one in a thousand persons is that lucky. But if we take a person who has lived a hundred years and look at the time he has spent in his life, we will realize that a hundred years is not a long life. Out of these years, childhood and old age take up at least half the time. In addition, half the day he is asleep. Not to mention the hours during the day that he has idled away. What does that leave him? Moreover, if you take out the times when he is ill, sad, confused, suffering, and not feeling good, there isn't much time left that he can enjoy or be free. Some people think they can find satisfaction in good food, fine clothes, lively music, and sexual pleasure. However, when they have all these things, they are not satisfied. They realize happiness is not simply having their material needs met. Thus, society has set up a system of rewards that go beyond material goods. These include titles, social recognition, status, and political power, all wrapped up in a package called self-fulfillment. Attracted by these prizes and goaded on by social pressure, people spend their short lives tiring body and mind to chase after these goals. Perhaps this gives them the feeling that they have achieved something in their lives, but in reality they have sacrificed a lot in life. They can no longer see, hear, act, feel, or think from their hearts. Everything they do is dictated by whether it can get them social gains. In the end, they've spent their lives following other people's demands and never lived a life of their own. How different is this from the life of a slave or a prisoner? The ancients understood that life is only a temporary sojourn in this world and death a temporary departure. In our short time here, we should listen to our own voices and follow our own hearts. Why not be free and live your own life? Why follow other people's rules and live to please others? When something enjoyable comes your way, you should enjoy it fully. Don't be imprisoned by name or title, for social conventions can lead you away from the natural order of things. It doesn't matter whether you will be remembered in generations ahead, because you will not be there to see it. Why spend your life letting other people manipulate you just to get a name and reputation? Why not let your life be guided by your own heart and live without the burdens of fame and recognition? Chapter 74 In life there may be differences, in death everything is the same. Myriad things may be different in life, but in death they are the same. Some people are born into rich families, others are born poor. Some are born intelligent, others are born stupid. Some are born into nobility, others are born as common citizens. While they live, they are different. But when they die, everyone is just a pile of bones and rotting flesh. Whether we live or die, are intelligent or stupid, is not something we can control. We cannot choose to be born, nor can we choose not to rot when we die. We are not responsible for our intelligence or stupidity, nor do we have any say in what kind of environment we are born into. All these things come of themselves and are matters of destiny. Thus, in life we are different because of different destinies. There is, however, one thing we all have in common, death. Some may live to be a hundred, others may die after ten years of life. But regardless of how long you live, you must die. Virtuous people die, crooks die. When alive, the virtuous may be respected, but in death they are a pile of dry bones. Similarly, the wicked may be abhorred in life, but in death they are also a pile of bones. Famous people are a pile of bones after death, unknown people are a pile of bones after death. Differences are seen or remembered at most for a hundred years, but after that, one pile of bones is just the same as another. Given the shortness and transitory nature of life, we should make the best use of it. Enjoy it while you can. Why worry about whether you will leave a good name when all that will be left of you is a pile of dry bones? 75. Riches can injure you, but poverty can also hurt you. 
There was a poor man who eventually starved to death because of poverty. There was a wealthy man who injured his body and tired his mind because he pushed himself too hard trying to get richer. Thus, riches can injure you, but poverty can also hurt you. What is the best way, then, to live? A good life is a contented life with sufficient means and adequate enjoyment. If you're too rich, you will be burdened by your wealth, because with great wealth come the complexities of management, and with management comes the anxiety over gain and loss. On the other hand, if you are too poor, you will not get enough to eat or have warm clothing or leisure time. Thus, you toil if you are too rich, and you toil if you are too poor. These are two extremes we should avoid. If you don't have enough to eat, work on getting enough to eat. If you can't keep warm in winter, work on getting sufficient clothing. If you don't have time to enjoy yourself, work toward getting leisure time. But when you have enough, you should stop. If you continue to work to get gourmet foods, a big wardrobe, and more vacations, you'll end up not having the time to enjoy them, because you will always be working on getting the money to do these things. Chapter 76 Taking Care of Yourself Yen Tzu asked Quan Cheng what the ancients meant by cultivating life. Quan Cheng replied, Cultivating life is taking care of yourself. It means living freely and not putting constraints on yourself. Can you elaborate on this? Let your eyes see what they see, not what others want you to see. Let your ears hear what they naturally hear, not what others want you to hear. Let your mouth speak your mind freely and not be constrained by other people's approval or disapproval. Let your mind think what it wants to think and not let other people's demands dictate your thoughts. If your senses and your mind are not allowed to do what they want to do naturally, you are denying them their rights. When you cannot think, sense, feel, or act freely, then your body and mind are injured. Break these oppressions, and you will cultivate life. When you can cultivate life, then you can wait peacefully for death. Being able to escape these oppressions for one day is better than to live a hundred years being imprisoned by them. Quan Cheng then said to Yen Tzu, Now that I've talked about cultivating life, what can you tell me about taking care of death? Yentsu said, as far as I am concerned, there's not much to taking care of death. It comes when it comes. When Quan Cheng pressed him further, Yentsu said, when I'm dead I won't know anything. Therefore, it doesn't really matter whether you throw me into the sea, leave me in the open, roll me into a ditch, or bury me in a grave. I wouldn't know if you dressed me up in expensive burial clothes, or wrapped me in burlap sacks. Why worry about what happens after you die? Quan Cheng then turned to his friend Pao Shuya and said, Between Yen Tzu and myself, we've said all there is to say about the way to live and the way to die. When you live, be contented and know what's enough. When you die, there's no need for expensive caskets and elaborate funerals. Thus, live a satisfied life and die a simple death. Chapter 77 A Madman or an Enlightened Man Tuan Mushu was an extremely wealthy man. He was the descendant of Tzu Kung, who was a student of Confucius and a very successful businessman. Tuan Mushu inherited a large fortune from his ancestors and was not interested in working. He enjoyed the good life and followed wherever his fancy led him. He had a large mansion built of the finest materials and decorated by the most skillful artisans. He ate the best foods and wore clothes of the highest quality. He traveled in comfortable carriages and was always accompanied by beautiful courtesans. Tuan Mushu went after anything that excited his senses, aroused his curiosity, and stimulated his mind. He collected rare artifacts and treasures from foreign countries. He traveled to exotic places. He was entertained by the best musicians and dancers of the time. He would not deny himself anything. He was wealthy and extravagant, and was envied by kings and nobles alike. Unlike most wealthy people, however, Tuan Mushu was never tight-fisted with his money. He was generous and spent it freely on others as well as on himself. He threw huge parties regularly and invited hundreds of people to enjoy the best food and the finest entertainment. He also shared his wealth with relatives, friends, neighbors, and even people whom he didn't know. 
His generosity was so great that not a needy person was found in the town where he lived nor in the neighboring villages. When Tuan Mushu was sixty years old and his health was beginning to fail, he gave away all his possessions, leaving nothing for his children and grandchildren. Within a year, the rich man had become poor and could not even afford to call a doctor when he was ill. When he died, his children had no money to bury him. Fortunately for his descendants, the people who had benefited from Tuan Mushu's generosity collected funds, gave him a decent burial, and returned some of the wealth to the family. When a prominent scholar heard about this, he said, Tuan Mushu is a madman. Su Kung would have rolled over in his grave if he knew about this. Another philosopher commented, Tuan Mushu is an enlightened man. He even surpasses his ancestor Tzu Kung. Is Tuan Mushu a madman or an enlightened man? If you judge him by social norms, then it would appear that Tuan Mushu was indeed crazy. He abandoned his family, did not care for the welfare of his descendants, and squandered his wealth. But then again, Tuan Mushu was sincere in everything he did. There was no pretense, no scheming, no ulterior motive in his actions. He followed his heart and was not constrained by social conventions. He enjoyed himself freely, he gave freely, and he never did anything that went against his nature. Chapter 78 What Damages Health More, Unrestricted Pleasure, or Obsessive Hard Work? Tzuchan, the chief minister of the kingdom of Cheng, had two brothers. While he spent his energy on strengthening the country and putting down crime and disorder, his two brothers indulged in everything that satisfied their senses. One of the brothers had a brewery and a large warehouse in the back of his mansion where he stored thousands of jars of wine. Even a block away one could smell the reek of fermenting yeast. He drank heavily and, when drunk, he was oblivious to everything around him. He couldn't care if there was peace or war or if his house was looted. He couldn't recognize friends and relatives and he lost all concern for life or death. The other brother had a dozen rooms in the house where he kept a group of beautiful young women. Often he would visit his harem and make love all night and would not be satisfied when the morning came. When he was aroused sexually, he would spend months with the women, never even bothering to come out to meet friends and relatives or take care of the family business. When he reveled in his sexual pleasures, he was oblivious to the world outside. It didn't matter to him whether the country was at war or peace, or whether his house was vandalized or robbed. Su Siachen was very concerned about his brother's lifestyles. So he went to talk to Ting Shi, a fellow statesman who, although sarcastic and snide at times, was known for his keen observations and problem-solving ability. Su Siachen said, I'm worried about my two brothers. It is said that a man is not worthy to govern a state if he cannot set his family in order. As you can see, the new laws and reforms are working very well now, but my family matters are a mess. Can you suggest anything that would get my two irresponsible brothers to behave more properly? Ting Shi replied, I've noticed their behaviors too, and I've wondered when you were going to do something about it. Here's what I would suggest. Find a good opportunity to tell them about the need to put their lives in order. Tell them what they're doing is damaging their health. Maybe this will convince them to change their lifestyles. One day Tsu Siachen found his brothers together. He took this opportunity to talk to them about their lives. Heaven made us a cut above animals in dignity and intelligence. Therefore, it is our duty to live up to these expectations and behave in a manner befitting our position in society. If you only live to satisfy your senses, you are no more than animals. Moreover, Wine and sex can damage your health, and one day you will find yourself weak and wasted away by your pleasures. Stop harming yourselves, become responsible citizens, and I shall give you a position in the government. Su Siachen's brothers said, We know that wine and sex damage health. But we also know that life is short, and we want to enjoy whatever we can now. You on the other hand, suppress what you want to do in order to maintain your rank and power. You belabor your body and mind day and night. Does that not damage your health, age you, and make you weak and wasted? You are proud of your achievements and you want us to conform to your beliefs. 
You want to entice us with titles and political power, but we know that such things only bring burden and trouble. You say our lifestyles are embarrassing, and you want to reform us. Let us tell you something, too. You may be the chief minister, and the country may look like it's in order. But look at yourself closely. You are tired and haggard. You have damaged your body and mind because you are anxious about keeping the country in order. In order to maintain your reputation, you have damaged your heart by suppressing your natural inclinations. You have kept law and order, but you have not won people's hearts. People accept your rule because they are afraid of you, not because they respect you. We, on the other hand, may be wild and unruly, but we are true to ourselves. We have never put up a front to gain respect. We have never been involved in dirty politics or harmed other people with treachery and intrigue. Can you say this about yourself? If you can't, then it's not we who should take your advice, but you who should take ours. Susiachin did not know what to say. Later he saw Ting Shi and related the whole incident to him. Ting Shi said, You have been living with enlightened men and didn't even know it. As history tells us, Su Siachen had to kill Ting Shi to silence his disruptive criticisms. Qing became a powerful state for a while, but after Su Siachen's death it weakened, and was eventually conquered by a more powerful neighbor. Su Siachen himself was not given a very good image by later historians, but nothing was heard concerning the two brothers, for they were neither praised nor damned by history. Chapter 79 Everyone Must Die Sometime Someone asked Yang Chu. What do you think of people who pray for immortality? Yang Xu replied, Everyone must die sometime. Praying won't help. How about asking for a long life, then? Life and death have their own course. It's not something we can ask for, hope for, or control. Even if you take all the necessary precautions to preserve your life, it is not guaranteed that you'll keep it. Besides, joy and sorrow, Gain and loss, war and peace, good government and bad repeat themselves throughout history. Why live a hundred years to see the same things come and go? If life is such a bad experience, why not kill yourself and end it early? That's not the way to go either. When you live, you should accept life and let it run its course. When you die, you should accept death and go to it peacefully. Life and death come by themselves. We should let them run their course and not try to speed or delay them. Chapter 80 Would you sacrifice a strand of hair to benefit the world? Yang Chu said, The sage Pasi Kautsu would not sacrifice his body and mind to benefit the world, so he became a hermit and lived a life of peace and contentment. You the king sacrificed everything to help the world. He got everyone's respect but became a cripple for the rest of his life. The ancients say if people did not sacrifice a single strand of their hair to save the world, then the world would be a less complicated place. Someone then asked Yang Chu, if plucking a strand of hair from your body could help the world, would you do it? Yang Chu said, the world cannot be helped by a piece of my hair. But suppose it could. Would you do it? Yang Chu did not answer. Sometime later, this inquirer met one of Yang Chu's friends and brought up the matter. Yang Chu's friend said, You don't understand his point. Let me ask you this. Would you cut a piece of flesh from your body if by doing it you would get 10,000 pieces of gold? I think I would. However, if you could gain a kingdom by losing an arm, would you do it? The inquirer was silent. Yang Chu's friend then said, a strand of hair is nothing compared to a piece of flesh, and a piece of flesh is negligible compared to a limb. However, many pieces of hair make up your scalp, and many pieces of flesh make up a limb. When do you consider enough hairs a scalp, and when do you consider enough pieces of flesh an arm? Every part of your body is as important as any other. Why think that some parts are dispensable? The inquirer said, I can't argue with you on that. If we took the matter to Lao Tzu and Wen Tzu, they would probably say you are right. However, if we took the issue to Mo Tzu or you, they would agree with me. 
It is not that the selfless Confucianist would sacrifice himself for the greater benefit of humanity, while the selfish Taoist would not. Yang Chu is often misunderstood on this point. What Yang Chu is saying is that we often think we can change the course of things by sacrificing one thing or the other. In thinking that our efforts can make a difference, we may have messed things up rather than helped. If we weren't so eager to be heroic and sacrifice ourselves to make things better, things could be left alone to run their course, and maybe there would be fewer problems in the world. Chapter 81 Ruling a country is like tending a flock of sheep. Yang Chu said to the king of Liang, ruling a country is quite straightforward. It's as easy as flipping things on the palm of your hand. The king said, you can't even manage your family affairs or clear your garden of weeds. How can you advise me on ruling my country? Yang Chu was not daunted. He said, have you seen a shepherd at work? He can control several hundred sheep by getting a child to prod them gently from behind with a bamboo stick. The entire flock will move in the direction he wants them to go. On the other hand, if you try to lead each sheep, you will not be able to get the flock moving. I have also heard that fish that can swallow a boat do not swim in small rivers, and high-flying birds do not land on small ponds. Why? It is because only wide-open spaces can match the stature and power of these animals. Similarly, stately music is not appropriate for small events, and a small knife cannot skin a large animal. Thus, those who set out to rule a country do not concern themselves with trivial tasks, and those who want to soothe in great enterprises do not waste their time on small achievements. Chapter 82 Things are not as permanent as we think they are. Things that happened in the ancient times are now forgotten. Things that happened 10,000 years ago are more legend than fact. Events that occurred 5,000 years ago are more of a dream than reality. We may still retain a bit of memory of what happened a thousand years ago, but most of the events are forgotten. In fact, it is a great accomplishment to remember things that happened a hundred years ago. Even eyewitnesses have a hard time recalling what they saw fifty years ago. Much has gone on between the ancient times and the present. Sages and tyrants have come and gone. Intelligent people, foolish people, kind people, cruel people, good people, bad people have all made brief appearances in history, and then disappeared. We don't know who they were or what they did, let alone what position and rank they occupied in society. Life is short. Why injure yourself to achieve things like name and reputation when you know that in 50 years, you'll be no different from anyone else? Why sacrifice your happiness and peace of mind to go after something ephemeral and transitory? Of all creatures, humans are said to be the most intelligent. However, we are plagued by happiness, anger, sadness, and fear. We do not have sharp teeth or claws to hunt down prey. We do not have fur or feathers to keep ourselves warm. We cannot run fast to escape predators, and our skin is not tough enough to protect us if we are attacked. We must rely on other sources to provide us with shelter, clothing, food, and weapons. Our intelligence does not make us privileged. Each species is endowed with a unique ability. We have intelligence, birds have feathers, and fish have gills. To use intelligence to fulfill our basic needs and comfort is appropriate, to use it to harm others is to go against the natural order of things. And intelligence is transitory. Like skin, bones, and flesh, it disappears when we die. Our time on earth is short. We do not own our lives. We come into existence when yin and yang energies interact, and we disappear when they separate. Thus, should we find ourselves alive in this world, we should let this life run its course. Do not be attached to it, but do not throw it away. Make the best use of your time now. If this body of flesh and blood is impermanent, how much more are non-tangible things like name, title, and reputation? Chapter 83 Longevity, Fame, Social Status, and Wealth People work themselves to exhaustion for four things, longevity, fame, social status, and wealth. However, they do not know that these four things only bring problems and anxiety. When you have longevity, you'll be afraid that evil spirits or uncontrollable circumstances will take it away. 
When you have fame, you'll be anxious that your reputation will be damaged by people jealous of you. When you have social status, you'll be worried that a shift in politics will take it away. When you have wealth, you'll be afraid that you may be robbed. Only people who see through the illusions of longevity, fame, social status, and wealth are not burdened by anxiety and fear. If there is nothing at stake, then there is nothing to worry about. If you don't crave longevity, then you won't be afraid to die. If you don't care for fame, then you won't be concerned with how you present yourself to others. If you are not interested in social status, then you won't be bothered by what other people think of you. If you are not possessive about money, then you won't tire body and mind to accumulate it. You will have no need to envy others, and you can follow your own principles and be true to yourself. The ancients say, if there were no such things as marriage or political power, then people's desires would be cut in half. If there were no need to eat or be clothed, then rulers and governments would be superfluous. Thus, the wise ones of old advised us that craving power, status, wealth, and longevity will only generate problems. If people are content with living a simple but comfortable life, there will be no competition. When there is no competition, things can be allowed to run their natural course. There is an old saying, make a farmer sit all day and you'll drive him crazy. It is natural for a farmer to tend the fields and work from sunrise to sunset. To be tired after a day's work, to eat a simple and big meal, and to sleep soundly at night are things he is accustomed to. If you put him on a feather bed, give him gourmet foods that don't fill him up, and make him sit around all day, it would be equivalent to killing him. There was a story about a farmer who could not afford a fur coat. In winter he felt chilly and cold, but when spring came and the sun shone on his neck and arms, he felt it was bliss. So he went to his friends and said, No one knows how great it feels to have the sun warming your back. I shall present this secret to the king. He'll be sure to reward me well for my discovery. When his neighbors heard this they laughed at him and said, You're just like that man who presented broad beans, potatoes, and roots to the dignitaries, thinking they would enjoy them as delicacies. But when the rich people tasted these foods, their stomachs were upset, and they punished the farmer for his mean trick. Those who see fame, longevity, status, and wealth as their goal in life will never experience simple happiness and contentment. And those who are happy and carefree will not want to exchange their freedom for the problems associated with social success. The ancients say, better to eat a simple meal than to receive food from a ruler's plate. Being conscientious and loyal does not necessarily protect you from treachery, and too many responsibilities can harm body and mind. Therefore, the best rulers govern without asking subjects to be loyal or virtuous, and the best government is one that does not promote reward, whether it be wealth, status, or power. When there is no system of reward, there will be no competition. When there is no competition, there will be no treachery. When there is no treachery, people can be true to themselves. The ancients also say, if you can dispense with reputation, then you are free from care. Reputation is only a visitor, but reality is here to stay. In today's world, people place too much importance on fame, wealth, longevity, and reputation at the expense of their happiness. Of course, you can't enjoy life if you don't have some wealth or longevity. However, to push yourself to exhaustion going after these goals, and not knowing when to stop is to rob yourself of the time you have in this world. You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you. Part 8 Slash Explaining Coincidences Chapter 84, Action and Reaction Li Tzu was studying with his teacher Hu Tzu. Before you understand what it means to act, you need to know what it means to react, said Hu Tzu. Can you tell me more about this? Turn around and look at your shadow. Li Tzu turned around and looked at his shadow. When he was bent, the shadow was bent. When he straightened up, his shadow straightened. Li Tzu found that his shadow had no control over its movement and simply reacted to what he did. It was only then that Li Tzu realized we are also like shadows, reacting to events in the world. We are not the movers of events, we can only respond to situations. 
Whether we should be active or passive does not depend on what we want to do, but what the situation calls for. When Tzu said to Li Tzu, if you are good to others, others will be good to you. If you harm others, you will eventually be harmed. Your actions produce reactions that follow you like shadows. Just as a tall person's shadow is tall and a short person's shadow is short, ugly words will produce ugly echoes, and good intentions will produce good reactions. For every action there is a reaction, and for every cause there is an effect. If someone loves you, you are likely to love him, if someone hates you, you are likely to hate him. This is the typical way we react. Therefore, the sage is careful about his own actions because he knows others will react to them, and by examining his own actions he can predict what other people will do. The sage also knows that as he can predict the actions of others, so can others predict his. Therefore, by hiding his actions, he becomes unpredictable. Chapter 85 Why do people follow the path of the Tao? Someone once asked Li Tzu, why do people follow the path of the Tao? Does it make them rich? But then again, we can get rich by winning the lottery. So why follow the Tao? Li Tzu said, tyrants and dictators fell because they placed too much importance on riches and power. If you spend your life pushing, shoving, and grabbing, then you are no better than wild animals. How can you gain the respect of others if you act like a beast? Chapter 86 Li Tzu Learns Archery Li Tzu was learning archery and finally managed to hit the target. He went to Wen Tzu and said, Do you have any suggestion as to how I can improve? Wen Tzu replied, Do you know why you could hit the target that time? I don't know. That's not good enough. Go back and practice some more. After three years Li Tzu visited Wen Tzu again. Wen Tzu said, Now do you know why you are able to hit the target? I do. That's good. Remember what you've learned and don't let your practice go to waste. By the way, the principles of learning archery apply to everything else. If you don't understand what you are doing, you will not be able to perform reliably. Therefore, in learning anything, whether it is governing the country or managing your life, you must understand the principles. Chapter 87 Choosing the Right Person for the Job Li Tzu said, People who are in the prime of their vitality are often proud of their vigor. Those who are physically strong are eager to show off their prowess and strength. You cannot discuss the Tao with them because they will not appreciate it. Similarly, it is useless to talk about the Tao with those who are young and immature. They will not listen, and even if they listen they are not emotionally steady enough to hold on to it. Therefore, the resourceful person likes to give responsibility to people who are older and more mature. Ideally, you should look for someone who has a clear direction in life, someone who still has physical strength, but who also has staying power and emotional stability. Thus, the key to management lies not in your own talent, but in your ability to choose the right people. Chapter 88 Can We Compete With Nature? There was a man who spent three years sculpting a piece of jade into a leaf. He presented his masterpiece to a prince who was very impressed by it, and became his patron. The leaf looked so real that if you placed it among real leaves you could not tell the difference. Everyone remarked that it was a very beautiful piece of art. However, when Li Tzu heard about this he quipped, if nature took three years to make a leaf, then we'd be in trouble. Thus, the sage knows that no matter how we try to imitate the works of nature, nature still does a better job. Chapter 89 Someone's Words Can Make or Break You When Lihtzu was living in Cheng, he was poor and starving. A friend saw his condition and spoke to the chief minister, Li Tzu is a sage who has attained the Tao. He is now living in your country poor and unrecognized. Why don't you send him a gift to show you appreciate an enlightened man when you see one? The chief minister immediately sent a gift of grain to Li Tzu. When the minister's messenger arrived with the gift, Li Tzu went to the door, bowed twice to the honored guest, and politely refused the gift. His wife was outraged with Li Tzu's behavior and scolded him. Wives and children of other sages live comfortably, and we are starving. 
Now that we've finally gotten some food from the minister, why did you refuse it? How can you do this to us? Li Tzu smiled and said to his wife, Let me tell you why I refused the gift. If I am honored because of another person's opinion, then I can also be dismissed because of someone's opinion. People's words can make you, but they can also break you. That's why I am scared of receiving a gift based on someone's opinion of me. We may not be rich, but it is safer this way. Not long afterward, the popularity of the chief minister fell. The king, swayed by public opinion, had him executed. Chapter 90 Being at the Right Place at the Right Time She of the country of Lu had two talented sons. One son excelled in scholarship, and the other excelled in the military arts. After discussing their future with them, he sent the scholar to the king of Qi, and the military genius to the king of Chu. The king of Qi was very impressed with the young man's scholarship, and made him tutor to the crown prince. The king of Chu was very pleased with the other brother's abilities, and made him a general. Both young men received rich lands and a large salary, and the Xi family rose in fortune and power. Meng, who was a long-time neighbor of the Xi family, saw and envied the success of Xi's sons. He decided to ask the rich man for advice on how his own sons might find their fortunes. Meng also had two sons, one talented in scholarship, and the other in warfare. She was very candid and told Meng how his own sons became rich and powerful. Meng went home and counseled his two sons to offer their skills to the lords of two feudal kingdoms. The learned son went to the king of Qin and presented a proposal of how to govern a country with kindness and humility. The ruler of Qin was about to invade the neighboring states that were rich and fertile. He considered the scholar's proposal a mockery and an insult to his policy, and said angrily, Here in Qin the land is poor and mountainous. If we don't invade the smaller but richer states to get their resources, we'll be conquered by powerful states such as Qi. If I follow your proposal, our country will be destroyed. What do you take me for, a fool? The king had the scholar castrated before he sent him away. Meng's other son went to the king of Wei and presented a proposal of military action. The king listened to the plans and said, My country is small and weak. If I listen to your advice and invade the neighboring states, that will be the end of Wei. Looking at the current situation, we can only hope to survive by forging alliances with the more powerful states. I need the services of a diplomat, not a warrior. I cannot use you, but I am afraid you will offer your military skills to the other states. So the king ordered his guards to cut off the young man's legs before he sent him away. When Meng saw his son's return, one crippled and the other castrated, he was shocked and angry. Thinking that she had played a mean trick on him, and had deliberately given him bad advice, he stormed into Xi's house and demanded an explanation. When she heard what had happened to Meng's sons he sighed and said, Heroes and paupers are made by the times. My sons were at the right place at the right time, and yours were at the wrong place at the wrong time. I merely told you what my sons did. You thought it was a formula for success and applied it without thinking. Sometimes, things that work today may not work tomorrow and strategies that are good for one situation may not work in another. For something to work, the political, social, and economical climate must be right. You can call it destiny or fate or the appropriateness of the times. The wise man understands that being at the right or wrong place at the right or wrong time is something we cannot control. Therefore, he accepts what befalls him and tries to cope with the consequence rather than fight it. When Meng heard this, his anger died down, and he realized he must find ways to live with his misfortune. To Xi he said, I understand now. You need not speak any more. Chapter 91 If I can step on someone, someone else can step on me. The king of Qin called his ministers together, and told them he intended to invade the neighboring country of Wei. When the chief minister heard the king's plans, he threw his head back and laughed. The king was shocked and asked for an explanation. The chief minister said, There was a man from my neighborhood who met a beautiful woman while he and his wife were on their way to visit his in-laws. The man lusted after the woman and secretly went to meet her. 
On coming home after his night out, he found his wife in bed with another man. When I heard this, I couldn't help laughing. The king of Qin got the point and did not entertain further ideas about going after another country's territory. Chapter 92 To solve a problem, you need to remove the cause, not the symptom. There was a lot of crime in the state of Qin. The government tried different strategies to apprehend the robbers, but all failed. One day, as the ruler of Qin was fretting over the worsening situation, an officer told him there was a man who could recognize criminal types by looking for certain features in the eyes and eyebrows. The king of Qin summoned this man and set him to hunt down the criminals in the country. The man lived up to his reputation, and in no time a large number of robbers were captured and imprisoned. The king was very happy with these results and related them to Wen Tzu. I have found a person who can help me apprehend all the robbers in the country. It looks like our crime problem is solved. Wen Tzu said, you cannot stop crime by relying on techniques to hunt down criminals. If you apprehend a hundred robbers today, there will be another hundred tomorrow, because you are dealing with the symptom, not the cause. Anyhow, I am willing to bet that this fellow whom you are using to hunt criminals will not live long. Not too long afterward, alarmed by the rate at which they were being caught, several gangs of robbers banded together and murdered the criminal hunter. The king was both startled and distressed by this news and went to Wen Tzu for advice. It is as you have predicted, said the king. Now how are we going to catch these robbers? Wen Tzu said, the ancient sages said those who have a talent in revealing fish in deep pools are unlucky, and those who are skillful in uncovering secrets will not live long. The best way to deal with crime is not to hunt down criminals, but to educate the public. Employ upright and honorable people. Instill a sense of virtue and honesty in your subjects. In due time, as people come to respect the virtues, the crime rate will drop naturally. The king took Wen Tzu's advice this time and set up a program of education throughout the country. And as Wen Tzu had predicted, when the people began to value honesty and integrity, the crime rate dropped. When the few diehard criminals found they could not get sympathy and support from the citizens, they fled Qin and went to another state. Chapter 93 Trust and Confidence Confucius was traveling from the state of Wei back to his home country of Lu when he stopped to rest by a river. Looking downstream, he saw the waters flow swiftly along the banks and tumble down a great height in a spectacular waterfall. Suddenly, he saw a man on the opposite bank who was about to dive into the river. He called to the man urgently and said, The waters are very fast and deep. Even the fish and turtles are afraid to go near this part of the river. If you try to swim across, you'll be drowned. The man acted as if he had not heard a word Confucius said. He jumped into the river and swam leisurely across. Confucius was amazed that the man could accomplish such a feat as the man stepped onto the shore. Confucius went over to him and said, I have never seen anyone with such skill in swimming. How were you able to keep yourself from being swept away by the rapids? The man replied, When I am in the water, I trust the waters and I have confidence in myself. Therefore, no matter how fast the waters are, I am not afraid. With trust and confidence, I have become friends with the river. Therefore, I can swim across it and it will not harm me. Confucius then turned to his students and said, Remember these words well. If by trust and confidence you can befriend a river, how much more can they help you to befriend people? Chapter 94 the best way to keep a secret is not to talk. A nobleman who was plotting to kill two of his rivals wanted to see if people saw his motives. He went to Confucius and said, Will someone guess your secrets if you leave clues? Confucius did not answer. Suppose you throw a stone into the river. Will someone notice it? A good diver would. If you mix the waters of two rivers together, Will someone be able to tell them apart? I've heard there are some people who have this ability. In this case, can there be no secrets? Confucius said, why not? Someone who listens and understands well will be able to keep a secret well. This is because you don't have to talk a lot to get him to understand your point. 
The less you talk, the less you'll reveal. Thus, the best way to keep a secret is not to talk, and the best way to get things done is not to do them. The nobleman did not quite understand what Confucius meant. In the end his plans of treachery and murder were discovered, and he himself was killed. Chapter 95 Those who succeed are not excited about success, those who know do not display their knowledge. The prince of Chu ordered his generals to attack a rival state. A few days later, messengers returned with the news that the commanders were victorious and took two major cities. The prince was eating his dinner when the couriers arrived. He listened to the report and then looked worried. His subordinates were confused by their lord's behavior and asked, Our generals took two cities in one day. This is great news, my lord. Why aren't you excited? The prince replied, in the old days it was said that a great flood will not last more than three days. It was also said that a strong wind will not last till morning, and a heavy rain cannot fall all day. What this means is that big events won't last long, and sudden and large achievements are not permanent. I'm afraid that our early success may not hold, and if we get excited over it, we will become negligent, and eventually will be defeated. When Confucius heard this, he said, with a ruler like that, the state of CHU will become very powerful. The prince is a man who is not carried away by success. Therefore, he will be calm and steady regardless of the circumstances. It is easy to succeed and be excited by it, but it is difficult to treat success as a normal, everyday affair and not let it disrupt your plans. The state of CHU will be around for a long time. When a ruler is proud of success, you can be sure the country will weaken. This was what happened to the states of Qi, Wu and Ye. Their kings did not understand that short-range achievements do not guarantee long-term success. It was said that Confucius had the strength to lift an iron gate, but he never displayed his strength. When Emo Tsu and a famous military strategist played a war game on a chessboard, Emo Tsu won easily. And yet, Emo Tsu was never known as an expert in the military arts. Therefore, those who succeed do not revel in their success, and those who know do not display their knowledge. Chapter 96 Fortune and Misfortune In the country of Sung there lived a family, who were known for their generosity and kindness. For three generations, all the members of the family had helped the poor and needy, but one day a strange thing happened in the household their black cow gave birth to a white calf. The head of the family was curious about what the omen meant, so he sent his son to consult with Confucius. Confucius said, This is a very good omen for your family. You should sacrifice the calf and thank the lords of heaven. The family did as Confucius suggested. A year later, the head of the family suddenly became blind in one eye, and about the same time, their black cow gave birth to a white calf. Again the father told his son to ask Confucius the meaning of this. His son said, Last time Confucius told us the white calf was a good omen. You've lost an eye, what's so good about that? I don't think we should consult with Confucius anymore. His father said, The wisdom of the sages is beyond our understanding. Besides, it is often not apparent whether something is good or bad on first examination. Go and ask Confucius again. Reluctantly, the son went to Confucius and described the situation. Confucius said, This is a very good omen. Go home and tell your father to give thanks for his good fortune. A year later, for no apparent reason, the son lost his sight in both eyes. Not long after that, the country of Sung was attacked by the powerful state of CHU. All able-bodied males were conscripted into the army. Eventually, the people of Sung were able to hold off the invaders, but at a cost of many lives. The father and his blind son escaped the conscription only because they were disabled. After the war was over and the neighbors were weeping over lost husbands and sons, the blind boy realized that his misfortune was actually good fortune. Not long afterward, both father and son suddenly recovered their sight. Something that appears as misfortune now may turn out to be beneficial later, and vice versa. If we can look at fortune and misfortune in this way, we will be less miserable when misfortune hits us. We will also be less excited when we are fortunate, 
and therefore we will be less depressed when fortune goes away. Chapter 97 A Matter of Luck There was a wandering acrobat who offered to perform before the king of Sung. Show me what you can do, said the king. The acrobat tied his legs to a pair of stilts taller than two men, stood up on them, and ran back and forth. His footwork was so nimble and his balance so precise that the stilts appeared as if they were extensions of his legs. Then he took seven swords and, balancing on the stilts again, juggled the seven weapons, keeping five of them spinning in the air all the time. The king was impressed by the acrobat's skill. He gave the performer a handsome gift of silks and gold. Another wandering acrobat heard about this and decided he would try to get a reward by performing before the king. So he went to the palace, offered to entertain the king, and proceeded to demonstrate his skill on the trapeze. After the performance the king scowled and said, The other day an entertainer came to show off his tricks, and being in a good mood I sent him off with some gifts. You must have heard that you can make fast money by showing off yours. Well, I am not in the mood for being entertained today. Without further discussion, the king had the acrobat punished and imprisoned. Luckily for the entertainer, the king's mood changed after a few days and the performer was released. Luck brought the first acrobat fortune, and lack of luck brought the second one misfortune, but in the end it was luck that saved him. Whether we attribute luck to an act of some god or nature, or to the whims of a powerful man, it plays a large part in our destiny. And if we can acknowledge its role, we will not be as frustrated or angered if we are unlucky or excited and proud when we are lucky. Chapter 98 Seeing Beyond Appearances Polo was a horse breeder who was known for his uncanny skill in recognizing exceptional horses. He had served his king for a long time and was responsible for breeding the best horses in the country. Now that Polo was getting old and weak, the king was worried that the horse breeder would leave no successor when he died. So he approached Polo and said, You are advanced in years, but I can't retire you to live a comfortable life, because I can't find anyone who possesses your skill in recognizing exceptional horses. Do you have someone in your family whom you can recommend as your successor? Polo said, You can recognize a good horse by looking at its muscles, bone structure, and general appearance. However, the best horses cannot be identified by appearance alone. Their potential can only be seen when they are developed, and you must train them early to let them fully realize their potential. These exceptional horses have tremendous speed and endurance. They can carry a warrior in full armor and run a thousand miles without rest. Unfortunately, no one in my family has this skill. My sons can distinguish good horses from average ones, but they are incapable of recognizing these thousand-mile horses. When the king looked disappointed, Polo said, I do know someone who has the ability, though. His name is Cow and he is a porter who hauls wooden vegetables to the market for a living. He is only a common laborer, but his skill in recognizing a prize horse is as good as mine. The king sent for Cow and charged him to find the legendary horses. After three months, Cow found such a horse in a remote region. He reported this to the king who said, What does it look like? It is a yellow mare, said Cow. When the horse was brought to the palace stables, the king saw it was not a yellow mare, but a black stallion. He summoned Polo and said angrily, That fellow you recommended to me is no good. He told me the horse was a yellow mare, and we have a black stallion here. He can't even tell the difference between a stallion and a mare, let alone the colors of their coats. How can he serve me as a horse breeder? Polo sighed and said, His skill has risen beyond my imagination. His ability is now at least 10,000 times better than mine, for while I still judge a horse by nuances in appearance, he can see beyond appearance. When he sees a horse, he does not see male or female, black or yellow. He sees the essence of the horse directly. When one can see that way, external features are unimportant. The important thing about the horse is its potential, not whether it is a mare or stallion, or has a yellow or black coat. When the horse was trained, the king found that he possessed the best horse in the country. Chapter 99 Managing Your Life and Governing a Country 
A certain king went to ask a sage for advice. Can you tell me how I can govern my country well? I only know how to manage my life. I don't know anything about politics. I am responsible for managing the ancestral shrines and conducting ceremonies of thanksgiving to the earth and sky gods, and I wish to do them well. I have heard that someone who manages his life well can do no wrong in governing a country. However, I have also heard that someone who cannot manage his life can never be a good leader. Good, said the king, you have gotten right to the point. Chapter 100 Rank, Wealth, and Ability Can Get You Into Trouble A sage once said to Sun Shueo, There are three things in life that are guaranteed to get you into trouble. Do you know what they are? I do not. They are rank, wealth, and ability. If you occupy a high rank in government, other politicians will hate you. If you are wealthy, people will resent you. If you are too smart, your king will be jealous of you. These three things will get you in trouble if they don't cost you your life. If I am humble about my rank, if I am generous with my wealth, and if I am unassuming about my abilities, would I be able to avoid trouble? The sage smiled and said nothing. Years later, when Sun Shueo was on his deathbed, he told his son, When I was in office, the king offered me one of the richest fiefs in the country, but I did not accept it. After my death, he will offer it to you. You must not accept the rich and central lands. Accept only the poor and remote regions that nobody wants. In this way you and your descendants will live long. As Sun Shueo had foreseen, the king offered the Sun family the richest piece of land in the country. Taking his father's advice, the Sun politely rejected the king's gift and asked for a poor and remote region instead. The king granted his wish, and while many nobles rose and fell from power, the descendants of Sun Shueo lived in peace and kept their fief for many generations. Chapter 101 You Cannot Apply One Principle to All Conditions there was a Confucian scholar who was journeying from his hometown to the capital. While he was passing through a quiet and untraveled area, a group of bandits robbed him of his money, his horse, and his carriage. The scholar continued his journey on foot as if nothing had happened. The robbers were surprised that their victim showed no signs of disappointment or grief, so they caught up with him and asked, Most people are alarmed when they lose their belongings, but you are not. Why? The scholar said, a virtuous man is not attached to his possessions. Moreover he won't satisfy his needs by taking things that are not his own. The bandits looked at one another and said, sounds like words from a wise man. Later, when the robbers had time to think it over, they said among themselves, such a wise man will rise in power in the government, and he'll send the police after us. We had better kill him before he gets to the capital. So they ran after the scholar and killed him. When the news of the scholar's death reached the capital, a family elder told his clan members, when you run into bandits, don't act like that stupid scholar. Not long afterwards, one of the younger members of this clan went to the remote areas of the country on business and came upon some bandits. Remembering what the family elder had said, the young man argued with the robbers and defended his possessions. When the bandits went off with his belongings, the man still did not give up. He ran after the robbers and begged them to return his goods. The bandits looked at the young man and said, We spared your life, and you didn't appreciate it. You are a fool and a nuisance, and your footprints are going to lead the police to us. So the bandits killed the man on the spot. Chapter 102 Retribution by Accident there was a rich man by the name of you who was proud and haughty. He displayed his wealth shamelessly and was scornful of those who were not as prosperous as he. Often he would hold parties on the balcony of his house where after a lavish dinner he and his guests would play a game of backgammon and dice. One evening, during a game that was more boisterous than usual, a player threw the winning dice of double sixes. There was a great uproar and everyone started clapping and shouting at once. The sudden noise frightened a bird that was hovering around the balcony. It opened its mouth to squawk and dropped a dead rat it was carrying onto the street below. The rat hit the leader of a group of mercenaries who happened to be walking by. 
The soldier turned to his companions and said, This man you is getting on my nerves. He's proud and pretentious and thinks his money can get him anything he wants. We have never offended him, and he throws this dead rat on us. I can't take this kind of treatment anymore. If I don't avenge the insult, I shall be the laughingstock of all fighting men. Later that night, the leader of the mercenaries called a meeting of all the professional soldiers in the area and said, Our code of honor has been violated. We will not be avenged until we have killed U.S. entire family. The soldiers went to the rich man's house in the early hours of the morning and killed everyone in the household. Chapter 103, Confusing Name and Reality A man from the eastern provinces was traveling along a seldom-used road when he fainted. A robber happened to be passing by and noticed the man fallen by the wayside. Seeing that the traveler was still alive, the robber started to revive the man by offering him food and water. After three mouthfuls, the man opened his eyes. Seeing a gruff and fierce-looking man bent over him, he said, Who are you? The robber said, I am CHIU of the region of Hufu. Startled, the traveler said, You're not that infamous robber who's wanted everywhere, are you? I am he. Then why did you give me food? Did you help me because you associate me with your kind? I am a man of virtue and will not eat anything that comes from a criminal. The traveler then tried to throw up the food the robber had given him. Eventually he choked on his vomit and died. Even if CHIU was a criminal, his intent and action in this situation was not criminal. Although he might have committed unforgivable crimes, there was nothing criminal about the food and water. Self-righteous people often follow a principle blindly, without understanding it, and in doing so confuse what is name and what is reality. Chapter 104, To Die for Someone Who Values You is Natural There was a retainer who felt his master did not appreciate his skills, so he resigned his office and went to live as a hermit by the sea. He swore he would rather live on acorns and chestnuts than receive rations from his lord. Not too long afterward, the lord was attacked by his rivals. The former retainer immediately left his home and came to defend the lord. Some of the retainer's friends said to him, You originally left your master because he didn't value you. How come you are so eager to fight for him now? We've heard of people who would die for a lord who appreciates them, but never heard of people who would give their lives for someone who doesn't value them. The retainer said, I left him because he shamed me by not recognizing my skills. Now I am going to have my revenge. I shall shame him in front of his fellow princes by dying for him. To die for someone who values you and to refuse to die for someone who does not appreciate you is natural. To do the opposite out of spite and vengeance is to violate the natural order of things. Chapter 105, Confused by Too Many Alternatives Young CHU's neighbor lost a sheep. The entire family, together with friends, relatives, and even Yang Chu's servants, went off to search for the animal. When Yang Chu saw the commotion, he said to his neighbor, Why send so many people to look for one sheep? There are too many forks in the road, and we don't know which one the sheep could have taken. A little later, the search party returned. Yang Chu asked his neighbor, Did you find your sheep? No. There were too many paths, and we didn't have enough people to search all of them. After hearing this, Yang Chu frowned and did not say a word the whole day. His students thought their teacher was behaving strangely, so they asked, Sheep are not very valuable livestock. Besides, it is not your sheep. Why are you so unhappy? When Yang Chu did not answer, one of the students, Meng, went to HSIN Tutsu, one of Yang Chu's friends, to see if he could get a clue as to why his teacher was behaving that way. HSIN Tutsu accompanied Meng to see Yang Chu. When he saw Yang Chu, he said, there were three brothers who went to learn about virtue. When they returned home after they finished their studies, their father asked them what they had learned. The eldest son said, To be virtuous is to value my body and never sacrifice it for reputation. The second son said, To be virtuous is to sacrifice my body for the sake of honor and reputation. The third son said, 
To be virtuous is to care for my body and preserve my reputation. The three boys went to learn from the students of Confucius, and yet they came home with three different understandings of virtue. Who is correct? Yang Chu then said, There was a man who lived by a river and made his living ferrying people across. He was also an excellent swimmer and often rescued people who had tried to swim across the river and failed. As a result, he received many gifts from grateful people whose lives he had saved. Soon he became a very rich man. There were many people who heard about his expertise in swimming and wanted to learn from him. They all hoped that if they learned his secrets of swimming, they too could make a lot of money by rescuing people who fell into the river. However, more than half of the people who came to learn how to swim drowned. All of them learned from the same man, yet some succeeded and some failed. HSI and Tutsu nodded and went away without saying a word. Meng caught up with him and said, What is all this? You were both talking in circles. Now I am even more confused than ever. HSI and Tutsu said to Yang Chu students, Our friends couldn't find the lost sheep because they were confused by too many paths. The apprentice swimmers drowned because they were too eager to try different methods. There is only one principle in learning the Tao. Don't get swamped by too many choices. By the time you try all the alternatives, you will be totally confused and you will have learned nothing. The only way to learn, then, is to focus on one technique, get to the source of it, and do not abandon it until you've completed your learning. I am surprised that you have been with your teacher for a long time, and yet you do not understand these things. Chapter 106, Yang Piyu and the Dog One day Yang Piyu, Yang Chu's brother, went out of the house wearing a white coat. When he got home, a heavy rain was falling, and the courtyard became wet and muddy. Yang Piyu quickly went into his room, and put on a black coat, so he would not dirty the white one. When he came out, his dog barked and snarled at him. Yang Piyu picked up a stick and was about to beat up the dog when his brother Yang Chu stopped him and said, Don't punish the dog. His behavior was absolutely natural. If he had gone out of the house with a white coat and later had come back wearing a black one, wouldn't you be shocked too? Chapter 107 Knowledge in Action There was a man who knew the secrets of immortality. The king of Yin sent a messenger to get this information, but the messenger was tardy, and the man died before the king's request arrived. When the envoy returned to the palace, the king was angry and wanted to have the messenger executed. One of the king's favored ministers, who happened to be standing nearby, counseled the king, if the man who claims to know the secrets of immortality cannot keep himself alive, how can he have anything to offer you? The king nodded and thought that was a good point. He therefore released the messenger. There was another man who also wanted to learn the arts of immortality. When he heard that a hermit who possessed this secret had just died, he beat his chest and lamented that he had lost a great opportunity. When a philosopher heard about these incidents, he said, these people wanted to learn the secrets of immortality. But in each case, the so-called teachers themselves died. This shows that these teachers are frauds. Why regret not being able to learn from them? Li Tzu's teacher Hu Tzu disagreed with this. He said, There are some people who know the principles of a skill, and yet cannot apply it. There are some people who can apply the principles without knowing what they are. Once there was a great mathematician who passed on his secrets to his son. The young man memorized the theory, but could not apply it. Another person got the informatin out of the sun, and applied it successfully. There's nothing unusual about someone who can pass on a theory, but not the applications. Therefore, it is not unreasonable that mortals can possess information about immortality. Knowledge is the precursor to action, but action is not necessarily the precursor to knowledge. It is a rare case that someone both knows the theory and is able to apply it. As to whether it is easier to derive action from knowledge or induce knowledge from action, it is hard to tell. Chapter 108 Capture and Release, An Act of Compassion or Cruelty There was a certain nobleman who encouraged his subjects to present him with doves on New Year's Day 
and would reward them according to the number of doves they brought in. When a guest asked why he did this, the nobleman said, New Year's Day is a good day to do deeds of compassion. I release the doves that are brought to me to show that I value the lives of all sentient beings. The guest then said, Your subjects know they are rewarded well for bringing in the birds, so they will scramble to capture as many doves as they can. As a result, for one dove brought to you, many will die. If you are truly compassionate, why don't you issue an order to prohibit the hunting of doves instead? Right now your so-called act of compassion cannot even begin to pay for the cruelty of death and capture. The nobleman realized his mistake. He said, you have a point there. I shall do as you have suggested. Chapter 109 Who was created for whom to eat? A certain nobleman held a feast of thanksgiving. The banquet was attended by more than a thousand people. When some geese and fish were presented to him, he looked up at the sky, sighed, and said, Heaven is very kind to us. It provides us with grains and creates birds and fish for us to eat. All the guests murmured and nodded in agreement with the Lord. However, one of the sons of a guest, a child of twelve, stood up and said, I disagree with that. The myriad of things of heaven and earth differ only in shape and form. No one kind is nobler than another, and no one group was created for the benefit of another. Every living thing eats what it can get hold of. We humans eat fish and birds, mosquitoes suck our blood, and tigers eat our flesh. If we were to say that birds and fish were created for us to eat, then we would have to admit that we humans were created for the mosquitoes and tigers to feast upon. Chapter 110 It's All in Your Mind There was a man who was so poor that he had to beg for a living. At first, the residents of the neighborhood pitted him and gave him handouts. After a while, when they realized the man was planning to live off the charity of others, they stopped helping him. The beggar became desperate and finally got a menial job in a stable cleaning out horse dung. The neighbors laughed at him and said, Have you no shame? You've sunk so low that you are willing to clean out horseshit. The poor man replied, All labor has its place in society. Begging was shameful, and yet I begged. Now that I have an honest job, why should I be ashamed about it? Whether an activity is shameful or not depends on how you think about it. There was a man who made a habit of picking up things that people had dropped on the street. He would gather torn money notes and tattered receipts from pawn shops, and would count the items in his collection from time to time. Then he would go to his neighbors and say, One day I'll be a very rich man. Whether you are rich or not depends on how you think about it. There was a family who had a sycamore tree in their courtyard. The neighbors came by and said, Sycamore trees have fruits that do not flower. It's unlucky to have this tree in your garden. You should cut it down as soon as you can. The family had the tree cut and dumped the wood behind the house. Immediately, the neighbors came by and hauled off the logs for firewood. The family got suspicious of the motives of the neighbors and said among themselves, Our neighbors are really crafty. They told us the tree gave us bad luck so that they could get free firewood. Our people are crafty or not? It's all in your mind. There was a man who lost an axe and suspected that the boy next door stole it. For the next few days he watched the boy's movements and decided his behavior and looks were like those of a guilty person. Later, the man found the axe in a deserted area in the woods. When he got home, his neighbor's boy no longer looked like a thief. Whether someone is guilty or not depends on your opinion of them in the first place. Chapter 111 Those who are involved are muddled, those who watch are clear. There was a man who was so intent on avenging his father's death that he could think of nothing else. He was so engrossed in making plans for his revenge that he forgot he was holding his walking stick upside down. He leaned on his staff and the sharp point punctured his cheek. One of his friends said, He is so deep in his own thoughts that everything around him is a blur. There was another man who was obsessed with getting rich. One day he went into the bank and tried to walk off with several bags of gold. The guards caught him immediately. A passerby said, only a fool would think of robbing a bank in the presence of armed guards. 
The man said, my mind was so set on the gold that I didn't see the guards. You often see people stumbling into walls or stepping into holes because they are so occupied by their thoughts that they don't see what's in front of them. When we are too involved in a situation, we can't see straight, and things that are obvious and clear to bystanders are a blur to us. This is very dangerous, 